Ladies and gentlemen, keynote will commence in 10 minutes. Can I please ask you to make your way to the auditorium?
Ladies and gentlemen, keynote will commence in five minutes. Can I please ask you to take your seats? Wasn't that a bit? Ladies and gentlemen, keynote is about to start. Can I please remind you to silence your mobile phones?
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Pankaj Gupta. Good morning, everyone. I'm Pankaj. I work in Google's office right here in Bangalore. I lead our engineering teams in India and Singapore for a very important initiative called Next Billion Users. I'm really excited to be here with you today at Google Developer Days because I'm myself a developer. I have used many Google APIs over the years. This is the first GDD ever in India, and this is the largest developer event that Google has held in India ever. But first, I want to talk to you about why and what Google is doing in India and in emerging markets all around the world. Today, Google has seven products with more than a billion users each around the world. But we know that our next billion users will come from different parts of the world than our first billion. Our next billion users will not come from US or Canada or Germany. They will come from India, Indonesia, Brazil, Nigeria, and similar countries all around the world. That's why <coughs> in India alone, we expect 650 million Indians to come online by 2020. That's why a couple of years back, we started the Next Billion Users Initiative at Google, as we noticed that the future users of Google's products are going to be different than our current users. Perhaps the most important difference is that they're going to be mobile first, and in fact, largely mobile only. The smartphone is their first computer. It is the best camera they probably ever owned, and also probably their first video device that they ever carried around. Let's take a look at users in India, Indonesia, and Brazil, and compare them to the US. The users in these countries are incredibly young. I mean, just look around the attendees here. They're urbanizing fast, and they're aspirational, with disposable incomes growing rapidly. They're savvy. A large fraction of them have prepaid plans and multiple SIMs to get the best voice and data plans. They are unique. They have a strong sense of their own identity and culture that is different from the rest of the world. And yet, we at Google believe that they have the same fundamental needs. When they get online, they want to talk to friends. They want to be entertained. They want to understand the world around them. They want information to make their lives better. If you saw our search queries from Mumbai, they're not that different from search queries from New York City. If you look at search queries from Mumbai, you might find queries like, what time does this train leave? Where is the nearest doctor? When's the new movie with Deepika Padukone coming out? But right now, they face serious challenges to getting the information they need and having a good experience with the internet. They have low-spec phones, which are running usually a very old version of Android, and their storage is running out constantly. They have serious connectivity issues. Data can be slow and intermittent. It can sometimes take minutes to load a map, even more to buffer a video. And when they do manage to connect to the internet, they find that there is not much localized content. Let me give you an example. Wikipedia in Hindi, which by the way is now the fourth most spoken language in the world, has just 2%, 2% of the content of Wikipedia in English. So Google's approach to this is pretty simple. First, we want to ensure that everyone has access to internet. The rest is meaningless without a working internet connection. Second, we want to build platforms that enable developers like yourselves to build meaningful experiences for everyone. Third, we want to build products that are directly relevant to our next billion users. Let me start with access, which really is the foundation. In India, we have partnered with Tata Trusts and Railtel to provide Google Station 
which is high-speed Wi-Fi in hundreds of train stations across India. It's the largest public Wi-Fi project in India, with millions of people now using this service. In addition to access, we also need to create awareness and educate people on how to use the internet. Our Internet Sathi initiative is now in 100,000 villages in 12 states across India. We have over 25,000 Internet Sathis. These are women who have been trained to help other women in the village learn about the internet and how it can be used to better their lives. These Sathis have trained over 12 million women over the past two years. And the impact that the internet is having on these women and their communities is truly incredible. Of course, Google cannot solve all the needs of everyone everywhere by itself, so we want to make sure that we make strong platforms that allow everyone to contribute and grow with the internet. Because that ability to participate and contribute to the internet is key. It's what, in turn, makes the experience better for everyone. While we have lots more work to do, one thing we are proud of is our support of many languages in our key platforms. At the end of the day, Google is a products company. So we are working hard to try to make our products fast, relevant, and accessible in our users' own languages. Last year, we launched offline maps, which lets people save a map over Wi-Fi and then use the map just as they would if they were online. In 2013, we started letting people take videos offline on YouTube, launching first in India, as well as in Indonesia and Philippines. Now, this feature is in more than 80 countries worldwide. So, so this is the cool thing. We have learned that when we tap into a user's insight, whether on how people connect or how they overcome constraints in any market, these insights tend to hold true globally, which allows us to make products better for everyone. In this case, I myself use Maps Offline and YouTube Offline all the time. And when the market needs it, we will build products that are made for India first. That's exactly what we did a little over two months ago when we launched Taze, a consumer payments and commerce mobile app that leverages UPI to build a brand new and refreshing payments experience to users all over India. Taze is made for India first. It is made to be as simple to use as cash and provides Google scale security to our users. It's been out a little bit over two months, and we have seen more than 10 million users creating more than 74 million transactions. If you haven't checked it out, please do so today. Just yesterday, we launched another brand new product made for our next billion users first called Datally. Datally is a mobile data savings app that helps people get the most out of their mobile data. Datally has three core features. Understand your data, control your data, and save data by finding free Wi-Fi near you. Now, we are proud of what we have achieved so far, but we are also aware that there is a lot more work to do, and we are just getting started. So I've just given you a glimpse into what we are working on for the next billion users' markets. I might be biased, but I truly believe that India is an amazing place for technology. Fortune 500 companies, startup hubs, entrepreneurs, dev centers, they're all blooming across India. And we have some of the best talent in the world. I'm lucky enough to work with many on a daily basis. That's why we believe it's very important for us to meet and work with all of you through events such as these. We want to hear your feedback on our products and programs so that we can give you what you need to turn your ideas into reality, whether you're building for the next billion, like me and my team, or you're building apps for use all across the globe. We want to enable you to focus on the problems that you're trying to solve and minimize the pain points of building a product. The Google developers team is on the ground in over 130 countries. And within India, 
thousands of you are participating as developer experts and as part of GDGs. And we are continuing to grow the Indian developer ecosystem through programs such as Women Tech Makers, the Google Developers Agency Program, and Launchpad. We are also working on providing trainings to deepen your technical capabilities year-round. In fact, you might recall the goal that we have committed to, to train 2 million Indian developers, 2 million Indian developers by 2020. To date, we have engaged over 500,000 developers through our various training programs, along with more than 1,000 faculty members from 400 colleges. Additionally, 11 state technical universities have adopted our Android Developer Fundamentals curriculum. We also recently launched Developer Student Clubs in 23 states, and they have trained over 6,000 students in just three months. <laughs> Finally, we have recently announced a partnership with Pluralsight to offer free developer and IT content to help skill 100,000 Indian developers through the Pluralsight platform. We are really inspired by the talent in India, and we want to continue to help cultivate the developer ecosystem here. Let me give you an example. Meet Jimit. Jimit's father is a street mechanic. Growing up, Jimit always assumed he'd follow in his father's footsteps. But he always loved to code. After completing his six-month training to becoming a mechanic, he asked his father, hey, can I take some time to pursue my real interest, my real dreams of becoming a developer? His father agreed, and from then, each day, he went to a part of town where he could access public Wi-Fi. He sat on this footpath, you see here, where the signal was the strongest, and began taking Android courses through Udacity. After he completed this training, he began, to applying, he began applying for jobs as a professional developer. And today, Jimit supports his family with the salary he's earning as a developer. Jimit's story is just one of many inspiring stories that motivate us to continue pushing towards our goals to train as many developers as possible and build the products and platforms that are most useful to all of you. Now, I'd like to bring up some colleagues to share updates on the products across our developer platforms. Let's get started with how we are continuing to improve the Android development process. Please welcome Dan, and thank you. Pankaj, namaste and good morning. It is the best time ever to be an Android developer. And I can say that because I've been developing Android for over nine years. I've been at Google for over seven of those years, but I've never seen anything like what we have now, this incredible confluence of meaningful developer changes. We're seeing ever more powerful tooling, a clear path forward for app design, a new programming language, support for on-device machine intelligence, and fundamental improvements to the distribution model. And much of this change derives from listening to all of you in our developer community. All of this is happening amidst the incredible momentum that Android continues to have. We're seeing 2 billion active devices on Android and 82 billion apps installed from Play. And what's even more amazing is how this momentum is making so many developers successful. The number of developers with over a million installs grew 35% in the last year. Now, to leverage this distribution to build great businesses, we expanded direct carrier billing to reach 900 million devices with over 140 operators. Altogether, the number of people buying on Play grew over 30% the past year. But that's not enough. We know we can make distribution even better by removing the friction from app installs and making the entire experience more dynamic. Instant Apps is one of our big bets in bringing more users to your apps, and our early partners are seeing great results. I mean, OneFootball saw that the number of users who read news and shared content increased 55% in their Instant App, while Vimeo increased their session durations by 130%. Now, Makan found that the conversion rate in their real estate app increased by 2.8x compared to mobile web, and there are many more stories like these. Now, at I.O., we opened up Android Instant Apps to all Android developers, which means anyone can now build and publish an Android Instant App. And since then, we've made 
instant apps available to more than 500 million Android devices across countries where Google Play operates. Now, your instant app is downloaded as needed, feature by feature. You enable this by organizing your project into feature modules. And then you can use the exact same code in both your instant app and your installable app. We're easing the process of refactoring your app into these feature modules using the new modularized refactoring action in Android Studio. Modularize helps you move code and resources between modules. We've also included optimization tools for more efficient asset delivery with support for on-the-wire compression. When you're ready, you'll just upload your instant app APKs together with your installable APK in the Play Console. And to get started building an instant app today, visit g.co instant apps. Now, at Google I.O. back in May this year, we announced that Kotlin is a fully supported Android programming language, and the developer community support for Kotlin was a huge driver of our decision to embrace the language. But since that announcement, we've seen a massive increase in Kotlin activity. The number of apps in the Play Store that use Kotlin has grown by three times, and we observed that 17% of Android Studio projects are now using Kotlin. Of course, Android Studio 3.0 is released now and bundled with full support for Kotlin, including Kotlin templates for projects and activities, in IDE Kotlin Lint support, while the 3.1 Canary adds Lint support for Kotlin on the command line. But we didn't stop there. We've built docs and samples around Kotlin, and we're continuing to develop more in this area. We published the Android Kotlin guides on GitHub to provide guidance for Android Kotlin style and interop. We support library 27. We have started adding nullability annotations to make the APIs friendlier to use in Kotlin. And we're doing all of this while increasing our commitment to the Java programming language, with Oreo support for many version 8 APIs, and support for language features such as lambdas and method references back to any SDK version with DSugar. For me, Kotlin makes programming Android more fun and productive, seamlessly operating with the Android standard libraries while combining a dense syntax along with modern features such as functional programming and the ability to write DSLs. Now, minimizing install friction with instant apps and the Kotlin programming language are just two of the ways in which we've listened to your feedback. We've made substantial improvements to Android Studio, focusing on speed, smarts, and Android platform support. And you can see all the speed and smarts updates we've made to Android Studio behind me. But I want to call out one thing in particular. Your feedback has made driving sync and build time down our number one priority. Benchmarking with a real-life 100-module project, since 2.2, build config time dropped from three minutes to two seconds. And we're continuing to work on build performance. In Android Studio 3.1, now in Canary, you can try out D8, our new DEX compiler, which compiles faster and outputs smaller DEX files while having the same runtime performance. On the emulators, we've added the Play Store for end-to-end -end testing. And you'll find awesome features for Android Oreo and Android Studio, like end-to-end -end instant app supports, O system images, improved profilers, and tons of O helper tools, like a tool to make building adaptive icons easy. And to download Android build dependencies, we're now distributing, of course, to our own Maven repository. Now, you've asked us to make Android frameworks easier, like providing an opinionated guide to best practices, a better solution for life cycles. Architecture components. Our libraries for common tasks, of course, is at stable release, with libraries for the view model pattern, data storage, and managing activity and fragment life cycles. We also have preview support for paging, which makes it efficient and easy to support huge data sets with Recycler View. App quality is an essential piece to growing a successful business. We took a sample of apps and analyzed the correlation between app quality and business success. And what we learned is when apps move from average to good quality, we see a six-fold increase in spend and a seven-fold increase in retention. So quality is queen. So to help you ensure you're targeting the devices that work best for your app, you can now target sp specific devices in the Play Console. You can browse a detailed device catalog, and if you need a certain amount of RAM or you have issues with a specific system-on-system -system chip, you can set targeting rules to address this as well. And prior to excluding devices, you can even see your installs, rating, and revenue details per device. We've also got Android Vitals dashboards in the Play Console, so you can now see aggregate data about your app to help you pinpoint common issues, excessive crash rate, ANR rate, frozen frames, slow rendering, excessive wake-ups, and more. These are enhanced by improved profilers and new instrumentation in the platform. And speaking of the platform, Android O adds so much for developers. We're in developer preview for Oreo 8.1, which has Android Go optimizations of targeting, as well as a new neural networks API, which lays the foundation for our developer community to build accelerated on-device applications of machine learning, including image recognition and prediction. Of course, O has vastly improved font support and auto-sizing text view, notification controls, and a new native Pro Audio API. We've made massive improvements in the runtime, including a concurrent copying collector and a series of optimizations to make your apps run smoother. We've introduced adaptive icons to improve the launcher experience and continue to harden Android security, with Google Play Protect now enabled on every Google Play device. 
We've improved accessibility, added support for autofill and smart text selection, added support for wide gamut color and extra long screens, and improved multi-display support. I'll be diving into all of this and much more in more detail later today. Now let's talk about some of the ways we're extending Android. AR Core uses motion tracking, environmental understanding, and light estimation to blend virtual content with the real world as seen through your phone's camera. It's being offered as a preview so you can start experimenting with building new AR experiences and give us feedback. This preview is the first step in a journey to enabling AR capabilities across the whole Android ecosystem. Android Things makes developing connected mass market products easy by providing the same Android development tools, best-in-class Android framework, and Google APIs that make developers successful and mobile on a trusted platform. And I'm excited to announce that just today, Android Things Developer Preview 6 was released. Android Things hardware is based on system-on-module architecture. The SOM contains the CPU, the memory, the networking, and other core components in a very small package that can be produced cheaply since they're generic parts made in large quantities. For each SOM, Google provides the kernel, drivers, and other software as part of a board support package. So during prototyping and development, you attach them to a breakout board to connect I.O. For production, you can build your own custom board for the SOM, reducing costs and simplifying hardware development. On the software side of things, you build a standard ABK and upload it to your fleet of devices via our developer console. Google provides an over-the-air update mechanism, so you can roll out updates to your devices, and you can get security updates from the same people who maintain Android. So you can focus on your core business instead of having to worry about patching kernels and libraries. And since Android Things is Android, you can not only use familiar tools like Android Studio, Kotlin, and Firebase combined with Cloud IoT Core, but you can also leverage the power of TensorFlow and the Google Assistant in your products. Now, it's still early days, but we're seeing incredible growth in Android Auto. We continue to expand the number of Android Auto compatible cars through great partnerships with over 50 car brands. There are over 300 Android Auto compatible car models and aftermarket systems available today, which is triple the number from one year ago. And it's well on its way to becoming a standard feature in every new car. We've also made Android Auto available to all Android users with the launch of the standalone phone app, opening up the platform and ecosystem to many millions of drivers, no matter what kind of car they drive. Now, during the holiday season last year, Android Wear saw 72% growth, and that was before Wear 2.0 launched. The number of brands supporting Android Wear doubled from 12 last year to 24, and the choice of Android Wear watches doubled from 23 last year to 46. Apps are taking advantage of Android Wear 2.0 and its standalone functionality, which allows apps to work no matter what platform the watch is connected to. Finally, our strong partnerships with pay TV operators and hardware manufacturers allowed us to double the number of activated Android TV devices last year, and we expect that trend to continue and further increase. We're seeing this both across partners in the set-top box and the smart TV form factors. We've expanded our international footprint to 70 countries, and there are now more than 3,000 Android TV apps in the Play Store. And Android TV supports the Google Assistant for smarter content search and to be the center of the connected home. With so many ways for people to interact with Android, the strong communities that are supporting Android development, the improvements we've played in the platform, tooling, language, and the distribution of Google Play, it really is the best time ever to be an Android developer. Please check out the training, sessions, and code labs to learn how we're helping to developers make Android great. Now, all of the Android form factors are tapping into the power of the Google Assistant. So it's my pleasure to welcome my colleague, Suchit, to the stage to talk about what the Google Assistant means to developers. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dan. Hi, everyone. As you just heard, the Google Assistant is now available across many devices, from your phone to your TV. It's also available on voice-activated speakers like Google Home. You, as a developer, have the ability to leverage actions on Google to build conversational experiences through the Google Assistant. So today, I'm going to tell you about all the new features we've added to the Actions on Google platform to make your apps for the Assistant even more capable. You can build apps for all sorts of assistive use cases for voice and visual interfaces, like shopping for clothes or ordering food from a lengthy menu. With UI elements like image carousels, lists, and suggestion chips, users can see more. They can also seamlessly transition between voice, typing, or taps in a single conversation in order to easily get things done with your app. We've also opened up powerful transactions experiences in the US and UK, helping developers grow their business by making it easy to complete purchases of physical goods and services through the Google Assistant on phones. This can be done with Google-facilitated payments or their own stored payment methods for users who've signed into their app. Speaking of sign-in, there's a seamless one-tap step for linking their rewards account to the Assistant. Orders can be tracked, modified, or even repeated using the transaction history view accessible in the Google Assistant. But 
None of this matters if users can't discover your app. We've rolled out an app directory within the assistant experience on your phone with what's new and what's trending sections, which will constantly change and evolve, creating more opportunities for your app to be discovered by users. We're using your app's description and sample invocations to map users' natural search queries to new task-based subcategories of apps. We're even launching a new For Families badge designed to help users find apps that are appropriate for all ages. And to make finding your app easier, the assistant is also learning from the directory and other information provided by you, the developer. Thanks to these signals, the assistant can often respond to general requests like play a game with a few different options from third parties. Improving discovery is very important for us, so you can expect ongoing investment and improvements in this area. Once users have found your app, they want frictionless assistive experiences. We are committed to enabling you to build for innovative new use cases. So just in the last couple months, we've exposed, exposed specific assistant capabilities to developers. For instance, developers can now transfer their app's conversation from a voice-activated speaker to a mobile phone mid-dialogue. We have improved the voice UI development capabilities by giving developers more control over conversational mishaps like unrecognized input or cancellation. We've even introduced a proactive updates feature in developer preview which allows you to request users to, to register for regularly scheduled updates or even push notifications. This opens new doors for app re-engagement and usage. Imagine being able to connect to your user each day to remind them about an upcoming event or provide them with an urgent alert directly through the assistant. In order to leverage all these features, it's also important to us that the development process is smooth. The Actions Console is your central hub for development. It helps you work as a team, choose the right tool for development, and collect data on your app's usage, performance, and user discovery patterns. It's integrated with the Firebase and Google Cloud Console so that it's easy to incorporate into your existing Google, Google development projects. In addition to the console, we're also providing you with access to developer tools that let you quickly and easily build apps for the assistant. Since the launch of our platform, we've worked with an expanding number of developer tools companies to make their solutions compatible with actions on Google. We've also expanded the capabilities of the newly renamed Dialogflow, our own conversation building tool, launching new features such as an inline code editor, multi-language support, and in-dialogue analytics. One tool that I'm extremely proud to promote is Templates. These allow you to build a fully functional, high-quality app for the assistant with no code at all. Just pick a template type, such as a trivia game or flashcards, fill in a spreadsheet with your content, and within minutes, you're ready to publish. In fact, I want every single one of you to try this as soon as you can. I promise it's that easy. While we are still in the early days of the platform, we are focused on making it more robust and expanding its reach and capabilities. One way we're doing that is by supporting the Google Assistant SDK, used to embed the Assistant into your own custom hardware devices, such as those powered by Android things. Or, with our smart home integration, it's possible for device makers to build IoT devices that can be controlled from the Google Assistant. Another way we're expanding is by constantly working to open up to new languages for actions on Google. We recently launched in UK, Australian, and Indian English, as well as French, Korean, Japanese, Spanish, and other languages. We're excited for the road ahead, and we want more of you to join us by developing for the platform. With an addressable audience of more than 100 million devices, new capabilities like proactive updates, and an improved developer experience, we think this is an incredible opportunity for all of us. The magic of the Assistant is enabled by Google's deep investment in AI and the cloud. So to tell you more about that, please welcome Kaz. Hello, everyone. I'm Kaz Sato. I'm developer advocate uh, for Google Cloud Team. It's like evangelist for developers. I'd like to introduce machine learning solutions and services from Google. And what are AI, machine learning, and neural network? There's no scientific definition of what is AI, but you can say it's the science to make things smart, like building an autonomous driving car or letting computer drawing a beautiful pictures. And there has been many approaches to realize the vision of AI, and one of them is the machine learning, or ML. With ML, you can, prog you can program your computer with data, not with the program code uh, written by human programmers. So computers can find a certain patterns from data to solve various problems. In ML, there are many different algorithms, and one of them is deep learning or deep neural network. 
And since 2012, we have been seeing a big breakthrough in the area of neural network. So Google has been making a significant investment in developing a neural network technology. Google has been deploying deep learning technologies in over 100 production projects, such as Google Search, or Android, or Maps, and Gmail, and so on. For example, Google Photos lets you search in photos with keywords. The deep learning algorithm recognizes the objects in photos, and so you don't have to add labels or tags by yourself. Inbox mobile app has the smart reply feature that uses natural language processing technology to generate replies for each email thread. So you can just choose one of them to reply on this thread. Over 12% of responses on the app are already gener generated by the app, the, this feature. Google Translate has introduced a new neural machine translation model generate, to generate the natural and fluent in translated text. And now Google is focusing on externalizing the power of machine learning to customers and developers. One of those ML products is Cloud ML API, the pre-trained machine learning models, such as Vision API for image recognition, or Speech API for voice recognition, and NLL API for natural language processing. Another ML transfer solution is TensorFlow. TensorFlow is an open source software for machine learning development that lets you train your own customized machine learning model. It is a standard ML tool used inside Google for developing any new machine learning or AI-based services. And Google has open sourced it in November 2015. TensorFlow is scalable and portable. You can start trying TensorFlow with your laptop, then learning it with GPU or tens or hundreds of GPUs on the cloud. Because TensorFlow is scalable, you don't have to change your TensorFlow match to bring, bring it to the large-scale distributed training. Also, once you have finished your training with a TensorFlow model, you can run it on various devices, such as smartphones or Raspberry Pi and everything. With those benefits, TensorFlow uh, got the, the most popular, uh, uh, big popularity from the, uh, the open source world, uh, the most popular deep learning framework in the industry now. TensorFlow is used by many large enterprises and projects for their POCs or production cases. Lastly, I'd like to show a demonstration called Find Your Candy. It's a demonstration that integrates the machine learning APIs and TensorFlow as a total ML solutions. Let's take a look at the video. And give it to you. Awesome. OK. All right, so click on that and speak into the mic. May I have some gum? So it understood what you said. May I have some gum? Now it's going through natural language processing. It's identifying the noun, the noun there, and gum. So now it's trying to, it will then match based upon the model that's been modified. Come on, come on, come on. And it is picking chewy gum. Oh, and there, the camera identified extra long lasting watermelon gum. Now the camera, uh, the and, and over, and there's your gum. <laughs> That's great. Machine learning in an app. So I'm, uh, I get to keep this, right? Yeah, actually, I've got like seven boxes back there. So <laughs> please, take everybody pick one. Dave, thanks so much. All right, thank you. Thank you. So as we saw, That's pretty great. Uh, ML APIs and TensorFlow provides a real-world ML solution that allows you to bring the latest deep learning technology to solve your own business problems today. So with that, I'd like to invite Anita on stage to tell you a bit more about TensorFlow Lite. Thank you, Kaz. My name is Anita, and I'm the technical project manager with TensorFlow on the Google Brain team. Bangalore is my hometown, and I'm really excited to be here with all of you. Go Bangalore. <laughs> Uh, I will be introducing you to TensorFlow Lite and why we need an on-device machine learning library. On one side, machine learning traditionally has been run on powerful machines with tremendous amount of compute power. On the other side, mobile devices are ubiquitous and are getting more and more powerful. Some of these devices have more compute power than what NASA had when they first sent a man on the moon. Think about it for a minute. We essentially walk with supercomputers in our pockets these days. 
these trends enable us to shift some of the machine learning workloads from the cloud back to the device, specifically enabling machine learning inference on mobile and embedded devices, thus pushing the boundaries a little further. There are several reasons why on-device machine learning is useful. First, application developers might want to maintain functionality and do inference while offline. Second, applications may have low latency requirements of the order of milliseconds and really cannot afford a round trip back to the cloud. Third, specific sensitive applications might have requirements for the data to not leave the device, thus ensuring user privacy. There is also a need for the applications to work under low bandwidth, where you don't have the luxury of downloading a huge model at the time of inference. Fourth, processing powers needs to be done without turning on power-hungry radios. These are some of the motivations to do on-device ML. Even though on-device ML sounds like a great idea, mobile devices come with many challenges and have to operate under constrained environments compared to their workstation counterparts. There's limited network bandwidth, limited memory, sometimes even limited computation. At the same time, these mobile devices have very aggressive release and engineering cycles, which means there's hardware heterogeneity, which leads to supporting machine learning on specialized hardware like GPUs and DSPs. We decided that making a product whose sole focus was mobile devices is essential. TensorFlow is primarily for large devices and TensorFlow Lite for smaller devices. Put it simply, TensorFlow Lite is a machine learning library to do inference on mobile and embedded devices that's easier, faster, and smaller. The primary goals of TensorFlow Lite are low latency, small binary footprint, and optimized throughput. TensorFlow Lite has support for Android neural network API that enables hardware acceleration, leveraging custom accelerators on the phone. We released the first developer preview of TensorFlow Lite a couple of weeks back, and we have support for popular image classification models as well as text-based smart reply models. We can't wait to see what you all come up with using this on-device inference library. Now please welcome Tal on stage to, from the Chrome team to tell you more about Chrome. Thank you. Thanks, Anita. Hi, everyone. My name is Tal. I'm from the Chrome team. And I'm excited to talk about some of the improvements that we've made on the web over the past year. The web is big. With over 2 billion instances of Chrome, we know that the web has tremendous reach. But one of the true strengths of the web is that it's bigger than any single browser. So regardless of whether the device is a smartphone or a laptop or a desktop or a tablet, they all have a browser. So any web-based experience is available on these billions of devices today. And we've seen this have a real impact on how many users web apps are reaching. We've all seen how quickly mobile has been growing. And native apps have been growing at an incredible pace with it. But what's really remarkable is that even with the web's large initial reach, we've seen the average monthly web audience growing even faster. And because of this growth, we're seeing the web expand into new areas, with experiences like WebVR being built on the web platform. So with the web pretty much everywhere, we're constantly trying to push the boundaries on what it can do. Over the past year, we've shipped hundreds of additional APIs that cover a range of capabilities, from making it easier to integrate payments to building fully capable offline media experiences directly on the web. But beyond just these core capabilities, we're also ensuring that the mobile web works well with the India stack. For example, with our payment request API, it's really easy to tie into popular payment methods for every region. So in India, we've ensured that it integrates with Google's new payments app, Tez. So it integrates with local businesses, banks, and India's unified payments interface. And with all of these capabilities, the modern mobile web also allows developers to build deep, rich mobile experiences with something that we call progressive web apps, or PWAs. PWAs are about helping web developers leverage the web's new capabilities to build high-class experiences that really feel immersive. They can load quickly, they work offline, 
And you can even send notifications to users. And we've seen a number of amazing experiences taking advantage of these new capabilities. As just one example, there's Ola, a popular ride-sharing app based right here in India, who recently built a progressive web app to help reach users in Tier 2 and Tier 3 cities. Here, they have a polished, fast, immersive experience that works on any connection. It can send users notifications, and it's built completely on the mobile web. So it's already accessible on billions of devices. And we're excited to announce that the reach of this PWA technology is huge, as the core technology powering this is now supported across top browsers, including UC Browser in India. And with the ability to create such immersive experiences like this, we also want to make sure that you can get back to it really easily. Add to Home Screen has always allowed users to add an experience to their Android home screen. But with our improved Add to Home Screen flow, when you add a PWA to your home screen, it's fully integrated into the platform. So to users, it feels like any other app experience on their device. It'll appear in the Android launcher alongside your Android apps. And it'll even appear in Android storage settings. But since it's a PWA, it's inherently small. So users are able to get an immersive experience without requiring extensive storage space. And this fast, integrated, improved Add to Home screen flow is available now. So with all of these new capabilities, we've also been working to make sure it's easy for web developers to build these experiences. We'll be going into a lot more detail on how to develop PWAs throughout the mobile web track. But no matter how you're building your web app, Lighthouse is a tool that can show you how to improve your web experience. Lighthouse is a Chrome extension and command line tool that quickly audits your site to identify how you can improve your app's performance, accessibility, and progressive web appiness. And we're excited to announce that as of M60, Lighthouse is now directly integrated into DevTools. So now you can quickly see how your website is doing and what to do next directly in Chrome. And with all of these tools, we've seen just how easy it can be for companies to take advantage of these new capabilities for their web experience. To give another example, there's Voot, a popular video streaming site, also based here in India. And it's an experience built on the web, so users can get to it directly. And with our new Add to Home Screen flow, it can also be easily accessed from the app launcher or the Android home screen. And when you open it, you get a high-class immersive experience. It automatically rotates to allow for full screen experiences. And with some of the newest APIs, they can even support downloading of videos and offline playback. And since it's built on the web, users can get this entire experience immediately on their devices. And this is just one example of many. Leveraging the modern mobile web is now the norm around the world. Whether they're building a PWA from scratch or leveraging the latest capabilities on their existing web experience, companies everywhere are seeing a tangible impact on their key metrics. With the modern mobile web, it's possible to easily build immersive, fully capable experiences that can reach billions of people around the world today. And now, let's turn our focus to what we're doing to make it easier to develop apps and grow your business. Please welcome Francis. Hi, I'm Francis, and I lead the Firebase product team. Our mission is to help developers like you build a better app and grow a more successful business. At I.O. 2016, we've expanded Firebase from a set of back-end services to a broad mobile platform to help you solve many of the common problems you face across the lifecycle of your app, from helping you build faster and easier with products like remote com uh, cloud storage and real-time database to helping you better understand and grow your users with tools like analytics and cloud messaging. Whether you're starting something new or looking to extend an existing app, we're here to help you so that you can channel more of your time and energy towards creating value for your users. And we make this available all through a single easy-to-use SDK available across platforms. To date, there are over 1 million developers that have used Firebase, and we're humbled that so many of you have trusted us with your apps, and we're committed to helping you succeed. Over the last year, our team has made many updates to Firebase, and I'd like to highlight a few of these. First, let's start with back-end services, where we provide you the core building blocks to help you build your apps faster and easier. One of these is Cloud Firestore. 
a NoSQL document database that scales automatically. Cloud Firestore features a new document collections data model, and it makes it a lot more intuitive for you to structure your data. It's also fully auto-managed, and it's built on Google's global infrastructure so that it will automatically scale with you, and you don't have to worry about managing your machine sizes, RAM allocation, or networks. Now, Firestore, like other Firebase products, also works with Cloud Functions. Cloud Functions gives you a way to deploy your JavaScript code to the cloud and execute it based on HTTP requests or through other events happening across Firebase. <clears throat> so for example, you can write a function to extend Cloud Firestore to do some server-side processing like data validation whenever a document is uploaded. With Firestore, Functions, and other Firebase backend services, our infrastructure will scale with your workload automatically from prototype to planet scale, freeing you from managing your own servers. So let's switch gears to talk about some other updates that can help you better understand and improve your app stability. Since welcoming the Fabric team to Google earlier this year, we have integrated Crashlytics into Firebase. Firebase Crashlytics is our flagship crash reporting product that helps you monitor and fix crashes and app errors. And in addition to monitoring app crashes, it's also really important to understand how your app performs out in the field, because users often abandon slow running apps. And that's where Firebase performance monitoring can help you better understand how your app performs across the diversity of devices and network conditions. Now, with just one line of code, you can get insights into your app's startup time and network latency. As well, you can add custom metrics to really understand how your app performs through those critical user flows that you really care about. And this is a great way to find those bottlenecks in your app that could be impacting your user engagement or even your business bottom line. So in addition to helping you build a better app, Firebase also helps you grow and engage more users. First, let's talk about cloud messaging, or FCM, which gives you an easy way to send notifications to engage your users. FCM is integrated with analytics, so it gives you many options to send targeted notifications to different user groups or app versions. Another great way to drive user engagement is by creating a personalized experience. And remote config helps you do that more easily by enabling you to change your app's configuration remotely and at runtime. It's also integrated with analytics, so you can fine tune and customize your app experience to different user segments or app versions. Now, many developers use FCM and remote config to create a more, uh, to create a more targeted experience. But we've also heard from many of you that you want an easier and more powerful way to test different variants. And for that, we've recently released first class A-B testing support for Firebase. With A-B testing, you can test different variants of notification messages or configuration values to different groups of users, and it will help you figure out which of these variants perform best for the goals that you've specified. So for example, you can figure out whether the orange button or the blue button help drive more user purchases. I'm also very excited to share that we've recently taken our first step of bringing Google's machine learning to Firebase with the release of Firebase Predictions. Predictions applies ML to your analytics data and helps you predict users' behavior like churn, spend, or other events that you've specified that are important to your app. Now, it's also integrated with other Firebase products, so you can take targeted actions like triggering an in-app promotion using remote config to users who are most likely to spend or, say, send the push notifications to target users who are likely to churn or run A-B tests across these different groups. I'm very excited to be here sharing these updates on behalf of the Firebase team and meeting many of you here. I look forward to hearing your feedback and continue to work hard to help you build a better app and grow a more successful business. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to welcome Pankaj back for some Please final Please welcome remarks. back Pankaj Gupta.
Thanks, everyone, for joining us this morning. I hope you are all as excited as I am about the progress we have been making with our developer product and platforms. Thank you to our speakers, Dan, Sachit, Kaz, Anita, Tal, and Francis. For the rest of the day, you're invited to participate in technical sessions, trainings, code labs, and explore the sandboxes right outside. So please enjoy the Google Developer Days India event. Thank you. Welcome to Google Developer Days India. We're happy that you'll be joining us for two days of talks, demos, hands-on training, and more. By now, you've checked into registration to receive your badge. Your badge must be visibly worn at all times, and don't forget you'll need it for the amazing after party at the end of the day. The help desk is located near registration. If you have any questions or are in need of assistance, feel free to stop by. All sessions will be taking place in either Hall 3A or the Jacaranda Room in the Conference Center. For hands-on trainings, be sure to visit the Golmahar and Casilla Rooms in the Conference Center, where instructors will teach you how to use the latest Google technologies. No Google event would be complete without showcasing the newest products and technologies, so we invite you to explore the different demos, office hours, and review clinics in the Hall 3B Sandbox area. Be sure to check out the Community Lounge and Google Developers and Cloud Certification Lounge, which are also located in the Hall 3B Sandbox area. There will be scheduled meetups, fun activities, and engagement opportunities, as well as places to just sit and relax and meet with your peers. We're looking forward to a fun two days with you, and would like to take this opportunity to remind you that Google is dedicated to providing an inclusive event experience for everyone, and that by attending GDD India, you agree to our code of conduct, which has been placed around the venue and on the website. Thanks for attending Google Developer Days India, and have a wonderful time exploring everything that Google has to offer. Ladies and gentlemen, please make your way to your chosen breakout session, which will begin in five minutes. Thank you.
Hey. Namaskara, swagata. Um, hello and welcome to Bangalore. And for those of you from Bangalore, you know, thank you for welcoming us to your wonderful city. Um, my name is Sam Dutton, and I'm a developer advocate for the web. Uh, I've only been here a few days, you know, but I've already met a bunch of brilliant developers doing great work on the web. Uh, now, I live in London, but you know, I grew up in South Australia, quite close to the beautiful Adelaide Cricket Oval. I don't know if anyone's ever seen this, but uh, anyway, I'm here today and tomorrow with a lot of other uh, Googlers who are web developers and who work on Chrome. So you know, if you have questions, please come and chat to us in the sandbox area. So I think we're at a turning point for the web, and uh, I'd like to explain why I think that uh, progressive web apps are at the heart of that. So this is my third visit to Bangalore, and uh, since the first time I was in Bangalore, there has been a revolution on the mobile web. You know, in that time, the explosion of mobile usage has completely transformed the landscape of the web. Um, of course, we're seeing huge growth in the number of people you know, who only go online on, on mobile, even in the United States, as these figures show. Overall, of course, there's a massive increase in internet usage. China, as you can see, is still on top, but, you know, check out the growth in uh, India. That's just fantastic. And there's massive potential for growth on the web. And again, this is where India really stands out. I was just looking, uh, you know, at a kind of roundup of, of devices uh, and, and noticing like this, you know, this increasing access to affordable devices. Like these phones you probably have seen, like they're, you know, like three to five thousand rupees and their specs are pretty good, like quad core, maybe 512 meg, a gig of RAM, maybe 16 gig storage. You know, you can run some uh, pretty powerful websites on these devices. And of course, you know, we've had the uh, crazy price wars, like carrier competition, lots of factors driving down data prices. And now, you know, data in India has a cost that's uh, well below 2% of GDP per capita, which uh, you know, has been defined as the threshold for affordability for most people. But it's not all good news. Globally, 60% of mobile connections are still 2G. Um, you know, even in London, where I live, you'll find lots of areas with poor cell coverage um, or no connectivity at all. In uh, you know, the US, as you can see, a lot of people do not have access to fast broadband. You know, it's, it's the same on broadband, where infrastructure is often poor. And we see a similar picture in many regions. Back in India, most mobile connections are still predicted to be on 2G even by 2020. And of course, you know, mobile only doesn't mean that everyone on the web has like a high-tech smartphone. Um, most users globally, of course, are on older, low-spec phones, and there are even some new low-spec phones, as you, I'm sure, have seen, you know, the Geophone and then the Alcatel Go Flip in the US that have become, you know, an appealing and accessible upgrade for, for some users. Uh, not least, you know, the hundreds of millions of feature phone users who now want to, like, buy pizza and watch uh, Kabaddi online. Um, all this, all this is, is a major challenge to web developers. So like I say, I think we're at a, a turning point for the web. And let me explain with a little history of where I think the web has gone. Um, does anyone actually know what this is? You know, this is a modem. This is how we used to connect to the internet. Uh, back in the days when 56 uh, like kilobits a second was very optimistic. Um, does anyone remember this uh, dynamic HTML? You know, it spread through the web and uh, it kind of was powerful, the use of JavaScript, but uh, it also gave us kind of dysfunctional, you know, slide out menus and uh, crazy page transitions and so on. And this kind of toxic combination, which was over optimistic coding and uh, poor connectivity, meant that, you know, I'm not kidding, like some sites in those days would take like several minutes to load. So DHTML, the use of uh, JavaScript in those days was powerful and gave us, you know, some interesting stuff 
but also a lot of poor experiences. And to be honest, uh, a lot of us as developers willfully ignored the consequences of using JavaScript in that way. And all that peaked around the time of like the dot-com bust, you know, around the turn of the millennium, uh, which coincidentally uh, coincides with the demise of DHTML. But out of the ashes of the dot-com boom um, came a new generation of like really paired back, you know, performant websites, um, sites that really worked. And at that point, we also saw sites making good use of the web's capabilities as well as its reach. For example, you know, early online maps were like a revelation, but uh, you know, still very slow and kind of clunky to use. So Google's use of Ajax for Google Maps and Gmail, like mid-2000s, you know, really completed this transformation of the web that we call you know, Web 2.0. Now, more recently, we've seen an incredible transformation as the web platform has become increasingly capable. As you can see from this slide, which you know, I stole from uh, Tal's keynote presentation. Um, so the web had the reach and then it got capabilities to match native apps. So everything is cool, right? It's fantastic. Well, the problem has been that with all this capability, and perhaps you know, because developers are often living in a world with uh, you know, great connectivity, brilliant broadband, we started seeing this kind of stuff. Uh, sites with poor page load performance and a huge number of requests on first load. So just kind of rather like the uh, bad old days of the dot-com boom and DHTML, some developers you know, seem to be ignoring real users with real-world connectivity. So you've probably heard this many times. You know, we we're going to keep showing this slide until things change. 19 seconds is the time it takes the average mobile web page to load on 3G. You know, it's a miracle ever, anyone ever loads some pages, I think. Um, and pages have become heavier too. And that's a problem for performance, but also for many users, data cost is a major constraint to internet access, um, even more than connectivity. Of course, heavy payloads don't just add to data cost and radio usage. You know, the assets required to run an app can also use up limited storage space. So it's really important to keep apps light. And I think progressive web apps are really a response to all this, an attitude to building great web experiences. Progressive web apps make the most of the web's reach and capability, but they also show to respect to users um, you know, by being honest about uh, real-world constraints and uh, the constraints of devices. But what does that mean in practice? Uh, well, you know, as a brand, uh, Progressive Web Apps has been extremely powerful very quickly. Um, you know, I think we hit peak PWA when I came across this article in The Grocer magazine saying Progressive Web Apps are cool. Um, you know, you know a technology brand is working when uh, it's recommended like by a journal for supermarket executives, you know. Anyway, but what, is, what does this mean for developers? Um, I think Alex Russell really nailed it with a very specific checklist uh, of the entry-level features that should be part of every website. If you haven't read his blog post about this, I think you should really check it out. Um, this is really a manifesto for great web experiences. Uh, my colleague Chris Wilson has recently coined this acronym, FIRE, and this uh, really sums up what uh, progressive web apps are about. You know, the expectation from users is that web experiences will be fast, engaging, and reliable, and that they're integrated with device hardware and platforms and with other apps. So this is why we're at a turning point for the web. We're at a point where successful developers you know, are getting realistic about what works and what doesn't and what really matters to users. And the huge leap forward in capabilities, you know, it's being combined with resilient performance design. Indian developers have taught us that uh, you don't need perfect connectivity to provide a great online experience. You know, that's where Bangalore, I have to say, really is, is leading the world, I think. Um, the flip side of this is that we get this huge rise now in user expectations. You know, the web gets better, so users expect more. Um, the bar is 
high and getting higher. It's, it's not enough just to provide a service and expect the, where, the reach of the web to make you successful. A great example from the Chrome Dev Summit here. Um, you know, on the left is like an old style website. It, it's functional, the information is kind of there. It kind of works, but users expect something more now. Uh, the new site on the right is, is a much better experience. It's, it's a really beautiful piece of work, I think. So the point here is that it's no longer enough just to provide a service. So a big part of what makes progressive web apps successful is that multiple browsers are committed to the technologies that enable them. You know, while developer adoption is growing for progressive web apps, so is browser support. Uh, Opera, Samsung, Microsoft, Mozilla are on board. Uh, Service Worker is in Safari Tech Preview along with the Cache API and many other features that, you know, are already in place in Safari. Um, one little furry creature has been missing from this list. Uh, UC is a very popular browser in India and other countries. And I'm, I'm really pleased that uh, the incredible work, actually, from the engineering team at UC, what they've done to move their browser to the Blink engine, making it a great platform for progressive web apps. So with this in line, I'd like to uh, welcome on stage a very special guest, Jiwei uh, from the UC browser team. Thank you, Jiwei. Hi, Sam. Hi, everyone. Good to see you here. So, as you can see, uh, UC now provides basic support for PWA features, including Service Worker, the yeah. Cache API, and for Fetch. Um, but the great news is that uh, in U4 2.0, UC will provide full support for Web Push and Add to Home Screen, and fully embracing you know, progressive web apps on the platform. So, so yeah. if you have any questions about UC browser, please contact us via the email on the screen. And I truly believe we can make a, make a web, mobile web a better future. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Shiwei. Thank you, Sam. Yeah. Thank so you. the UC folks will be on hand later in the sandbox. So please come and okay. talk. Thank, Thank you. you. So anyway, remember what I said, um, you know, apps need to be fast, integrated, reliable, and engaging. Uh, I'd like to, like to dive into that in some more detail. You know, loading an app has to feel instant. It's kind of invisible process. You know, remember that most uh, users will abandon sites that take more than a few seconds to load. There are some really great sites that we would like to call out, though. LMA is a great example of this. Uh, this is a Chinese site with 260 million users, almost kind of Indian scale, um, and over 1.3 million restaurant listings. Um, it's interactive in two seconds. So, you know, check out their code. It's really worth a look. They're doing a great job there. Now, page load speed has also been a critical goal of the AMP project. They took, you know, a radically realistic approach, uh, building for the real world. And uh, if you want to learn more about uh, working with AMP, check out Ben Morse's presentation. And we have an AMP training session tomorrow afternoon. As you'll find out, AMP and progressive web apps can work really well for building sites and apps that, as we say, you know, start fast and stay fast. So, like I said, web apps should be kind of invisible. You know, by that I mean you need seamless integration across devices, platform, and context. So, you know, apps should not get between users and what they want to do. In fact, I think people should not have to even think about the fact that they're, you know, on the web or in a native app or whatever. It's just that they're using their phone or tablet, whatever, to complete a task. So, case in point, e-commerce. It's all about removing friction by integrating across device and platform and context. Um, just to be clear, you know, mobile commerce is a huge deal. Last year, mobile commerce was worth $123 billion in the US alone. It's incredible. And it's no surprise, you know, given the, uh, the rise of mobile computing, that you know, a majority of commercial traffic is uh, coming from mobile devices. Now, what is surprising here is how much of that 
mobile commerce is actually happening on the web rather than in native apps. However, conversion rates for the mobile web, as many of you will know, are far lower than for desktop websites. Uh, mobile conversions are about a third of desktop conversions, and this is a fundamental challenge for the web. You know, the web has gone mobile, but conversions on mobile remain low. And that, you know, makes sense in many ways because entering data on mobile is hard. So please, if you do one thing today, mark up your forms properly. You know, it's easy. Add autocomplete and type attributes. Seriously, this is so easy. Do a pull request today and make us all happy. You know, it just makes your users' lives much, much easier. But, you know, as much as autofill is great, it's, it's really not enough to kind of transform the web for e-commerce. Um, the payment request API goes a step further. This is, if you don't know it, a W3C standard for browsers that provides an interface for users to enter payment and shipping data. So, you know, customers get a consistent experience across platforms, and developers don't have to reinvent the wheel, even, you know, a tiny boutique or a giant e-commerce retailer. What's really interesting in India is the rise of I don't know, like debit cards, and, but you know, all varieties of online payment. Uh, it's predicted that by uh, 2020, more than 50% of uh, India's internet users will be using digital payments. Um, and the top 100 million users will actually drive 70% digital payments, which is pretty amazing. Another area where we've seen fantastic integration on the web is with media. Uh, we've added new APIs to give developers uh, control to build robust, secure, and efficient media experiences on the web. And we've made it possible to download and consume media online. But media, you know, it's particularly important to get right. Uh, over 70% of uh, internet traffic is video. And, you know, that number's increasing. And especially, of course, here in India with uh, what's happened with uh, 4G and so on. It's becoming something that users just expect on the web. Media companies are seeing a lot of success here. Uh, GeoCinema, I'm sure you know this, was it like an app-only business. Uh, it went to web for the first time a couple of months ago with this PWA. Uh, they're already seeing like 10% longer session time on average than for their native app and, and better reach for their customers in tier two and tier three cities, which is fantastic. Um, if you want to learn more about media capabilities, I, I really recommend looking at this. Uh, there's a brilliant progressive web app for media. It's at you know, Bitly, PWA Media. Uh, it's built by Paul Lewis, used to be my boss, now works for DeepMind. And it gives you adaptive streaming, pre-caching, custom controls, uh, thumbnails, and downloadable video. It's a, a fantastic piece of work, a great place to start if you're thinking of implementing video. You know, this, this technology really opens up the web to even more platforms. Uh, with the Web VR API, we see this incredible expressive power coming to the web. Uh, companies like Sketchfab, you know, this stunning VR experience, lots of scenes to explore. Anyway, enough of that stuff. Um, just getting back to basics, I uh, just want to talk about reliability for a moment. So, in order for web apps to take a place on the home screen, you know, we need to make them reliable, even when the network isn't. And this has been one of the things holding back the web as an app platform. We've become conditioned to think that the web only works with a live network. Uh, this is where service workers come in. So I just wanted to ask, who here has heard of service workers and has a pretty good idea, you know, of what they are and why they're game-changing for the web? So who has worked with service workers? Okay. Oh, well, that's pretty good. Okay. But, you know, the traditional web model for those who haven't worked with Service Worker is that, you know, the browser goes to the network and looks up the web server and asks for a page and its resources. Um, the browser, you know, has an HTTP cache, but uh, the developer can't control that. And if the network is down, you know, you get a visit from our friend, the Downasaur. And that experience can be even worse with flaky connectivity, where that's neither up nor down. But, uh, you know, with Service Workers, you don't necessarily need to traverse the network every time. So a service worker is a client-side proxy that acts as an intermediary between your app and the outside world. It's great for offline, but like I say, also for handling an offline connection or unreliable connectivity. Um, for example, you can implement timeouts for network requests to make sure that users are never kept waiting. 
So, for simple cases, you know, service workers are pretty straightforward, but as you can see here, service worker design can get complex for more complex caching strategies in the real world. Um, and this is where Workbox comes in. This is a great toolbox, making it really simple to build successful caching strategies into your web app. And it uh, you know, enables you to support offline and uh, handle unreliable connectivity. Um, the training team will be running a session uh, this afternoon to teach you how to use it. So all these pillars, like fast and integrated and reliable, really lead to engaging. Uh, and I want to show you just one app that does that particularly well. Uh, for those unfamiliar, Trivago is one of the world's leading hotel search engines uh, operating in 55 countries. And uh, you know, it shows how investment in reliable experiences really pays off. And that's because uh, Trivago used Service Worker to build a really resilient web app. Um, I think that you know, Service Worker and the Cache API mean that network resilience is becoming the norm for high quality web experiences. And you know, successful sites like Trivago are really embracing that. Um, you now, their PWA is really providing business value as well, like a huge increase in click throughs uh, to hotel offers for them. Now, as uh, Jenny Gove will be explaining in her UX talk later, uh, we know that from research, you know, people like the convenience of launching apps from their home screen uh, if it's something they turn to regularly. And again, Trivago is doing a great job of this. As you can see, like, the code to enable add to home screen is really straightforward. You know, in a manifest file, you specify like a title, icon, other details of how your app appears on the user's device, and you add a link to the manifest in your HTML, and that's it. You can add this to your site in you know, about five minutes. So all in all, progressive web apps combine the reach of the web with the capabilities to improve engagement on mobile. Now, I know this all sounds great, but you know, reality sinks in, we go back to our day jobs, and building a progressive web app can seem like a huge undertaking. But implementing PWA techniques does not have to be a monolithic refactoring task, and I want to talk about some ways to get started. Um, you know, progressive web apps need a solid foundation. No amount of you know, PWA magic is going to fix like blocking JavaScript or bloated images. Uh, you need to fix those problems first uh, before implementing PWA techniques. I mean, when it comes down to it, progressive web apps are websites, yeah. Um, so there are some relatively simple changes that you can implement that can have a big impact on performance um, and for security, reliability, and data cost. Uh, now, rather than try and talk through these uh, large number of bullet points, um, I recommend you take a look at the guide linked to here. This, like I say, shows how to make a number of relatively simple fixes that will improve any website. You know, these are low-hanging fruit and really like table stakes for building a progressive web app. So, we've been working on training resources uh, for progressive web apps and also on a certification program. So on stage now, I'd like to invite Sarah Clark, who manages our training team. Thank you, Sarah. Good to see you. Good to see you, Sam. Thank you. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> we got it? It was hard to do that. OK, come on. There we go. So I'm Sarah Clark. I'm the program manager in charge of web developer training and certification. Quite a few of you have probably seen me on the Google Developers India YouTube channel teaching progressive web apps. I came out here to Bangalore in February, and that's where we filmed the class. So remember this that Tal showed you in the first session? These are features we've added only in the last year. The, the web's getting new features at incredible yeah. speed, and best practices are just changing so quickly that how do you make sure your skills are up to date? Now, we have three things that have been out for most of the year or longer. Um, the developer.google.com slash training site will guide you to all of them. But we put our entire PWA course on developers.google.com. You can watch it there or on YouTube. Uh, we also have individual courses on Udacity. And these are all free. There's no cost for any of them. The courses that we've published recently, the classroom courses, are all open source. So if you want to take it and teach it in your company, or if you want to teach it commercially, 
Just talk to me and we'll get you the materials. So my team has also built the Mobile Web Specialist Certification Program, and we announced this a month ago in Krakow. We looked at 10,000 job descriptions to determine what hiring managers want today. Um, so, and it's not always the absolute latest thing, but it's what gets you ready for everything we're talking about here. So it's a global certification, so we looked at jobs around the world, and it includes the skills you'll need for international markets. So for example, if you're building for US or Europe, these are core skills you'll need for there. Certification is all online. It's a test that you take where you solve about 14 to 17 real programming challenges in four hours. It's not super easy. Most developers have to study, yeah. and most developers need at least three to four years of real world experience or some pretty intensive study to get through it. Yeah, I can vouch for that. I did the test. It's he really did. hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, true. but the nice thing about it being hard like that is it guarantees that, hey, you know your stuff. So we provide a free study guide so you can study for the test or just make sure your skills are up to date. So feel free to take a look at that. Just look at developers.google.com slash training. And then one more thing. If you saw the news last week and it was mentioned in the opening session, we announced 130,000 scholarships here in India last week. 30,000 of those are for Udacity courses, including 10,000 of those include the, the study course leading up to the certification and the cost of the certification. Um, 100,000 of these are subscriptions to Pluralsight, where there's a lot of really useful material you can learn from. And with that, that's a lot to remember. So just remember developers.google.com slash training slash programs slash India. This will get you to the India specific page with all the information, including all of the scholarships. So Sam, why don't we wrap this up? Yeah, let's wrap this up. So thank you, Sarah. And yeah, I would really recommend the training, a great way to keep your skills up to date. Um, Anyway, so to get started with Progressive Web Apps, you know, we have some great sessions, as you can see, coming up today and tomorrow, more technical content. And we also have, you know, expert web Googlers on hand, people from the Chrome team, to answer your questions and solve your problems in the web area. And uh, come and check out our stuff in the sandbox. Check out the Lighthouse if you haven't seen that already. The web team is also running three hands-on workshops, 90 minutes each. So today, data-driven Progressive Web Apps, how to build web apps that work with data online and off, using Workbox from website to PWA, and then tomorrow morning, combining accelerated mobile pages and PWA. They're in the other building, um, and come on over. They're free. Bring your laptop, and we'll get you to some really interesting stuff. Yeah. And if you want to learn more about PWAs, I've actually put together a whole bunch of links uh, to great resources at uh, bit.ly slash PWA resources. So lots more good stuff there as well too, from external uh, experts. And lastly, always, you know, if you want to learn about what's new on the web, do check out Web Fundamentals. Uh, our content at developers.google.com slash web is, you know, right at the forefront. Stuff from people who are building, building browsers and working on web specs. And that's it. Yeah. I mean, most of all, please feel free to contact, you know, Sarah and me, and, and speak to any of the Googlers here. Yep. OK, thank you very much. Thank you so much. You know, we're here to learn what you're doing on the web and to find out like, what we can do to make the web better and help you build great experiences you know, ah, for all your users. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Danya Vada. <laughs> thank you.
Hi, I'm Sean McQuillan, developer advocate for Android. At Google I.O., we announced that Kotlin is a supported language for Android development. And today, I'm going to talk about how Kotlin can help you write great code. I'm going to do that by diving into some typical test code that you write every day and adding Kotlin. We're going to go pretty deep, and full warning, most of this talk is code. I thought I'd start out by talking a bit about what Kotlin is and why we've decided to support it for Android. Kotlin is a modern programming language. It has type inference, first-class functions, lambdas, coroutines, and all of the features you expect from a modern language. Kotlin borrows the best features from other languages to allow you to write less boilerplate code and produce better software. But Kotlin isn't just expressive. It's a language built for industry. What do I mean by that? Kotlin is expressive without sacrificing performance. It's easy and natural to write Kotlin code that has the same runtime performance as code written in the Java programming language. Kotlin keeps just enough boilerplate to scale your source code to hundreds of thousands of lines of code or more, and it does this by never sacrificing readability for abstractions. A core design goal of Kotlin is just enough boilerplate. When it added in abstractions, Kotlin has chosen to keep readability, and it's always possible to figure out what a line of code does just by reading the source. Since JetBrain makes Kotlin, you know it's going to have great tooling, and Kotlin is fully supported in both IntelliJ and Android Studio. Of course, Kotlin wouldn't be interesting if it didn't work with our existing programs or if it was hard to learn. Kotlin works with existing source code, libraries, and frameworks so well that it's really easy to extend your existing programs with new abstractions. I'm going to do that a lot later in this talk. It's also really easy to learn Kotlin. There's not many surprises. Most of the things in Kotlin work exactly the way you're used to from the Java programming language. Kotlin just reduces the boilerplate and adds expressive new features. I'd like to introduce you to our testing ninja now. It's our mascot at Google for testing on Android. Since I'm going to be talking about testing today to motivate Kotlin, I thought it'd be a good idea to talk about what kind of test code we should be writing for our Android apps. I'm going to revisit some of the content that we covered at I.O. 2017 about how to test Android apps. To start off, we want to write unit tests. They're everyone's favorite kind of test. A unit test tests an isolated unit, like a class or a method. And it does this by isolating all of the dependencies using mocks. You can get extremely quick feedback to the exact line of code that caused a test failure when a unit test fails. And unit tests execute an order of magnitude faster than other kinds of tests. So executing thousands of unit tests takes seconds, not minutes. This quick feedback cycle lets you be confident as a developer, finding errors as soon as you introduce them to the code base, not minutes or hours later. Your modules that don't have Android dependencies should be tested using JUnit. And areas of your code that interact with the Android framework, RoboElectric is a good solution for isolating your code from Android. We recommend about 70% of your tests be written as unit tests. Next in our testing story, we have integration tests. An integration test differs from a unit test because it combines multiple components in our apps. For example, you might test a fragment coupled with the database and the network layer. Integration tests are more precise than end-to-end -end tests, though they are less precise than unit tests because they test multiple features together. For these reasons, we recommend writing about 20% of your tests as integration tests. And then finally, end-to-end -end tests. Is everyone here familiar with Espresso? All right, for those of you who aren't, Espresso is a UI testing framework that allows you to do things like click on a button and then check your app state, just like a user was using the app. Espresso is the best way to ensure your app works because it works at the full integration level, all the way at the UI. However, that does mean it's much, much slower than unit tests. More, if you only write Espresso tests for your app, it's often very difficult to find out what line of code caused a test failure because the test runs against the fully integrated app with all of the components working together. At Google, we recommend about 10% of an app's tests be written using end-to-end -end testing and use for example, you want to make sure your sign-up form is exercised, but then do exhaustive testing with other kinds of tests. All right, let's get back to Kotlin. That's enough testing theory for today. I'm going to dive into some very simple unit tests. They're probably similar to tests that you write every day. I'm going to use Kotlin features to build abstractions and improve readability while cutting out boilerplate. 
let's start off talking about how to extend existing APIs in Kotlin. I'm going to be writing a test for this activity, which has an options menu with a help item. The help menu item is removed in some code paths, so I want to make sure that it's added in the default case. If you're familiar with RoboElectric, these should be really easy to follow. And if not, I'll explain as we go along. Our first attempt at implementing this in Kotlin might look like this. To get the menu, we ask for the shadow of the activity. A shadow is a wrapper class provided by RoboElectric that adds extra functionality for testing. Next, we use the shadow to get the options menu from our activity. Get options menu is provided by RoboElectric. You could have instead called on create options menu and on prepare options menu on the activity, but this simplifies the API and shortens our test. This is the first edit we're going to make for Kotlin. Accessing getters and setters in Kotlin is done with the property syntax. It's still going to call the getter, but you don't need to type it every single time. Now let's go ahead and take a look at that shadow of method. Just by looking at it, we can tell it's a static method that takes a single parameter. In fact, since RoboElectric is open source, I jumped in and found out it is, in fact, a static method that takes a single parameter of an activity. This construction works extremely well, and we've all used static methods to extend the behavior of classes that we can't edit. But wouldn't it be cool if we could actually add this method to our activity class, but only when we're writing tests? Kotlin provides extension functions and extension properties to do exactly this, and we're going to use them a lot today. An extension function is an extension of an existing class, adding another member to the class that already exists. Likewise, an extension property adds a getter or a setter to a class that already exists. Let's look at how to do that. By using the extension syntax shown here, you can add an extension function to the activity class. This is extremely powerful, not just because it lets you avoid littering your code with static calls, the IDE knows about the extension function and will show it for code completion. You can also create extension properties. Here you can see the syntax for that, and you'll see properties have first-class syntax, just like languages like C Sharp or Swift. If you're like me, you're used to generating your getters and setters using Android Studio, and you haven't written one of these in years. Well, in Kotlin, you don't have to write getters and setters if you're using the default implementation. All properties are accessed via a getter and setter generated by Kotlin. If you need to write custom getters, for example, here where we have a synthetic getter, the property is completely synthetic, so the syntax puts the declaration of the getter right next to the field declaration. Never again will you have to hunt through the class trying to find a getter for a member variable. And this is a great example of how Kotlin makes code more readable by leaving just the required boilerplate. Extension methods and properties are really just static methods once they're compiled. You can call them from your Java classes by passing an object as an argument. And this is really the key to understanding extensions in Kotlin. They're just static methods. They have the exact same resolution as a static method in Java, and there's no fancy call semantics. You're not even allowed to call an extension method or property if the class provides a real member with the same signature. So our test can now use the extension property like it was defined on the activity class. This shows how Kotlin can improve the API of an existing library by adding abstractions. Doing this makes our code easier to read as well as write. And to make it better, if someone comes across this and doesn't know what the extension property does, Android Studio will help them find the definition. There's a bit of magic here, but it's clearly spelled out, and it's easy to figure out how it works just by reading this file and using the tools. Now, it's time to add an assertion to this test. So I'm just going to use assert equals and check that the menu item was added. This is a pretty standard test. And in real code, we probably also checked that the item was visible and enabled. But let's keep it short, because we're in a talk. So far, we've talked about extension functions and properties. We'll keep building on extensions in this talk and see how they can power API extractions to simplify our code. Now, I'd like to turn our attention to defining new APIs in Kotlin. What we really wanted for this test was a fluent assertion. A fluent assertion reads like this. The item should have a title, help. By using extension functions, you can add fluent assertions directly to your existing types. In this case, you want to make an assertion on menu item. This is a really simple function to write, and it shows off the power of Kotlin extensions. If we tried to implement this in a language without extensions, it would 
require building a large system of testing types to expose the fluent assertion. Already, Kotlin is cleaning up our code here, but I'd like to add another feature. Kotlin supports infix calls. An infix call just means put the operator in the middle. Let's take a look at should have title as an infix method. To make a method infix, just add the infix keyword. Infix can be applied to member methods or extension functions that take a single argument. Here, should have title takes a string, so when we call it, it looks like this. We no longer have to specify the dot or use parentheses. Adding it all up, we've managed to create a fluent assertion that makes our code extremely readable. The infix assertion makes our last line express exactly what we're trying to say in a very clean style. I do want to say, Kotlin gives us a lot of power with infix and operator overloading. Here we're cleaning up a testing API, and it makes sense. However, you want to be cautious while adding this to your code, because it can hurt readability when overused. Next, we're going to cover a very powerful feature in Kotlin that we can apply everywhere in our code bases. Kotlin provides reified types. Reified just means real, and we'll see why in just a second. We've been skipping over the setup method for this test on all the previous slides. That's quite a bit of boilerplate, and really all we're trying to say is setup activity. There we go. Let's go ahead and write that in Kotlin. Setup activity is a one-line function that hides all of that boilerplate. And you can see here how the reified works. Since T is reified, or real, you can access its class, which you couldn't do with an erased generic type. This is extremely powerful, and all of our code bases are littered with class arguments that Kotlin can help us clean up. The real power of setup activity is provided by type inference. Since Kotlin can figure out the type of T based entirely off the type of subject, we don't have to specify the type repeatedly in this call. So, so far, I've talked about how extension functions work in a few ways. And I've also shown how to use infix and fluent assertions, and how to use reified types to cut lots of boilerplate. Now I want to talk about lambdas. These are function literals, and due to some syntax support in Kotlin, they're very powerful as an abstraction. We'll combine them with extensions and other features to really clean up our code. Now, Lambda syntax in Kotlin is somewhat novel if you're coming from the Java programming language. So let's take a moment to cover the basics. You create a lambda by surrounding a code block with curly brackets and using the arrow syntax. This code defines a variable increment that has a function literal. The function literal is defined with the curly brackets, and the parameter is on the left side. It says a value of integer, and then the body is value plus 1. Then we call increment, which is just a variable, with 2 and get the value 3. You can specify the type of the variable with the arrow syntax like this. Here, we're saying increment is any function that takes an integer and returns an integer. We then assign a lambda to the variable increment, and you can note that value doesn't need its type specified again. It's passed through using type inference. And we're going to use that feature of the language a lot to clean up our code. Lambdas get even more interesting when they're passed to functions. This is a function ply that takes one argument of any type, and then a function that takes any and moves to unit. Unit is Kotlin's way of saying void. And if you look at the call syntax for apply, you'll see that you can pass a lambda to apply outside of the parenthesis. You can pass lambdas this way whenever there is a function whose last parameter is a function argument. And this is really sweet syntax sugar. You can use this call syntax to build expressive APIs and cut tons of boilerplate. When combined with extension functions and type inference, it makes otherwise tedious code beautiful. For example, you've all written argument captures using Makito before, and it looks something like this. You call verify on a mock object, and then you pass a capture argument to your mock call. This will allow your test to access any parameter that's been passed to the mock. By capturing a network call back here, the test can fake a network reply and continue as if the network had returned a result. Of course, you need to declare the captor. Look at all that boilerplate. Argument captor is repeated twice. Network listener is repeated twice. And even with all of that repetition, there's still an unchecked cast at the generic type with the red underline. Let's go ahead and see what we can do in Kotlin. In Kotlin, here's an example of a cleaned up API. 
It's keeping just enough code to be readable, but removing all of the extra boilerplate. Reading it, we can see that we make a network capture, we use it to capture a value, and then we replay the captured call. Let's go ahead and implement this API in Kotlin. To get started, we're going to create a type alias for argument capture. This is a useful way to reduce repetition when a generic type is long, like you see here. The type alias can be used in place of the expanded type, but it does not actually create a new type. It's just an alias. Now, to define the network capture function, use the type alias to simplify repetitive code. Type aliases are a great way to simplify APIs in Kotlin and provide semantic meaning to complex generic types without having to write another class. Network capture takes a function argument called verify. Verify is any function that takes no arguments and returns unit, which is Kotlin's way of saying void. You can see that this function type is an extension function on net capture. Now, I'm going to talk more about what this means in a minute, but when we define a function this way, it's called an extension lambda. Network capture takes a function argument called, sorry, to, to actually capture an argument, you need to make an argument capture. There's a bit of Kotlin magic here, but we've seen it before. It's calling a function to construct an argument capture that has a complicated generic type that we're not specifying. You might expect I'm going to use reified types to implement argument capture, and you're right. It's another one-line function with a reified type to produce a correct argument capture. By designing our code for type inference like we've done here, you can greatly reduce the boilerplate in your code. This pattern applies in so many places in Android, so make sure you figure out how this works. You specify the type exactly once on the variable capture, and type inference takes care of the rest. The type t is inferred for the function call, and since it's reified, it's able to construct a new argument captor. Extension lambdas are the last type of extensions in Kotlin. An extension lambda is a floating extension function, and it's pretty powerful. I've already shown you how to declare them. Let's talk about how to call them. To call an extension lambda, we apply it to an object. In this example, we're going to call the variable verify on the object captor. Since verify is an extension lambda, it will pass capture as the implicit this parameter to the function. And this is really powerful, allowing us to build APIs that look like language extensions. And of course, the caller is going to want to be able to use the capture outside of our block, so we pass it back and come back to our test. Here we can see how it looks to apply an extension lambda. The argument capture has the implicit this, or we can say it explicitly. Extension lambdas are a really powerful way to define APIs. They help us clean up code whenever the receiver of the lambda is obvious. In this example, it is clear that the block is operating on a network capture. And the capture method makes sense when called with an implicit this. Now, of course, we don't want to make extension lambdas for every single API. And in a lot of cases, naming the argument to a lambda is preferable. For the second lambda in our replay call function, it's not obvious at runtime or at call time what the argument is. So we prefer to let the caller name it. Just by looking at replay call, we can see that it's an extension function on network capture that takes a function with one argument and then replays the captured call. Passing the captured argument to the lambda. In this case, the captured argument is a callback, so we name our variable appropriately. But in other cases, it might be a string or an integer or other kinds of objects. Now, we've done all of these things before, so let's go ahead and write that out in code. We first define an extension function on any argument capture that takes a function argument with a single argument of type t. And since we only want to replay a single call, we can assert that there's been exactly one call to our argument capture. You can see it's using the implicit this from the extension function replay call to call get all values on the argument capture. And finally, it applies the function argument to the captured value from the argument capter. So all total, that was 14 lines of library code that's going to simplify all of our tests in Kotlin. It used lambdas and extensions and other powerful features in Kotlin to turn this code 
into this. And we can write it like this throughout our entire code base going forward. Much simpler. I want to mention right here, the API here was inspired by a library called Kotlin Makito. Or, and so I think you should check that out instead of implementing it yourself in your own code bases. So putting it all together, we've seen that ex an extension functions are a versatile and powerful feature in Kotlin. Kotlin provides us with a highly expressive API building blocks, like inline and reified. And when we go higher order, Kotlin really shines with its last parameter call syntax, allowing us to cut boilerplate and extend the language with lambdas. And that's all the features of Kotlin that I'm going to cover today. There's many more, and you can check out the documentation to learn them. Before we go to lunch, I'd like to take a look at what's new in Android and Kotlin. Dan covered all of this in the keynote, but in case you missed it, here's a recap. We published the Android Kotlin guides to GitHub to provide a reference for Android Kotlin style and interoperability with Java. With support library 27, we started to add nullability annotations to make the API friendlier in Kotlin. This will make it so that null checks are valid in Kotlin when you call into the support library. And we've built docs and samples around Kotlin, and we're continuing development in this area. And of course, you. There's more Android developers every day using Kotlin for work and for fun. The Kotlin open source community is still getting started, so now is a perfect time to jump in if you want to start a Kotlin project or work on an existing one. Thanks. Catch me after this at office hours to check out our Kotlin instructor-led training tomorrow if you want to learn more about Kotlin.
All right. I'm going to start in about a minute here, but I just wanted to say hi to everyone who's here. I know that uh, <laughs> I know that uh, you've. That, it's, that food is really tempting over there in the other half of the auditorium. So, uh, how many people here have actually played, um, downloaded the Android OSDK? Just give me a. All right, good. And, you know, we're in, and, and how, about, how about Support Library 27? All right, mostly hands. Good, good. I mean, to me, the Support Library is the most important thing we do. Um, Next to uh, you know maybe to, maybe uh, architecture components or Kotlin to the platform they're all they're all pretty important. So I'm going to go really quickly here. I'm first of all uh, uh, namaste to everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Galpin. I'm going to be giving a tour of the highlights of the latest platform and support library updates, and we have a lot to cover. So um, Android 8.1. How many people have downloaded an Android 8.1 image? It adds a lot of targeted enhancements for Oreo. Um, Android Go, for example. And we do, we do a bunch of things to make things work better on lower RAM devices, including the elimination of these two services, notification listener and condition provider. And we also have new 8.1 hardware feature constants, which allow you to target the distribution of your apps and APK splits to devices that have lower normal RAM. Um, of course, we have the new Neural Networks API, and this is going to work in tandem with TensorFlow Lite um, to, to, to distribute computation workload across on-device processors, including dedicated neural network hardware, graphics processing units, and digital signal processors. And if you don't have these things, you know, it'll actually execute them on the CPU. And again, you probably weren't going to use this directly because you'll, you'll instead use the Neural Networks API, um, things like with uh, TensorFlow Lite or Cafe2. So uh, we'll have a talk on TensorFlow Lite tomorrow. So if you want to learn all about that, come and listen to my colleagues. 8.1 also adds a shared memory API. And this is something we've actually wanted for a long time. We've had, sh we've had memory file. This actually is a way to share data. It enables the creation of an anonymous shared memory instance. You can mmap the shared memory object into a byte buffer. The memory protection can be controlled on the parsable shared object, which you can pass to another process through AIDL. And once you don't need access anymore, you just unmap the buffer. Um, what's really cool is we also support this through the NDK using a shared memory. So you can just mmap the FD that you get and then read and write. We have new APIs for wallpaper colors in 8.1. Um, you can use the wallpaper manager to get the most representative colors from the current wallpaper. The system UI and the pixel launcher will actually adjust the colors they use based on this API. Um, if you've made a live wallpaper, you actually notify this wallpaper service whenever your colors change significantly, and you return them in this on-compute color method. And I recommend using the utility functions within the wallpaper colors class to automatically select these from a representative bitmap or drawable. Picture in picture. How many people have played with picture in picture? Give me a show of hands. This is actually a really cool way to over overlay a critical task. You, know, you begin by telling Android your activity supports it. And then we enter picture-in-picture -picture mode um, with code like this. Um, we have some picture-in-picture -picture params here. We're actually setting the aspect ratio of the PIP window, which is useful if you want it to match video you're playing. Uh, while your app won't get touch events in PIP mode, if your app is using media session, you'll automatically get media controls, so use media session. But you can also create custom actions with icons. Um, you can display these provided material buttons to allow your users to manually enter PIP mode. But you can also automatically enter it by overriding on user leave hint, presumably only when your app is doing something really important, like a video chat or playing a movie or navigating. And returning from picture in picture um, is very simple. You, you get called back when your activity transitions and on picture in picture mode changed. And one thing you should know is that your activity is actually automatically moved to a new task when you enter PIP mode. So you lose the activity stack, so you might want to recreate it uh, when you're returning from PIP mode. If you're a single activity app, this is really simple. Um, of course, we support multi-display, which is cool. Um, they can now be launched by the app on secondary displays, and these have per-display-based configurations and resource management, um, which is awesome. So um, if, you it's a, if you support multi-window, make sure that this works correctly. Um, we also support longer screens. Obviously, our, with a lot of devices now that have extended aspect ratios. If you're targeting O, we assume you support it, unless you use these constants. Um, you can letterbox your app, but you know, why would you want to do that? Um, just make your app actually work properly with long screens. Um, of course, we have adaptive launcher icons. And we did this because OEMs were using their own launchers with custom icon shapes. Um, but Android shapes are random. So like in this example with the Chrome in the Play Store, they shrink the icon or put or use a different icon or use a random color shape. And it's really not very cool. 
So we do this, you have, we actually have these adaptive icons. Your app provides in two layers, a background and foreground layer. The OEM defines a, rec a rounded rectangle mass shape. The user will then see this. And a circular shape will look like this, everywhere in the system UI that uses launcher icons, such as in the settings app list, recents or overview title bar, and your shared sheet dialog. And to support wider ranges of icon sizes, we now recommend that apps contain an icon asset at least 72 dp in size. So it's important uh, if a third-party launcher wants to render icons in large size, it won't be super sampled. And again, the actual size of the foreground and background layer we want to update apps to is 108 dp. So you want to use them, we want to pad this with extra image around all four sides um, so we can do cool animations. So you can control your brand looks, which is great. Um, it's really important to please, please, please add adaptive icons. Um, you do this by using an adaptive icon drawable. We added this to Oreo. It supports a foreground and background tag. Um, you can actually do this if you don't want to waste space. You can actually use this new inset tag, um, which allows for fractional insets, which is pretty cool. So you, can, so you could use this magical 16.6. Um, you can pad your 72 dp launcher icon, and that reduces the amount of size increase you would have. Um, but again, in Android N, since you use this to target O only and above, um, you can actually use a vector image, um, uh, which can really, really help keep things small and make things work great everywhere. Um, Ta -da. So in, of, o, of course, has a bunch of changes to notifications. Again, in previous versions of Android, you can only, users can only block notifications. But in Android O, we introduced notification channels, named categories of notifications that share the same behavior so users can control them. They can click here to see all the categories. Clicking on a category reverse, reveals per category things like vibration and sound, et cetera. We also added dots in the launcher, which is kind of a low stress way to see if an app has notification. Long pressing the icon reveals the notification. Also, you notice we can install widgets this way, which is really cool. Um, so yeah, you know, all the things you use to customize per notification applies to the whole channel. So again, you can add all this stuff to your channel now. And so a bullet point slide, but it's a summary. So make sure to set up your channels with user happiness as your goal. Make sure they have the right defaults. And of course, make sure you, know, of course you can use notification compat to set the channel information. And if you're targeting Oreo, you absolutely need to have notification channels being used, because otherwise your, your uh, notifications won't show up. All right, so in, in Android 7.1, we added these nifty launcher shortcuts, and users can drag them and off and pitch them to the pin them to the launcher. And apps can request that a shortcut gets pinned, but there was no indication of the app that this worked, and it wasn't great for users or developers, and so it no longer works in O. Instead, we have a new way of doing it. Uh, it uses the same sh shortcut info as in Android 7.1, but it now asks the user whether to add the shortcut and where to place it, and the app can actually update the shortcut icon and intent later, which is pretty cool. Um, custom shortcuts were also in 7.1. It allows shortcuts to be added from the widget tray with an optional configuration screen. And the Oreo API is definitely an improvement there. You just register the custom shortcut activity with create shortcut intent filter. And in 7.1, the app will return the shortcut as an intent extra is directly in the activity return, but we now wrap all that functionality, which also allows the app to update the shortcut. Again, very, very cool. You can see we can use Compat to do all this. Um, and this has been a long time coming, but we actually have a way to sur surface app widgets in your app, which is awesome. Um, so now you can actually request it, that uh, have a button say, hey, install the widget. We've added autofill to Android. Um, this is really cool. Um, there's services as, as well as what you can do in an app. But in an app, um, obviously, standard views actually just kind of automatically work. But you can actually make it work better by providing hints. You can also mark fields that autofill auto should ignore. And in another helpful touch, API 27 version of the support library view compat now wraps the autofill methods. So yay. Um, one reason to have v27. Um, so you can request autofill like this um, you can, on demand. And you can use it to on completely custom views, such as ones you would draw with OpenGL or Vulkan or just with Canvas by providing an autofill virtual structure. No matter how you build your apps, please consider uh, integrating with autofill. It is really cool, and it does help give a nice warm welcome to a user if they're having to reinstall your app particularly. Another thing you can do is you can actually link it autofill with your website by using, using digital asset linking. So you can do this by creating this JSON file on your server. In this case, you just define you want to share login credentials with your website and your app. And then you modify your manifest. Uh, 
uh, which points to a JSON string resource that contains a list of web targets and permissions, like what you hosted on your website. And that's it. With these two, with these two steps, you actually share credentials between your app and your website. And this works for autofill, and it's the first step in implementing Smart Lock on previous version of Androids, which lets you automatically sign in your users. Um, but autofill is pretty cool. It works mostly automatically in O. Um, we also have things like strict mode improvements. This allows you to do things like uh, with set thread policy, we've added detection of unbuffered I.O., which is cool. And VM policy now will detect untagged sockets, as well as when content URI is sent that doesn't actually grant the calling app read or write permission, which would be kind of useless. Um, We've added seekable file descriptor, uh, descriptors from document providers, which is useful for large remote sources, such as big audio and video files. It's actually a really big improvement, so I'm excited about this one. We've also added proper support for caching. I mean, the quota can actually change how frequently the user interacts with your app and the amount used, while allocate actually takes deletable cache into account. So we actually manage this cache completely on the system for you, which is great. And there's tons of other stuff in O, a bunch of enhancements to accessibility, including the ability for users to actually add an accessibility button on devices that have soft navigation, paging and content providers, a bunch of great stuff to make the runtime faster, such as a concurrent copy and collector and big media changes. But let's turn our attention to the support library. And uh, one of the things you can note here is that uh, devices running SDK less than the, and 14 comprise less than 1% of Play Store active users. So we've updated the minimum SDK level. We've gotten rid of gingerbread and honeycomb. And the minimum SDK version is now 14. Um, this also matches what we've done in Google Play services. If you really need to support older versions, you can use an older version of the support library. And this gives us a bunch of benefits. It reduces our method count. And it also, um, we're also going to deprecate more that we're going to remove later. So um, you'll notice a bunch of deprecated APIs, um, such as viewcompat.setmitpivotx is now myview.setpivotx. So migrate away from these deprecated methods. Otherwise, you'll be surprised when you get the new version of the support library, and suddenly they're no longer there. Of course, we're using the Google Maven, Maven repository for the support library, with you, which you specify like this in Android Studio 3.0 and the 3.0 plugin. All right, one of the things that I've been waiting for forever is the support of custom fonts. And to do this in the old world, you'd have to load the typeface to the constructor and use the custom text view everywhere. So you'd have to build your own custom view just to, to support fonts. And this was no, no fun. So we have a new resource type for fonts. It accepts a single font as well as families. And they automatically get a resource ID. And you can even have families, which include a whole group of fonts that work together, like this one. Uh, and you can generate font families from individual fonts with weights and styles. And this one generates r.myfont.myfont. Excuse me. And this is super easy to use in XML because the text view font family attribute is reused. It can handle, again, it can handle families right here in the attribute. Um, it also supports uh, both attributes and styles, which is great. Um, and you can use this code via resources compat. So again, it's all in Android O, but most importantly, it's also in the support library for API 14 plus. Another good reason to move to the latest support library. Another cool thing is we have downloadable fonts because fonts are big. They bloat your apps, and now you don't have to bundle them in your app. You can just use the Google font provider to download them. Um, the font prefetcher provider fetches and serves fonts to your app, so you don't have to bundle them. This is really, really awesome. You get to, get to save space, make your apps smaller. Um, it's shared between apps, so this is great for the user as well. And again, this is, we have over 800 fonts in Google Fonts that are all supported. So this is, this is a pretty awesome thing. I highly recommend using it, um, especially if you know you're going to be targeting devices that have Google Play services. Um, so in code, your fonts are requested with a font request, you know, authority, package, query, inserts, and you get a callback for success or failure. Pretty straightforward here. And then you can just use, um, you can use fonts, contract, and pat. You control what thread it runs in. Just don't use the UI thread. It's also really easy to do this in XML. And um, so again, the, and the best part about this is we've totally integrated this into Android Studio. So you can search for a font. You can select it. And then you can actually see the pretty font right in your layout. It auto-generates the XML and the certs we need for our downloadable font, which is pretty darn cool. So, so check out the sample app, the Google Fonts docs, and the guide on DAC, developer.android.com for all the info. And once again, 
14 plus. Of course, we have the emoji compat library. This is really important. Apparently, it's a big political thing what emoji looks like, um, especially with hamburgers. Um, so it's time to, to rid of, get rid of this tofu in these empty boxes. And this allows us to make emoji show up properly on older versions of Android, because the support library always has access to a newer font. And it checks per glyph if it can be rendered, and it, and it replaces it with an emoji span if needed. And there are two ways to do this. You can do a download configuration similar to downloadable fonts. You end up making your font request, and you initialize in your application on create. Um, or you can just bundle it in your app. It's 7 megabytes. It's pretty big. Um, but this allows you to work well with devices that don't have Google Play services. And you configure it in a similar way. Um, you also have to use emoji text view instead of text view because we have to render those spans and emoji text edit instead of text edit. But now we have unicorns and tacos. Yay. Um, so set, check out the sample again here. And of course, this is API 19 plus. It does require KitKat. So sorry about that. Uh, and this is a feature that I've wanted in Android for so long. How many people have wanted text view auto sizing? Like, this is like, I, it's amazing. It's in the platform and the support library. Text actually resizes to fill in its container. Like, this is my favorite thing. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm kind of a font nerd, so I, I studied it when I was in school. Um, so you can use the auto, text size, uh, uniform, auto size text time uniform, very simple. Um, or you can get creative, and you can actually set, create a preset set of sizes. Uh, for an array of values or set a minimum or maximum font size with step. And then this is supported in API 14 plus. So I'm so happy we're going to see a whole bunch of apps that actually scale a lot better, I hope, now that this is something that we are actually supporting, again, both in O and the support library. Um, we've fixed vector drawables. Um, <laughs> so because this used to happen, your designer would create an icon, you deliver it, it imports correctly, and then it looks terrible on the device. This actually is not as bad as it might look. I, I'm sure how many people have had this happen with vector drawables where you've imported them? and they're, Yeah. Um, that's because they use these even odd fill rule. Um, there was a big to-do in the source code saying, fix this. And we, never, we, we didn't fix it until like Android N. So this defines how the renderer decides which region of the images are inside and which ones are outside. So we actually support this in, this, in the support library in, uh, in uh, API 14 plus. So this is, this is pretty cool. So now the same XML that you'd use on API 24 looks great. And this is really awesome. Um, another thing that's kind of cool is, is we're now supporting um, uh, path vector drawables as well um, for animation. So this is pretty slick. Um, um, so again, this is, you can do this to you know, turn your animals like this. Uh, this is done with Alex Lockwood's shapeshifter tool, which is awesome. So again, here's what's going on at the XML level. We start with our vector XML defining the starting image, extracted all the path data into string resources, since I'll be reusing them, the animation definitions. And then we, and then we have an object animator, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, so, this, so here are the path values that are important to morph from a buffalo to a hippo. It seems really, really easy because uh, you know, once you've actually spent all the work to create two vectors that have the same sets of points, um, it's actually really easy to do this in code. So it's pretty slick. Uh, and the other thing we can do is we can actually use the bundled XML format to actually put this all into one giant file, which is pretty awesome. So now, you, now instead of having to keep track of all these different files for a, for a single vector animation, you can do it all together like this. The resulting bundle then packages everything into one file, which is cool. And then you can just share it. Now I, do, now I have this cool morph. Um, we also backported support for path interpolation, which is pretty cool. So again, this is also from the platform's animated vector drawable. And all of this is also down to API 14. So you can do stuff like this, which combines path morphing and path interpolation. And this one's actually pretty complicated. Um, a simple example is just like this square, which you know we can give it an acceleration curve as it shrinks. It's defined as an interpolation path, uh, the same path format that we use for vector drawables. And here is our XML def definition for that. And we use, again, the same XML for API 14 that we use for API 26. Um, we do it as this curve that crops off quickly from one, snaps back a small amount, and slowly tapers off to zero. And then we have our morph animation, which is the same path morphing we just looked at. It starts from a square and goes down to a point. Um, and then we set this interpolator to be our path interpolator to keep things contained in a file. We can actually bundle this all together. So once again, think about using this bundling. It really does help if you're not reusing that somewhere else. And now we have this kind of cool stylized uh, shrinkage, which is kind of cool. It proceeds quickly and then slowly tapers down. Another thing we did is this transition support library. I don't know how many people have actually played with this transition support library out there? This is actually pretty cool. Um, so you have in APIs from Lollipop and above have transition types for path mo motion and propagation. And all of this is now available in transition XML. It's pretty easy. 
um, you do have to do this weird kind of no version transitions as an AAPT option. And after this, you can just use all the same transition XMLs that you use for platform transition APIs on API 14 and above. So this is pretty slick, actually. Um, highly recommend taking advantage of that. All right, now to get into a little bit of deeper stuff. How many people have played with physics-based animations? OK, this is pretty cool. My, my, my uh, friend Lisa actually wrote a lot of these slides for me. So if we look back at the material design motion spec, and this talks about real world forces. And again, ha uh, but until recently, you actually would have to do an approximation of these forces. And, and you know, uh, not a, it basically, so physics-based uh, animation actually allows basic Newtonian motion to be correctly simulated in the UX. And we have two different models that are supported by dynamic animation to make all of this easier, to actually make real motion happen in your app. And the first one, of course, is fling animation, which, start, which you start with an initial velocity, slow due, due to friction, and end gradually. And then you see every time the color changes in this, it's starting a new fling, which is cool. Here's pretty much the simplest one you can make. Ball is a view. Transition-Y is the property we're changing. Its velocity is pixels per second. Um, everything else is default. And that's really what you just saw there. Um, we can actually customize the friction. So the higher the friction, the less distance your view will travel for a given velocity. Um, we also have the spring animation type. And this exerts a force back to the end point of the string. And you could even get this nice bounce. And every time the color changes, that's a new spring animation. And again, here's the simplest spring you can make. Um, so ball is a view. Transition y is the property we're changing. And, and 0 is where it's going to stop. Its final transition is at equilibrium. Its velocity is pixels per second. And everything else is the defaults. However, you can actually uh, customize this by calling get spring on your animation, or in this case in Kotlin, by applying it uh, and, and uh, setting things like the damping ratio and the stiffness and the final position, which is also important. And damping is the ratio by which the size of your bounce is reduced over time. And then the result, the default here is medium bouncy. In general, the lower the number, the more oscillation you'll see, aka bouncing, before the force reaches equilibrium. At one, you'll get critical damping, which means no bounce. And at zero, you get no damping, which means infinite bounce. In general, please do not underdamp your views because this crazy bouncing is kind of like, uh, maybe I shouldn't use this. But actually, um, I, so I recommend not using too much of this. Um, stiffness is like the stiffness of a physical spring. For a given starting velocity, how far will it travel from the endpoint, and how fast will it be pulled back? And this example is no bounce, which honestly is generally something I prefer. You can see the stiffness better. And the lowest stiffness is on the left, and the highest is on the right. You can also create your own external spring force, and you can share this across multiple animations, which is cool. Um, one thing you might want to do with these is to allow user input. Uh, Velocity Tracker is one option. <laughs> it's, it's been in, they're in, around since API 1, and it really does uh, what it says, which is it tracks the user's velocity from a user's touch. Or if you only care what the end state of the fling is, you can actually use a gesture detector, um, because its fling callback actually has velocity that you can apply to the ball. So you'd use this in a touch listener. On the parent of the view you want to track, you call velocitytracker.obtain, and then you can feed in the user's touch events, starting with down and continuing with move. And then action up, you call compute current velocity, and it'll compute a nice velocity for you. And that velocity is going to come in two components, x and y. So then you'll start two dynamic animations at the same time, one for the x velocity and one for the y velocity. And they're going to run simultaneously. And this will give you a smoothly moving, interactive, two-dimensional animation. As you can see here, it works pretty well. Um, now just be careful flinging those balls, because when you lose one, they don't come back. And just like other animations you're familiar with, dynamic animations have end and update listeners, which is how you can chain them earlier, uh, how we were chaining them earlier. So let's chain these two fling animations. We're going to fling just as we did before, using the velocity from our drag listener and velocity tracker and create two at the same time, one for x and one for y. But then we're going to stop the first animation and create a new one in a different direction, giving the impression the ball is bounced, fixing our problem with the balls going off the screen. Um, this time, we'll add an update listener and an end listener to each of our flings. On each update, we'll check to see if the ball has slipped outside the bounds of its parents. Just checking the bounds here. Um, there's probably a better way to do this, but you know, if it, and if it did, we'll cancel the animation. Um, that means we'll get a callback to on animation end. If we canceled it, meaning it hit the edge, then fling it back. As you can see, I made an extension function on view because I was really tired of typing. And we'll use the velocity passed here, which is the remaining velocity in the opposite direction. Check out the minus sign. Of course, it's not exactly this simple. Now, this flings the ball straight back at you because it reverses both the velocities, x and y. 
what we really want is a natural reflection. What we want is the ball to only reverse the velocity on one axis. <clears throat> on the other, it's going to keep traveling in that direction. And that gives you that 90 degree bounce angle. So it looks like this. If it's the horizontal edge, reverse x, otherwise reverse y. And it works for different animations. Ever seen something like this? There's an app that keeps trying to do this on my home screen. It's sort of a sticky effect where you fling it to the edge and it sticks there and absorbs the extra momentum with the spring bounce. It's going to look something like this. The thing to note here is that we're using the ball's current transla translation value as the end value for the spring. So go ahead and oscillate using the remaining velocity, but then reach, reach equilibrium exactly where you are. There's a really cool demo in the Google I.O. talk of three balls connected with springs. I won't explain this here because they really did a great job in that talk. Um, but here's a real layout using the same effect. And it's inspired by a screen of the Plaid app by my colleague Nick, Nick Butcher, where as part of the screen transition, several on-screen components translate up subtly one after another. In, in that effect, the distance traveled, the delay of each element, and the interpolation used to simulate acceleration and deceleration are, are all hard-coded. In this effect, it's all done with the same chain string we just saw with the balls, which is pretty cool. So what's actually going on here? These two screens actually have almost the same effect. Obviously, the top ball is the lead, and the other two balls follow each other. The lead view in the chain is the headline and icons. The paragraphs below it are following it, and the fab is following the paragraphs. Instead of a touch listener, we started with a spring animation on the headline. The thing to notice here is instead of giving it a velocity, we give it a start value. Basically, we say, pull this spring back this far and start it there. And we gave it an update listener, which we've seen before. And then we made a spring animation to the paragraphs, the same thing. And the listener, for uh, getting callbacks from the headline, we call animate to final position on the paragraph animation. So it's going to do two things. One is it sets the new final position of the paragraph spring to the current position of the headline animation. And it starts the paragraph animation, if it hasn't yet. And finally, we do the same thing for the floating action button. We set an update listener on the paragraphs and chain a spring animation to that. And that's how chaining works. Now, the difference here is what we're doing before with flings is that those animations were subsequent, one after another, and these are actually happening simultaneously. And you might notice that uh, we also used a spring on the alphas of the views and on the scale of the floating action button. So what else can you animate? Well, a lot of built-in properties. Certainly everything you know, can think of springing or flinging off the top of my head. Alpha, transli translation, rotation, scroll, scale, x, y, and z, which are absolute positions, including translation. If you want to animate something even crazier or just make a custom property that groups a couple of these, for example, if you want to scale an object's x and y proportionally together, which I hope you usually do, you just make an instance of float property compat. You also need to set the minimum visible change so the animation knows when to stop so it doesn't go on animating millions of a bit or whatever your property is because it doesn't know. Uh, you can also restart every dynamic animation at a particular start value, and you can also give them a minimum and maximum. And this is worth a shot out. Cancel, oh, sorry, <laughs> cancel your animations. If your user quits while they're running, your app will crash. Keep a reference to them and call them in on destroy if you need to. And again, these APIs are in the support library. Like everything else we've talked about pretty much, it's available from, um, uh, in this case, from Jellybean and above. So not 14, but 16. And I'm sure you're not all got it, but if you didn't, all of the code for this is in Lisa's GitHub. So um, my hat's off to Lisa for doing an amazing job of putting these together. And again, what's, what, I, what I wanted to, 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 to get to you guys, you got to understand is that these physics-based animations are not toys or just for games, and they're way more than bouncing balls. They're a great way to, wing, to bring natural motion and interaction to your current UI. So try thinking about what you're doing already manually that could be easier and more realistic with a dynamic animation. So, and certainly I look forward to seeing what you, what you make. And uh, so that's it. Uh, I hope that this was a wonderful overview for you of a little bit of what we have in the support library and Android O. And enjoy the rest of your day here at GDD India. Thank you.
<laughs> Hi. <laughs> I'm Megan Carney. I manage a team of technical writers who help developers build for the web. I'm also a mom. I have two kids. Their names are Amelia and Patrick. And for the past few years, I've been an engineering student learning to build my own web applications. One of those web applications called Village Assistant is the topic of this talk today. And this is Crystal Lambert. She couldn't be here in person today, but I wanted to make sure to at least virtually introduce you to her. Together, we spent many, many long hours building Village Assistant as our final project in a full stack engineering course at UC Berkeley. So when I talk to people about building Village Assistant, one of the main questions that people ask is, why would you choose Google Assistant? Like, why not just build all of your logic inside a web application? And the answer to that question is um, basically a very personal story. I live in San Francisco. And like many San Franciscans, I wasn't born there. And my family is pretty far away. So my close circle of friends are much more than my friends. Uh, my kids call them our family. A year and a bit ago, one of our family members died of cancer. Sorry to bum you out, but this is really important to a village assistant. And he left behind his wife and three small kids. So I really wanted to help my friend, but I had no idea how best to do that. So I went and I created a Google group for our circle of friends. And the idea was our friend could contact the group and get whatever help she needed. So a little bit about my friend. Um, she's a lot more capable than I am. She's more organized. She's a lot more relaxed with her kids. I scream at mine all the time. And she's the one who usually helps us. And it's a really strange thing to be someone who's strong and capable, and all of a sudden, you need help. So a couple of weeks after she was trying out the Google Grill, and we were having dinner together, and the kids were going crazy in the background, I asked her if it was any use to her, you know, if, if the group was helpful. And she said, I tried the group situation a few times, but I have to be honest, it's a, a kind of a bit more work than it's worth. And she walked me through this example, which, which I found really interesting. So around the kid's bedtime, she went to the refrigerator to get some milk. And she realized she didn't have any milk. And so she reached out to the group to see if anybody could get her some milk. And she kind of experienced this weird, anxious feeling, just waiting for anyone in that group to respond. But she was worried about not having milk the next day when the kids got up for breakfast. But she also then got this flood of people like saying, I can get you milk, I can get you milk, I can get you milk. And so she found herself having to coordinate with people so she didn't wind up with five, 10 gallons of milk the next day. So the other thing that was really tough, she told me, was people who couldn't get her milk still contacted her, wanted to know how she was feeling, wanted to arrange some other need to be met in the future. So reaching out to the Google group for something as simple as milk turned into something far more complicated and unrelated to the direct need. So after the conversation with my friend, I spent a long time thinking about how we've grown accustomed to communicating with each other in social circles. And we're really comfortable exchanging good and goods and services with strangers. We get in cars with anybody, and they drive us around. And we're cool with posting pictures of our family, liking other friends' and family's postings. We're able to now raise funds for causes through crowdsourcing. But it's still really awkward to make specific requests, especially to people who we know and care about. So I found this quote by Marshall McLuhan, um, who came up with the term global village. And Marshall spoke a lot about how technology advancements would vastly expand the global village, but also would flatten it and kind of diffuse the whole essence of what it means to be part of a small community. 
So when I started working on Village Assistant, one of the things I really wanted to do was to give the user the ability to ask for help with any specific need they'd have to, to kind of smaller, targeted communities. And I also wanted to soften that awkwardness that comes with asking for help. And Google Assistant provides a filter between users and their communities. So a user can make a specific request to a chosen group, and Assistant coordinates the requests and responses. Using push notifications, users can decide to help or not without having to engage in lengthy conversations outside the scope of the direct call to action. So here's where the app gets interesting. Village Assistant is both a Google Assistant app and a progressive web app. It's built using React and a host of Firebase products. And as you know, the more frameworks and platforms that you bring together, the more interesting your app can be, but it's also exponentially challenging to get all of the pieces to work nicely together. So much pain. Um, today, tomorrow, there's talks on Google Assistant, on Firebase, on progressive web apps. What's kind of interesting about looking at these products in relation to an app like Village Assistant is you get to see how they all work together. So Google Assistant allows users to have a conversation with Google in order to get things done. And actions on Google let developers like me extend Google Assistant so that users can have a conversation with Google about your own app. So in my situation, a users can connect to Village Assistant from Google Assistant by asking to talk to Harold. And he's this persona that Crystal and I created. So we had someone that we felt like we were talking to. We built a web hook from our Assistant app to the server side of our progressive web app. So as user has a conversation with Assistant, the web hook sends requests and responses to and from the Assistant app and the server. And our server is built with Firebase functions. In addition to Firebase functions, Village Assistant also uses Firebase hosting, authentication, cloud messaging, cloud Firestore, and real-time database. So two of my favorite things about Firebase are that I feel like they have really excellent documentation. So for someone like me who's learning, it's really easy to get up and running fast with new products. But I also really came to love the fact that Firebase has one console where you can manage all the products that you're using. So when I was debugging with Village Assistant, I could watch my data, I could check my service logs, I could check on hosting and deployment, and I could do it all from the same place. So one key requirement for Phil Village Assistant is to create direct, active, and easy engagement between users in the villages. So I decided very early on that push notifications would be the best way for users to stay active and engaged with one another. So when a user goes to the Village Assistant Progressive app, Web App, all they do is log in and receive a token. And then they can create or join villages. And the token gets added to the village. And then our service worker in the Progressive Web App handles the data from our server, sends the push to the tokens in the village, and then continues to listen for push events so it can let the Google Assistant user know who's able to help or not. So <laughs> I'm now going to attempt something incredibly brave. I'm going to do a live demo. Um, the Wi-Fi is holding up OK. Um, Google Assistant seems to be behaving. But if for any reason the and kind of work out, I also have videos and slides, and I'll walk, walk you through them. And I'm really hoping this works. So the first thing you want to notice is this isn't the first time I've been to this page. And you can see here that Chrome is saying, hey, do you want to add uh, Village Assistant to your home screen? I'm actually not going to do that, because I just don't want to mess with any kind of OAuth issues. But I could do that and then relaunch, and it would work fine. So at this point, I'm actually going to log in. Ooh, sorry. 
And after I log in, I'm going to hopefully get a message that asks me if I'll allow notifications. And I'll allow them. And then I'm going to go ahead. I created villages earlier just so if anything went wrong, it would, would be a bit smoother. So I'm just going to go in and view some of the villages that are there. I'm going to join them. And everything seems OK. So the UI for the Progressive Web App is really just more of a demo UI because in the future, I want to move most of this functionality into Google Assistant. So you can actually control your villages. You can invite users. You can uh, add yourself to a village straight from the conversation. OK, so now we're going to try and talk to Harold. So let's see what happens. OK, Google, talk to Village Herald. All right, let's get the test version of Village Herald. Hello, Herald here. Would you like to get help or check on responses for previous needs? OK, Google, get help. Great, let's get you help. What do you need? OK, Google, I need milk. Select best village for your need. You selected home. So now, hopefully, we will see a push notification. <laughs> oh, there it is. Now we're going to say, yes, I can totally help. And I'm going to add a message and say, I can't. I'm typing really slow here because I'm super nervous. And it's not easy to type when your hands are shaking. OK, here we go. All right, so that's part two. Now we're coming on to the final part of the demo. Please work. <laughs> OK, Google, talk to Village Herald. All right, getting the test version of Village Herald. Hello, Herald here. Would you like to get help or check on responses for previous needs? OK, Google, check on responses. We need to retrieve your active needs. Sound good? OK, Google, sounds good. Select need for updates. Here's an update on getting help with milk. You can see here that it's recording the number of possible responses, who said yes, who said no. Now we're going to click the chat. And you can see a message from only the person who said they could help. Ah. I do. I actually really like almond milk. All right. And that's it. That's the end-to-end -end workflow for Village Assistant. <laughs> I know, I feel the same way. <laughs> um, so the really cool thing is the next few slides, we don't really have to look at them because the demo worked. Woo um, but it's nice to have these slides. Um, assuming you can go back and look at this um, in the future, and you can kind of get a better sense of how things are working. Um, and the other cool thing is I link to um, the site. So if you want to play around with it yourself, you're more than welcome to. So OK, let's move through. And so now I'm going to take a little bit of a deeper dive into some of the implementation specifics, starting with Google Assistant. One of the most interesting parts of working with Google Assistant has been learning to code human conversation. And it's kind of like learning how to talk to your kids. Um, does anyone here have kids? All right, OK, you'll get this then. So I have a daughter, and she loves to talk. And since she was very young, we would have these really cool, engaging conversations back and forth. And I learned to ask her lots and lots of open-ended questions. 
So, for example, in the morning, I would say to Amelia, I'd say, hey, Amelia, what do you want for breakfast? And she'd have some spontaneity each morning. My son, on the other hand, he needs his, he wants to have his needs met immediately. That's it. That is the bottom line for him. So, when I ask my son what he wants for breakfast, and he says chocolate, he doesn't like when I tell him that he can't have chocolate. And so I learned when I'm talking to my son, instead of asking him, hey, Patrick, what do you want for breakfast? I ask him what he wants for breakfast based on a set of choices that I've already checked are available. So my first attempt at conversation assistant was kind of like asking, hey, what do you want for breakfast? But the more I code a conversation, the more I realize the value of giving users choice and then directing the flow of conversation based on their selection. So we use dialogue flow to build our conversation. And one of the trickiest bits to building the conversation was, con was figuring this flow out. And the thing is, I didn't discover context parameters until later in my learning. And these were exactly what I needed. So at the end of the talk, I provide links to the context docs and to the facts app sample. And these are incredibly useful things I wish I found in the beginning. So if you want to play around with Assistant, try these out. They show you how to have choice in your conversations. And they also show you how you can actually direct the flow with context parameters. So another aspect of building an Assistant app that took a while to get used to was figuring out the interaction between Google Assistant and our server code. So if you start playing around with functions and Google Assistant, you will notice fairly quickly that Google Assistant sends a lot of logs to the server. Like, I mean a lot of logs. And it takes a while to get used to parsing the useful information from those logs. But the other thing that's kind of interesting is if you're writing your own console off server code and you go to kind of find out what, they, what they're returning, you'll find yourself scrolling down the pages trying to find them. And you get really good at it, but it takes some practice. So lastly, this is the final bit. Um, if you haven't worked a lot with OAuth and account linking, I mean, even if you have worked with OAuth and account linking, prepare to spend a lot of time figuring out how to link all your accounts together. OAuth is hard. And one thing I know about Google is it takes security very, very seriously. So you're going to have to use tokens. Like, you, you can't, there's no other solution. You need to know how to pass your tokens. And you're also going to have to figure out smart ways to link users in different parts of your end-to-end -end workflow together. So uh, in all honesty, I had to get help from an assistant engineer to figure out how to parse the tokens. And I'm really grateful to have that help. And I just want to say shout out, thanks very much, Shi Yang, for that help. After this talk and some rest, I'd really like to spend some time diving into the, the JWT token exchange and properly understand it. OK, so um, now we're going to talk a little bit about building progressive web apps. And hopefully, most of you have had a chance to attend the talk on progressive web apps today. So you know about service workers. You know about caching resources offline. And I'm not going to repeat that talk. But I think there's a few things worth calling attention to. Um, first, don't wait to use Lighthouse. Like, don't go and build your app and build your app and then be like, oh, cool, I'll try the Lighthouse tool. Um, it's really much better to run Lighthouse early on. And, and if you haven't heard about Lighthouse yet, it's a tool that you run on your site and it tells you a bunch of stuff in your app that you're already doing well. And then it also tells you about stuff, really specific stuff that you can do to make your app progressively better. There's a Lighthouse talk today. You should totally go and see that. And the one thing I would say about the Lighthouse results, one thing you'll notice really quickly, it's really easy to fix the, the progressive web app errors. Um, the harder errors to fix are performance, yeah? So I linked to a blog post um, at the end of this talk, which gives you a pretty good get started on how to roll with Lighthouse and, and debug your progressive web app. And I'm hoping it'll help. So I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that we built our client with React. And Crystal handled most of the React code, and she smartly chose to render our component server-side using the Create React app. 
So we didn't have as many performance impacts. But up until this week, we hadn't quite worked out how to cache the static resources that are minified in our build. And then last week, I decided, oh, I'll just try this out. I'll upgrade the latest version of Create React app. I'll run my build. And like all of a sudden, it was like, oh my gosh, my service worker was completely created for me. And all my static resources that are minified were just like in, inside the service worker properly cached. And so it turns out that um, one of my coworkers, Jeffrey Posnick, went and added Workbox straight to the Create React app. So you don't even have to do anything. You just run your build. And it does most of the offline support for you. So I will say this. Like, you don't have to use a Create React app. You don't have to build with React. But you really should use Workbox so that you don't have to like, wrap your head around like, all the promise chains and everything else with offline caching. Ta-da! <laughs> That's my Lighthouse score. Woohoo! <laughs> um, it's not perfect. There's a lot more that we can do, but it's, it's not bad. Um, true story, up until um, kind of very early in the morning yesterday, my performance score was more than 20 points lower than that. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what it was, but it was a lot lower. And that's because our app uses materialized CSS which previously had a mandatory jQuery dependency. And we were using it to um, activate our drop-down menu. So I'm happy to say that literally two weeks ago, um, Materialized CSS released a beta version, which removes the jQuery dependency. And they try to clean up a lot of bloat so that when you were using Materialized CSS, things would move a lot faster. Um, so I went yesterday and implemented a React function. And woohoo, the score went up. So I'm kind of happy about that. The new materialized CSS library also has SAS support. So now I can basically render all my CSS server side, and that'll make the score go even higher. So developers love to save time. And that often means using libraries so we don't have to write all the code. But linking to libraries in a website seriously affects performance. And I think users, I think it's fair to say, me trying to test my demo today in really bad Wi-Fi, like we are, we're very impatient with waiting for things to load. And I think as, as, as technology gets better, users are only going to go to sites that load fast or fast enough in the, in, in the environment that they're in. So many developers who are building libraries are, are genuinely doing their best to help make it possible to render or take care of most of the heavy lifting server side. They're trying to remove as much bloat as possible. Like They're really trying to make it so their library isn't going to basically hammer your first page load. But I think we have a responsibility, too. I think we have to think about our users and make sure they're getting the information that they want as fast as possible. So there's a balance here. Now, Firebase products. Um, I mentioned a couple times that I really love Firebase. I do. I really love Firebase. Um, but I want to briefly cover a couple of challenges we had with Firebase. There, there aren't many, but there are a couple. So there's a subtle difference between Firebase notifications and how web push notifications are structured. And we wanted to create the custom actions inside our notifications so users could click on them and we could record the responses. And since we're using a progressive web app, all our push is handled by the service worker. But the Firebase notification API doesn't include an actions parameter. So we had to pass in our actions as strings of data and then parse the data in a recognizable way for the service worker. It's, it's a little tricky to get used to. So Matt Gaunt and I documented how it all came together on Stack Overflow, and I'll also include a link to that um, at the end of the talk. So Firebase functions work great with Google Assistant apps, but <laughs> you got to remember to check your quotas. Um, you'll notice when you're watching your function logs that there's so many logs coming in from Google Assistant. And if you're doing your own console logs as well, and as your server starts to get more and more complicated, you'll start to notice that your logs just stop coming in. 
You know, you, you can't see anything. Um, and this happened to us, and we had no idea what was going on. We're like, what is the bug that we introduced? And it turned out we had reached quota. So I upgraded to a higher version of Firebase, and all was well. But I just think it's a really good thing to start paying attention to if you're going to use functions with Google Assistant. So finally, the last thing about Firebase products, we first created Village Assistant, there wasn't the Cloud Firestore, just the real-time database. And th the database worked well for the most part, um, but it was really tricky to query data. It's really hard to have nested data in the Firebase real-time database. But the new Cloud Firestore removes this trickiness. So if you have a Firebase real-time database, and you're kind of nervous about moving over to a uh, Firestore, I can honestly tell you, you can do it incrementally. We managed to do this in a couple of days by like, just looking at each of the data exchanges one at a time, keeping the database, real-time database logic in place while we changed over to Firestore, and, and it worked OK. So we're getting close to the end of the talk. And I just wanted to leave you with a couple to-do lists. I love to-do lists. Um, and the first one is my to-do list. Um, the, uh, basically, I've put a link here to what I would call a pretty experimental version of our code. A lot of the stuff we're using in Village Assistant is beta. <laughs> like it's Google Assistant, Functions, Firestore. All these things are really, really young. Yeah. So eventually, I do want to move that code to a more official GitHub repo, um, Google GitHub repo. And when it moves, I'll make sure to put in the link. But I want to kind of mention some of the key issues that I know are there. So when you're looking at the code, and you're like, oh my god, this is terrible. <laughs> um, so first, the way in which we match villages to a user, is, it, it's just not that pretty. And I know there's a much better way to do this. Now, ideally, I would like the user to enter in something like a village name, and we would do a kind of clever matching to find the closest fits. And in like the super future, way down the line, oh my gosh, this app is actually a real thing, I'd love to get some clever logic in identifying the best villages, like which users in that village are actually close or inside a store to get you milk. You know, but that's that's like pretty far away. Um, so the other thing um, that's kind of a bit wonky, you probably noticed in the demo, is the UI where you create and join villages. Um, and so I, when I originally envisioned like doing kind of the, the village creation and the, the invite of users to your village. I wanted it to be inside Google Assistant, because I, I didn't want to feel like I just wanted the push to be the main UI for the Progressive Web App. Um, but it turned out that there's, there's some security limitations in doing that right now. And I think eventually the Assistant platform will evolve, and that's something I really want to implement. But I will clean up the PWA UI and at least add some functionality so you can invite users to your village. And finally, I want to do like the usual cool, fun stuff. I want to make my response times faster. I want to make the web hook faster. And I also want to create a pretty simple test suite um, and clean up my code. I, I, one of the things I think it's very worth mentioning when you start to build apps that bring all these products together, creating test suites are, are pretty challenging, like real test suites. I mean, you can write a test suite for things in isolation. But if you really want to start to test how they all come together, there's a, there's a lot of complexity in that. So that is something that I want to take on board. And now, this is your to-do list, should you take on the challenge. Um, you know, For sure, start by creating a PWA and host it with Firebase. It's very easy. I wrote a blog post that claims you can do it in five minutes or less. It, it might take you a little longer, but it's pretty fast. Make sure you run Lighthouse to test and tweak your progressive web app. And then learn to build conversations with choices. There's the link that I mentioned before to Context and the Facts app. You want to create a webhook and Firebase functions, kind of learn how to get that dialogue going on between your PWA and your assistant app. And then the final one, which is really cool, is to add push to your Firebase PWA. I linked to probably the best Get Started video out there on push, and also the Stack Overflow discussion that Matt and I had. Um, in general, like, 
push notifications are pretty straightforward. You do get used to it once you know that you have to kind of pass in the string and parse it. But it's worth kind of exploring and playing around with it. And that's it. So thanks very much.
Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shailen Tuli. I am a developer programs engineer at Google. And I will be talking to you about writing battery efficient Android apps that use location. So uh, location-based apps are absolutely everywhere. Transportation apps, geo apps, navigation apps, fitness apps, weather apps, even dating apps all use location. Uh, and yet, we have this sad spectacle that all too often users simply turn off location on their devices, which means a lot of these apps either don't work at all or they work in a degraded manner. And why do users do this? Because fairly or not, they associate location with battery drain, and they think turning off location is going to help preserve battery. So this is bad for developers who write all these great apps. It's bad for Android as an ecosystem. And of course, it's terrible for users. So location is used a lot. We know that. And the location APIs currently allow application developers to request location at virtually any time and make pretty aggressive location requests with no barriers. And when your app is in the foreground, when you have an activity you can see, uh, and it's going to be only a short time, it kind of doesn't matter too much what you're doing. But when you go off in the background, well, that's another story completely. Uh, background location has been identified by us as a major contributor to battery drain and power issues. And aggressive use of background location is a major reason why people disable location on their devices. So uh, in a response to this, and this has been a persistent problem for many years now, in a response to this, uh, the Android team, uh, starting with Android O, put in place some fairly substantial limits on the gathering of background location. Uh, basically, the sort of TLDR is uh, that apps that are running on O devices have background location gathering throttled. So it's basically location is made available a few times an hour, and that's it. Um, and this applies to everything running on O devices, regardless of the target SDK version. Uh, and towards the end of the talk, I'll try to get into sort of the nitty gritties of what this, is, this really means. Um, but for now, that's basically it. You just cannot go crazy in the background and do whatever you want. There are some limits in place. Now, what about pre-O? The majority of devices that are out there in the world are running Android N or lower. Uh, what about those devices? Um, and for the foreseeable future, that is going to be the case. This talk is fundamentally about identifying best practices that you can use now in your Android apps when you write for, when you use location, so that you're writing your apps in a battery efficient manner. All right, so let's, let's dive into this. Um, I'm going to start off um, this exploration by talking about uh, location APIs. Um, after that, we'll talk a little bit about sort of what is the exact relationship between location and battery drain, uh, battery loss. Um, and then I'll sort of dive into um, common use cases that every developer has to address when they're writing location apps and see if we can come up with some best practices that you can all use in your apps. Um, and we'll sort of end with um, a discussion of uh, the limits that have been put in Android O. Uh, uh, and we'll get into some details on that. OK, so um, for historical reasons, there are two ways in which you can get location uh, when using Android apps. There's framework location, and there is fused location. So framework location is the older one. It's been there since the beginning. And it's basically android.location.locationmanager. And that gives you uh, kind of a wide API surface whereby you, as app developers, can decide, hey, I want to use GPS. I want to use Wi-Fi. I want to use Excel. I want to use some sensor. Um, and you can essentially get location as you see fit. This type of location is not optimized for battery. And we discourage you to using this. What we would like you to use instead is Fuse Location Provider. Uh, so this is available through GMS Core. Uh, so instead of Android.location, you have Android.GMS.location. And Fuse Location Provider provides actually a much narrower API surface. Uh, and it sits on top of platform components and hardware components. 
Uh, and the way this works is you tell Fuse Location Provider what kind of location you want. Course location, find location, how frequently you want it, et cetera, et cetera. And it sort of just figures out what underlying technologies to do, to use, and how to do this in the most battery efficient way. This location provider is highly optimized for battery, uh, and we would like you to use this. So, um, what is Fuse Location? So there's a bunch of inputs that go into Fuse Location. I'll take a couple of minutes and talk about those. There's GPS, Wi-Fi, cell, accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer, and, and a host of others, but these are the big ones. And I want to talk about a few of these purely in terms of what uh, they mean for battery uh, usage. So start with GPS. GPS works great outside. It has some trouble with cities, with tall buildings, but in clear skies, it works fantastically. Super accurate location. It's also really, really terrible for battery. So that's your trade-off. Fantastic location, great accuracy, and really bad for battery. Then you've got Wi-Fi. And the coverage for Wi-Fi, as you can imagine, is mostly indoors. Um, the accuracy is pretty good. You can tell using just Wi-Fi where a person is in a building and what floor they're on. Uh, and the power consumption is not as bad as it, as it is for GPS, but Wi-Fi scans are still fairly expensive. So it's not free, it does cost something. And then there's cell. Uh, of course, this is available indoors and outdoors. It's available almost everywhere. Uh, the accuracy, unfortunately, with cell is not so great. You're not going to get a location which is accurate to within a few feet. You're going to get location which is accurate to sort of a neighborhood level or a city block, et cetera. Uh, but it's great for power consumption. It basically uses very, very little power, so it's fantastic for that. Uh, and then you have these sensors, which play an extremely important role in making fuse location provider do the right thing, uh, and do the right thing for battery. So you have accelerometer, which measures changes in velocity and changes in position. You have the gyroscope, which measures changes in orientation of your device. And you have the magnetometer, which allows your device to be used as a compass. And this kind of varies a little bit by hardware, but by and large, most of these sensors have very, very little battery cost. And Fuse Location Provider will use these sensors in conjunction with GPS, Wi-Fi, et cetera, to give you really, really good location as best as it can with very minimal battery usage. So for instance, if you were to request find location, location that is accurate to within a few feet, a few meters, you would use, Fuse Location would use GPS uh, and Wi-Fi. Uh, but GPS and Wi-Fi, while they work very well, work much better when you combine them with sensors. So for instance, I mentioned GPS is a little bit jumpy when you are in environments with tall buildings. So imagine Hong Kong, Mumbai, New York City, um, where I live, San Francisco. Uh, there's a, those are challenging environments for GPS. So when GPS gets a little flaky, Fuse Location, instead of making expensive GPS scans, will say, oh, let me see what the sensor data tells me. What is the accelerometer telling me about what the device is doing? And it sort of pieces together a pretty good sense of what it is that's happening. Same with Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi can be a bit jumpy. When it gets jumpy, Fuse Location Provider will not do excessive Wi-Fi scans. Instead, it will start looking at the sensor data and try to get a good sense of what the device might be doing. Indoor maps sort of work like that. Uh, you know, there was a time when uh, Google Maps would give you, uh, if you went to a shopping mall, it would say, hey, you're in this shopping mall. Now it's much better. Now it says, you're in this shopping mall, and you're right here in this shopping mall on the third floor. Right? It'll do things like that. And a lot of that is driven by sensors. I mean, it was, if, if location was, had to be pulled constantly, if the Wi-Fi scans had to be constantly done, that would be terrible for battery. But it doesn't have to do that, because once it gets a Wi-Fi fix, it can then look at the sensor data and figure out in a battery-efficient way what to do and where you are. Are you turning? Are you moving, et cetera? So that's, that's basically what it is. So the, sort of the summary of this is, where possible, uh, uh, given a choice between framework location and fuse location, you should always use fuse location. This is our uh, recommendation. 
Switching to Fuse location, if you are currently using framework location in your apps, is probably the single best thing you can do in terms of battery performance of your apps when it comes to location. So please do this. Okay. So that's where uh, APIs are in terms of location gathering. There's one higher level API that is exposed. Uh, that's a geofencing API. And that should be uh, sort of an important uh, tool for anyone building location apps. So what is geofencing? Geofencing is a case where you can take, um, you can define a circular region somewhere. And you can say, hey, whenever the device either enters this region or leaves this region or sits in this region for a certain number of uh, hours, um, do something. Let me know. Uh, and that's basically how geofencing works. Geofencing is built on top of fuse location, and it is highly optimized for battery. So the, basically, the way it works is the API, uh, the, it monitors device proximity to a geofence. The closer you are to the geofence, the more expensive it is. Um, and it basically figures out uh, what is your speed? Are you in a car? Are you walking? How far are you from the geofence? And it sort of optimizes for battery in terms of monitoring the geofence in the background. We'll talk more about geofencing later on. All right. So we've talked a little bit about APIs, and I've given you a little introduction to Fuse Location Provider. Um, now I'm going to talk about sort of what is, the what is the relationship between battery drain and location in sort of a concrete way. I mentioned that with Fuse Location Provider, you have to essentially just tell Fuse Location Provider what you want. You make a location request, and it sort of does the right thing, and it does the right thing in a battery efficient way. So essentially, what this section is going to be in my talk is going to be about what is a good location request. How do you tell Fuse Location Provider what it should do? So I would say battery can be measured on three points. Um, the discussion can be anchored on these three points. Accuracy, frequency, and latency. And I'll talk about all of these in quite, quite a lot of detail. So accuracy is, of course, how accurate is your location? How fine do you want it to be? Uh, and so way, the way this works is that uh, you can take the location request object that you create and define a priority. And there's a bunch of priorities that you can choose from. And depending on what you choose, Fuse Location will use different technologies under the hood and give you what you want. So the most accurate, you know, the state of the art is priority high accuracy. So this will use GPS if it's available. And every time there is a trade-off between accuracy and battery, battery will lose and accuracy will win. It's going to give you the most accurate location it knows how to do. This is a good kind of a uh, use case for foreground. When you have short-lived um, activity that's in the foreground or something, um, this is a terrible idea for background because it's going to be very prohibitively expensive in terms of battery. Related to that is another option, which is priority balanced power accuracy. This will very rarely use GPS when it has GPS batching, but mostly it will not and it will rely on Wi-Fi. So it's somewhat less accurate, but it's actually much better in terms of battery. And I would recommend for you, if you're writing location apps, consider this as something of a default. It does give you pretty good location without burning out your battery. Uh, the next level down is priority low power. And this is going to be hitting cell network. It's not going to be using a lot of Wi-Fi. It, it will not use GPS. And this will give you coarse location. So you're going to not be able to say, oh, I'm a few feet here, I'm a few feet there. But you will be able to say, I am in this part of Bangalore versus that part of Bangalore. Um, so depending on your use case, this may be all you need, in which case you should never request more expensive location updates than this. And the most interesting of all is the priority no power, which is saying, give me location updates, but do not spend any power. So how does this bit of magic work? In this case, what you're saying to Fuse Location Provider is, don't calculate any location for me. But if another app running on this device is computing location, let me know those results. So that's what priority no power means. And it's actually an incredibly good tool to have if you're writing location apps, because it doesn't cost your app anything. 
So that's where accuracy is. Okay, let's talk about frequency now. Again, it's fairly simple to understand what this means. The more frequent your updates, your location consumption, the more expensive it is for battery, but it's actually kind of a little bit more than that. So frequency is used, is defined by an, a method called set interval. And whatever value you pass to set interval, location services is going to try to honor that value. If you say, give me location updates every two minutes, it's going to try to do that. If you say, give me updates every 15 seconds, it will try to do that. Generally speaking, apps should pass the largest possible value when using set interval, especially background apps. Using intervals of a few seconds, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, is really something you should reserve for foreground use cases. Uh, location services will sort of just do what you ask it to do. It's up to you to choose wisely. Um, now, if you say location updates, a set interval for two minutes, there is a little sort of a caveat there, which is that's just a suggestion. Your location updates may be a little slower or a little faster. And the way they can happen a little faster is if another app is requesting location at a faster rate, that will be brought to your app as well, because these, this location data is shared between apps. So for that reason, we have another method that we could call when building our location requests, which is set fastest interval. So what you're saying is, uh, set interval says, give me location this many seconds or minutes. Set fastest interval says, give me location, even if it's coming from another app, no faster than what I'm specifying here. So here's, here's a little example. So you create a location request object, and you set its interval to be five minutes. Um, so at this point, every five minutes, your app is going to have location computed for it. Uh, but if you also set a fastest interval, which is in this case one minute, any app running out there that is requesting location also, that location will be made available to you, but no faster than one minute. This is a pretty good way of not burning the battery yourself. You're relying on other applications to do the work, and you get the location kind of for free that they are doing. It's a passive way of getting location, and it's a pretty powerful way of conserving battery. All right, so that's frequency. So latency is really about when location services has location to give you, how quickly do you need it? How quickly do you want location updates to be given to you? So we remember we talked about set interval. When you set interval of 30 seconds or two minutes, that's what location services is going to try to use as a, as a uh, as, as this, uh, the, the interval with, at which it gives you location. Um, but there is also a method called set max wait time, which is a way of having your location delivered um, in batches after a few times that it's been computed. So let's go back. Set interval is about how often is location computed for you. Set max wait time is how often location is delivered to you. So let me make this concrete with an example. Again, we create a location request, and we set the interval to five minutes. What this means is location is going to be computed for you every five minutes. Um, and if in, in that time when location is found, when a new location is found, and uh, your app will be woken up, and that location will be given to your app. But if you set a max wait time of one hour, which is what I've done here, something different will happen. Your location will still be computed every five minutes, but it will be delivered to you in a batch every hour, and you will get 12 location data points, at least in theory. So what this means is instead of being woken up every five minutes, your app's going to be woken up every hour, which is dramatically better for, location consum for battery consumption. So batching is a really, really, really good thing to use, especially for background cases uh, where you don't want your device to get woken up a lot. OK, and if you're using geofencing, the equivalent is set notification responsiveness. Geofencing scans happen every now and then. Uh, if you don't need your geofencing to be immediate, uh, you can maybe have a little window to hold off before a geofencing result is given to your app. You can set the responsiveness period to something high, and that is also a very good thing for battery. 
So here's a classic case of how you build a geofence. You uh, set a circular region, you set when it expires, you set what kind of transitions you want, and you build it. But if to that you add a set notification responsiveness and give it a sufficiently large value, that's going to make your geofencing uh, all the more battery efficient. So that's a, that's a bunch of stuff. To summarize, uh, it's a fairly obvious. The more frequent, the more accurate your updates, and the lower your latency, the more expensive it is for battery. So in foreground use cases, you can have it all. You can be frequent, you can be as accurate as you want, you can have as low latency as you want, but for everything else, you're going to have to trade off on one of these or more than one of these. And that's where you get to preserve battery. OK, so that's a lot of looking at APIs, looking at API calls. You're probably wondering, OK, I have practical problems to solve. What's the best way to solve them? Uh, so let's start with uh, an obvious one. You want to know the location of a device. For example, you're a weather app. You want to show the right weather. You need to know where the phone is. So here, I would say, you don't get location updates. You use cached location. Because every time location is obtained for your device, it is cached somewhere. And you can simply request that by using a get last location method. And this will pretty much give you um, um, what you need in, in a lot of cases. And the API also exposes ways of knowing how stale this is or how fresh it is. Um, so if this is not null and it doesn't look too stale to you, use it. You don't need to request location updates at all. You save a ton of battery that way. All right, another use case. Uh, you have user-visible foreground updates. For example, a mapping app of some kind. So here, because it is foreground, it's OK to use high accuracy, high frequency, and low latency. Uh, it's expensive, but it's OK, because in the foreground, this is pretty much tied to your activity's life cycle, and it will end soon. Uh, so typically, what you would do it in, a, in an activity, you would, inside the on start, you would request location updates. But you would also must do the following, which is that in on stop, you remove those location updates. If you don't remove those location updates, location gathering will keep happening long after your activity is there, which is obviously a very, very bad thing to do. Um, OK, another use case. You want to start location updates at a specific location. You want to start location updates when you're near home, when you're near work, near a cricket stadium, whatever. Um, so here, it's a pretty good case of mixing geofencing and location updates. So typically, what will happen is, imagine you have defined a geofence around some area of interest. If a user enters or exits a geofence, location services will let you know. And at that point, you can say, ah, this is the trigger I was waiting for. I'm going to now request location updates. A common pattern for this is the geofence gets triggered, you get notified, you maybe show the user a notification, the user taps in the notification, your app opens up to some activity, and at that point, location updates begin. Something like that. Uh, another common use case where you want location updates, but you only want them tied to a specific user activity. Maybe when the user is riding a bike or driving in a car. So here, we would use the Activity Recognition API, and we would then have uh, combine that with location updates. It would sort of work like the previous example. You, location let's say you were tracking bicycling. The location services would tell you when the user is likely to be on a bicycle, and you can take that and then start location updates through the same mechanism I talked about. Start a notification, user taps in a notification, something comes into the foreground, and boom, off you go, location updates. Um, so things can get fairly complex. You may be satisfied with these sort of simple scenarios I have mentioned. But what if you want geofencing and you want activity recognition, all of them to happen at the same time, and then sort of somehow combine that with location updates? Uh, we realize that there are complex use cases. So for that reason, we have an exposed uh, an awareness API. Um, and this is a very powerful way. Um, so it basically senses and infers your context and it manages system health for you, and it does so in a battery-efficient manner. If you're dealing with complex scenarios, 
awareness API may be exactly what you're looking for. So it tracks lots of things. What time of day is it? What is the location of the device? What are the places nearby? Are there coffee shops nearby? Are there stadiums nearby? Houses of worship? Uh, what is the activity of the, of the device? Is a person on a bike? Is it a person on a car? Are there beacons nearby? Is a person wearing headphones? What's the weather like? And what you can do is take all of these contexts and treat sort of a much larger sense of offense. Basically, you can easily react to changes in multiple aspects of a user's context. And this generalizes the idea of offense well beyond conventional geofences, which of course are just for location. So here's an example. So you create a context fence, and it tracks three things. You create an activity fence which says, track that the user is driving. It creates a location fence and says, track that this geofence, maybe a stadium geofence or something like that, um, is being tracked. And then a time geofence, make sure it's this time, between this time and this time. When all of these things are true, your, and your app is, let's say, even in the background, location services will say, ah, all the conditions you specified are true, I'm letting you know you can now do whatever, and that whatever could include location updates. Similarly, there is a snapshot API that is uh, made possible through awareness. And again, it's a simple way to ask for multiple aspects of a user's context. From a single, again, an example. You find out what the current place is. You find out what the current activity is. If the current place is a shopping mall and the activity is walking, hey, maybe it's time for you to start location updates so that you can tell the user as the user walks what the stores are nearby or maybe some discounts that you can offer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The thing is, you're, multi you're using multiple, sense, multiple inputs and multiple contexts, and that can get pretty expensive for battery because you're going to be running a lot of different things. If you use Awareness API, you can minimize the battery co uh, costs because Awareness APIs are actually pretty battery optimized. All right, one more use case that I want to spend at least a couple of minutes on, which is long running background updates tied to specific locations. You want to find all the Starbucks in Bangalore. You want to find all the ATMs, all the metro stops in every me metropolitan area. So here we get into uh, a solution that involves dynamic geofences. Location services makes um, a requirement that you can only use 100 geofences at one time. There are, of course, many more ATMs, many more Starbucks than just 100. And also, maintaining 100 geofences is actually pretty expensive. That's a lot of uh, scanning that uh, location services will have to do, and that's going to drain your battery. So the solution is dynamic geofences. Maybe put a geofence around the, some city, and when that person enters, when the device enters that city, dynamically register geofences in locations inside that city. So you have the outer geofences, dynamically you put inner geofences. If the person leaves the city, you can remove those dynamic inner ge geofences that are inside because you don't need them anymore. And this is a way you can actually, in a very battery efficient way, um, get a lot of geofences, get around the 100 geofence limit, um, and actually do really pretty amazing things. And now, <clears throat> the, the, the problematic one. You want long-running background updates with no visible app component. So basically, think of an app that passively tracks your location for hours or days at a time. So this is a case that, gives, that keeps people up. This is a case that is inherently problematic. Um, and this is a case where you get into that problem that I initially referred to, that background location gathering is a really, really major drain on battery. But if you have to do it, how do you do it? So let's talk about that. You could run a long-running service of some kind and then request location updates every now and then. The problem with that is if you plan to run your app on an old device, you can't have these kind of long-running services in the background anymore. So this isn't really anymore a good option for you. The API exposes a method for getting location updates using a pending intent, and that's exactly what you should do. So you request location updates, you give it a location request, you give it a pending intent, 
And GMS Core Location Services will wake up your app when an update is found. So in cases like this, what should the location request look like? Like, what are you going to do in the background that doesn't burn battery? So you use moderate accuracy, low frequency, and high latency. Let's just look at three of those things right now. You do not want accuracy, which is priority high accuracy for any background use cases. This is bad for battery. Uh, for frequency, I think a good pattern would be to request uh, updates a few times an hour, let's say every 15 minutes, which is what I have in this slide. Uh, and certainly, you should try to get more updates through passive uh, location gathering. So that's why it's a good idea to set fastest interval to some small amount. This way, if other apps are gathering location, you get that location for free. It doesn't cost you anything. And latency, this is really, really, really important. Again, imagine that you set your interval to 15 minutes. Sorry, imagine if you set your interval for 15 minutes. If you set the max wait time to one hour, you will get location updates every hour, but you'll get four updates which are calculated every 15 minutes at a time. That's pretty good for background, um, and that, that will save battery too. And finally, a very important use case that I'm sure all of you have dealt with, what if you want frequent updates while a user interacts with other apps? So imagine a fitness app or a navigation app. So in this kind of a case, you should use a foreground service. This is sort of the recommendation that we're coming up with because we believe that when potentially expensive work is being done on behalf of the user, that user should be aware of the work. Uh, Foreground service, as you know, requires a persistent notification. The user will be able to see, ah, stuff is being done for me. I like it. I approve of this. Or they'll say, I don't like it, and they'll get rid of that. But either way, the user is not having their battery burned in some silent, sinister manner. OK, so I'm slightly over time, and I'm going to quickly go over location limits. Um, so uh, you can see that these location limits are kind of a logical extension of many of the best practices that we've talked about in this uh, talk so far. Um, so I think starting with O, the location story in Android gets fantastic. And it gets fantastic because we throttle background location in a sensible way. And this happens on any app that's running on an O device. So the short of this is the background apps can receive location several times an hour, and that's it. Your location request may be something much more ambitious than that, but you're not going to get that. You're going to get several times an hour. Um, and this happens regardless of target SDK version. Um, you can do batching, but again, you will only get location several times an hour, not much more frequently than that. Also, Wi-Fi scans are much more efficient in O. Uh, we figured that people spend a lot of time at home, six, eight, 10, 12, 15 hours at a time, and a lot of time at work, six, eight, 10, hopefully not much more than that. But either way, you are inside a place, you're connected to a Wi-Fi access point, and you're not moving. So in Android O, uh, scanning for Wi-Fi is much more efficient. Um, there's also much smarter geofencing in O. So until O, in N and lower, uh, scans for geofencing default to every few seconds. Um, in Android O, it happens every couple of minutes. And we found that in a lot of devices, that can give us 10x uh, savings in terms of battery. So that's really great. Pre-O devices, where there are no limits, location is a very busy thing, even on a device that's actually in the background not being used. In O, with these location limits in place, things are much more serene, things are much more organized, and your battery consumption is much, much less. I'm out of time. Uh, I've actually gone over by three or four minutes. Uh, but I would say um, I hope you write location apps. I hope you write location apps that are ambitious. And I hope you take away from this talk that it's possible to do that and not sacrifice battery. Go ahead, code it up. Thank you.
Hello there. Good afternoon. Welcome to Frameworks and Tools for Progressive Web Apps. My name is Rowan Mewood. I'm a developer advocate for Chrome and Web. I've come over from London today, so the weather is making me feel very welcome. Thank you for that. Um, I'm also here for the rest of the event, so this is quite a short slot, but I would love to carry on this conversation with you. If you can't find me in person, you can also find me on Twitter, Rowan underscore M there, so please feel free to ask me questions. Now, what I would like to do today is explain the state of PWA tooling to you. Um, explain some of the goals and the philosophy behind that tooling so you have a, a sort of concept of why you're using it. Talk a bit about how you can apply this in single page applications. And finally, give you some best practices as well. Now, just so I have a bit of an idea of who's been paying attention and who's still awake, who has already heard the term PWA? Good. That should be nearly all of you, even the Android developers, because it was in the keynote this morning. Um, what I would like to do is give you some context before we go into this. One of the questions that we always get is, well, what is the right way to build my app? How do I build the perfect PWA? Please don't ask me this question, because of course the answer is, it depends, right? We're all coming from different situations. Some of us have apps already. Some of us are building brand new apps. And also, the approach differs for differing verticals as well. So the approach you take on an e-commerce site is very different to the approach that you take on a media site. That said, there are some common themes that run through this that we have identified. And we've tried to distill it down into four main pillars that I really want you to think about when you're busy building these experiences. First of all, it needs to be fast. You've probably heard the message because we've repeated this multiple times. But every microsecond of time that you make the user wait, that's a user who's abandoning your site. That's a conversion that you're not getting. So you really need to focus on making sure that the experience is as quick as possible. Now, secondly, because we're talking about progressive web apps, we're really talking about these high-powered websites, the websites that have taken the right vitamins. But that means that we've raised our users' expectations. So they're going to need to be more integrated with the device. That means there's an expectation that I'll have access to the full control of the camera. I might have access to Bluetooth. I expect location to work. I expect my device's orientation sensors to work. And again, as these experiences become more app-like, that also means that users are going to have more app-like expectations. And that means reliability. These sites need to work regardless of the network connection. I always should get some kind of experience that is useful to me as a user. And finally, like Sam mentioned this morning, no matter how many of the magical bells and whistles you implement, none of that makes a difference if you don't have the engaging content and functionality underneath that. So with that in mind, let's take a look at some of the tools that we can use and how they go about helping you. And the reason I want to do this is because what we want to do is put the user first. We want to create the best user experience on the web. And we feel that to create the best user experience, we should also give you the best developer experience so that it's easy to create these experiences. OK. I'm going to show you some tools in a bit. But I want to tell you about what those tools are going to be able to help you with first. Top of the list, like I said, putting the user first. Save the user's time. Because time is the biggest investment that the user is making into your app. So you can use tools to start identifying those areas of poor performance and apply common patterns to make those time savings and speed up the performance of your app. Critical to this and closely tied is also bandwidth. Because bandwidth is spending the time of the user downloading the app, but it's also directly spending their money as well. So make sure that when you're analyzing your bandwidth use, you're taking a respectful approach to the user's budget. And then one of the things that has always been heartening about the web is this idea that it's completely open and accessible everywhere. Right? I make a web page, and when I publish that, any client, any browser can access that web page. But 
in reality, we know that's not quite the case. You need to make tweaks for the different browsers. Different things are supported in different locations. But that shouldn't be directly your problem. Again, that's something that you want to make use of tooling and libraries to handle the differences between those browsers so that you can focus on writing the code that solves your business problems rather than starts to try and deal with platform inconsistencies. And when I talked about integration before, we enable things like push notifications on the web across browsers, across systems. But there's a lot of um, multiple moving parts that you need to deal with to make those push notifications happen. But again, it's all standard, so tools and libraries can help you here. I want to touch on code generation and how that differs from just using a library. And finally, I'll show you some of the tools that you can use to make sure that when you've gone through all of these previous processes, you're still enforcing the best practices that you start with a good experience and you keep a good experience as well. Let's look at some of the technology behind the PWAs that these tools are going to help you build. So first of all, a PWA is normally identified by its manifest. So this is a simple file that you can think of as the public description of what your PWA is capable of doing. Then there's the service worker. The service worker is a piece of JavaScript that is able to run in the background and take care of things for you when your site is not present in the browser. And finally, we're going to use some of these tools to actually build great applications as well, which is hopefully what you're all interested in. OK, starting with the manifest then. Since it's a standardized JSON file, there are a few tools that you can jump into that are, A, going to help you generate that JSON file and go through the various items. And they will automate some of the tedious tasks in there, like providing the multiple sizes of icons and marking them up correctly. But it's also going to help you make decisions about what kind of things you may want to include in your manifest. So you've probably seen that you can specify that your web app is a standalone web app. You may want to investigate the different display modes, what that means for browser support, what that means for the user experience. Again, going through these tools will help you understand the full range of options that are out there and why you might want to choose particular ones. The service worker then falls kind of into the other category. It is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, but with this power also comes a lot of complexity. So as you can see here, this is just the life cycle of the service worker when it is being added to your page. So it can sit there as a proxy, handling all inbound and outbound requests from your page. It's going to be what handles the incoming push requests. It can also coordinate across all the open clients you currently have on a device to manage the communication between them. This kind of low-level power is incredibly useful, but there's a lot that you need to learn to really take advantage of that. So again, we can wrap all of that functionality up in a library and some code generation to make sure that this is nice and simple for you. I wanted to show a bit about what you can do with Service Worker, so file caching. You'll see that there are a number of different approaches you can take to doing that. You can either do your file caching on or during the installation of the Service Worker. So this is when you might choose to proactively fetch a number of resources that you need to make your site available in an offline mode. But you might also want to do this at runtime, because obviously it would not be a good idea to spider your entire site and download it to the user's device. So you may just want to, pro, uh, you may want to fetch, whilst users are browsing your site, cache the content that they're looking at, and store that in the service worker. And finally, there are far more advanced caching strategies that might be relevant to your particular business use case. For example, maybe you have a special offer on the site that you want to ensure is available for the user, but it has a hard expiration time, so you don't want to show it past a particular point. Push notifications then, like I mentioned, there are a lot of standard parts here. You want to do different behavior. When the push notification rece is received, does the user currently have your app open, or is it closed? If it's open, you probably want to do something different by showing an in-app notification versus showing a notification on screen that the user will tap and navigate through to your app. And finally, on code generation then, really what I would like you to understand here is that code generation is a way of giving you code that is hopefully fast by default, is hopefully great by default, and comes with a selection of industry best practices built in. So it should have 
integration for metrics built in there, integration for analytics, security, usability, and so on. But the distinction between a code generation tool and a library is that when the code generation is complete, that code is yours. You need to make sure that you understand the code that has been produced and that you take it through the same review and testing processes as you would for code that any of your developers have written. So code generation can be a lot of fun, but don't assume that it's some kind of magic wand that you can just spread over your application and everything will work. OK. I want to split the tools for building a PWA into a couple different categories. Generic tools, which we can apply almost anywhere, some framework-specific tools that I'll show you. And then all the way at the end of this line is once you understand these tools, you start customizing them to be tightly coupled to your own build and application process. If we're talking about generic tools, then, the best place to start is with the browser, because you are as close to your user as possible. Now, Chrome has its own developer tools built into the browser, and we could spend an entire session exploring this. But I want to highlight two areas that are particularly important if you're working with progressive web apps. The first is the application tab, and specifically the service worker entry inside of that. If you go into this when you are looking at any web page, you can see the currently active service workers that are attached to that page. You can see what stage that they're in. You can examine what they're storing. You can look at the console log specifically for that service worker as well. As part of your development process, you are going to want to be very familiar with this, because as you start to introduce all of this caching functionality, that means you're also going to need to make sure that you always know when you are getting the latest version of the code. You can also see in here that there's a method to bypass for network. So when you're developing, you can always just make sure that the caching for your service worker is completely ignored, and you're always fetching from disk. Now, secondly, who's, who's already visited the Lighthouse booth? Yep. Everyone else, after this, you should go see the Lighthouse booth, put your site in, see what kind of score that you get out. Now, Lighthouse is a standalone tool but it exists inside of Chrome DevTools as one of the audits that you can run against your site. So again, if you go to the Audit tab inside of DevTools and perform an audit, then you will get back a score that covers the various progressive web app functionality for your site. It makes a number of performance-related measurements, accessibility measurements, and also a number of general best practices for websites as well. Hopefully already, you've heard from some of my colleagues about Workbox. So Workbox falls into the generic tool section, because what G Workbox focuses on is how it can build out a service worker for you with a number of specific patterns. That means it's actually relatively simple to take Workbox and apply it into an existing site or apply it to a new site as well. It gives you three main things. Um, but the team is always working on bringing additional best practices into this. First of all, various offline caching patterns. So when I talked about the various approaches you might want to take, Workbox provides these by default. You can do cache first. You can do network first. You can race the two so that you can respond with which, whichever is quicker. You can set expiration policies and so on. It also makes available offline analytics to you. This means that when your app is offline, you can still collect the analytics events. And when, you when you're back and connected again, then it will batch those together and send those on. So this is incredibly important, because if you make your app available offline, you still want to know how your users are interacting with it so you can improve it in the future. And finally, we make use of newer technologies, like background sync as well. So this means that you have a number of built-in strategies for how you want to refresh content that you're storing on the user's device. Workbox is open source, so you can come find this on GitHub. Uh, if things aren't working out for you, then pre please raise issues, talk to the team. Or if you have something that you think Workbox should be able to do, you could even contribute some code yourself. Now, we're not the only people doing this. Uh, if you make use of Webpack for bundling or other parts of your build pipeline, then I would highly recommend looking at the offline plugin for Webpack. This does a number of similar things, where it enables you to build out a service worker based on your Webpack configuration, where you can specify various assets for caching ahead of time, uh, or caching when the user browses to them, or just optimistically making them optional so that you can cache them when they're most useful. 
Again, this is on GitHub, and there's plenty of sample code and documentation linked off of that repository to help you get started. And the other thing, like I said, I really love the open nature of the web and how easy that makes it for everyone to get involved. So I also like it when companies then start contributing this stuff back as well. Um, Pinterest has been doing a huge amount in terms of building a very highly performing web app. And they have actually started pushing back some of their libraries on creating, testing, and experimenting with service workers. One of the things that's particularly interesting about their offering is they include a number of test uh, sort of harnesses and isolation methods for the service worker as well. So we sometimes have a tendency with new technology to get a little carried away with all of the cool stuff we can build and not necessarily cover testing it. So to me, this is really a sign that the technology is becoming much more mature and production ready as well. And then, because of how fast-paced this is, I feel it's also important to understand some of the history as well. So some of the earlier libraries that are still active, there's SW Precache and SW Toolbox. Now, these have been sort of superseded by Workbox because they were earlier, they're a bit more tightly coupled to specific functionality. But what you'll find is that a number of the uh, CLI tools that I show you for the frameworks are actually making use of these libraries in the background. So they're worth looking at, but I would look at Workbox first if you are starting off something new of your own. OK. It's also always good to have a, a sort of industry convention or a benchmark that you can use as well. So most of the time, like if you have a device with a screen, whether it's like a graphing calculator or a printer or an oscilloscope, the, uh, the default sort of benchmark is to see if you can run Doom or Quake on it. Um, so for front-end developers, it's can I take your JavaScript framework and write a Hacker News client with it? So HNPWA is a collection of Hacker News readers built in a variety of frameworks using a variety of libraries. And what I find really useful is that this is a way to compare approaches in the different frameworks. So if you're trying to decide which one you want to choose to solve a particular problem, or you want to see how the industry is making use of different technologies, then this is kind of a great playground to go and compare solutions to the same problem across a multitude of tools. OK, hopefully by now you should have a feeling for the kind of mindset that I'm hoping that you can get into. What I would really like to accomplish with this, and what you should be thinking of these tools as doing for you, is one, simplifying your mental model. The amount you need to learn to sort of properly understand and become an expert in service worker is, is huge. And that investment is probably not part of the time that you want to be using when you're doing your job. Um, and also, a lot of these problems have already been solved. So there's no need for you to reinvent the wheel and spend a lot of time writing a lot of extra code to handle all of these edge cases. So all in all, this is about saving time for you um, and basically getting the best solution for your user. And really, what it means is that you can focus your effort on the use cases that are important, the problems that are closer to your business, not the problems that are closer to the platform. Um, and as well, like I keep saying, the accessibility and the open nature of the web means that it was really easy for me to get involved when I was younger, creating terrible websites with Perl backends. But it was still very simple. It was accessible. So what this means is that by using these libraries, you can still layer in Service Worker with that same level of simplicity and just get going and get something published on the web. And when I talk about edge cases as well, like the kind of things that these libraries will handle for you that you don't want to have to try and write again yourself, Service Worker installation. If your app loses connectivity during the install, then what are you going to do? A naive approach here would be to say, well, I had a list of things I was going to cache, uh, so I just won't cache them. Or maybe you actually say, I didn't complete caching my list of things, so I'm going to delete it, and I'm going to try downloading it all over again. Neither of these are good solutions for the user. One of them gets them nothing. The other one makes them spend their bandwidth again to get the same result they could have had. If you use a library here, there are a number of approaches that can actually go through 
validate the existing items that you have cached, and then pick up and resume the download when you left off. And again, what if your user has full connectivity? And by this, this seems a little counterintuitive, but what I mean here is if I'm reading a piece of content and I'm getting the cached version from your service worker and then it updates in the background, what should you do? Should you force me to refresh my page? Should you show me a little notification saying I can tap here to refresh? Or can you actually get the content and dynamically insert it into the existing page? All of these patterns already start to exist in these libraries. So rather than trying to work out how you're going to do it, you can just work out which one you want to use. And finally, one of the benefits of Service Worker and having an additional caching layer here as well is that if you're dealing with an API that you don't control, you now have the ability to add additional layers of caching on top of that. This means that if you have an API that isn't going to work well offline, you can actually cache the responses from the API so that when your app is offline, you can still act as if you're getting the last piece of data that was available from the API. OK. Now, I'm reiterating this again. You're here to save time. You're here to save yourself a lot of code. It's not just developer time. It's operational time. It's bug fixing. It's QA. And save a lot of effort. The reason I reiterate this is because of the number of times that developers always seem to want to go off and reinvent the entire universe because it gives them an opportunity to write a new JavaScript framework. Please don't do that. Now I want to jump in to single page applications. I also want to stress here that there are lots of different ways of approaching PWAs. Um, as, as you've probably seen, my colleagues have shown you a couple. Uh, tomorrow, there's a talk on migrating your existing site to a PWA as well. But if you are starting with one of the single page application frameworks, then this is a selection for you to do so. Now, this is by no means a comprehensive list. Like I was warning, in the time that I've been presenting, someone has probably written and released a new JavaScript framework anyway. Maybe, maybe someone in this room has done this, actually. But what I will do is I will show you examples from these five. Because what I would like to stress is how easy it is for you to just dip in and get started so that you can see how these frameworks operate, and you can start to make a more informed decision about what you would like to choose for your project. Let's start with React, then. So React has create React app. And this is a command line script that is going to create a service worker for you. It's going to generate your web app manifest. And it's actually going to give you a cache-first strategy for serving your assets as well. And it's as simple as this. I'm using Yarn in these examples, but there's no reason you can't use NPM uh, or your own package management or manually downloading these as well. So here, I'm installing the Create React app into the global scope so it's available for me on the command line. I'm then calling Create React app with just the name of the app. I jump into the directory, and I run Yarn build. At the end of this, it's going to output some information for you saying how you can run a development server, how you can run a production server. Run that production server and jump in, and you'll reach the Welcome to React page, where they're actually just going to show you where in the code directory you can go to continue your adventure. If you open DevTools as well, this is an ideal time to go and look at the service worker that has been installed for you. So you can take a look in there, and you can see the methodology that they're using to create that cache-first uh, approach to serving the content. Next up is Preact. So this is the Preact CLI. This is a uh, slightly more fuller featured by default. They give the app creation to you. And what they put out in their default template is actually an app shell. So you get your static index HTML with some uh, content pre-rendered. And then it's going to go and fetch the, the first root. Preact also provides browser list auto prefixing. What this means is that by default, you are going to get customized versions for the different browsers that are coming in. Um, and quite interestingly, this is one where you may want to look at this regardless of if you are using Preact. They have a configuration that will interface with Firebase static hosting, because Firebase static hosting is HTTP2 and can handle server push. So their configuration by default will actually take advantage of HTTP push to push some of those resources down, um, speeding up that delivery to the user even more. 
Like I mentioned before, they use SW Precache in the background. So if you want to understand what they're doing, it may be useful for you to look at that library too. And again, we're just adding the Preact CLI. In this case, we're saying create default. So default here is the name of the template. There are a number of different templates that you can explore if you want to create different apps. I do that. I jump in. I run yarn build. I get my feedback back for how to run the development server. And I jump in. And by default, they actually give you a bit of a material design style app uh, where you're actually seeing the routing component in action as well. So the navigation that you have at the top there will enable you to see to navigate between different tabs. We've then got the Polymer CLI for the Polymer framework. This gives you, again, manifest generation and an optional service worker you can drop in. Some approaches that Polymer takes that are quite interesting, they actually, by default, give you three different bundles. They give you an ES5 bundle, an ES6 bundle, and then they also give you an unbundled ES6 version. Now, as browsers are progressing, people are starting to experiment with, should we, do we still need to bundle our JavaScript, or can we leave it unbundled? At the moment, you probably still want to bundle, but this is a good way of immediately getting that unbundled one so that you can benchmark between the two of them to see what the performance difference is for you. Polymer CLI also gives you an implementation of the purple pattern out of the box. So there is a server that comes with the Polymer CLI that you can use to serve your content using HTTP2 push um, and actually proactively pushing a number of resources to the user. Again, we're pulling in Polymer CLI and Bower. We're making our directory. We're jumping in. We're running Polymer in it. Now, this will take you through an interactive process where you can select a number of starter projects. I've chosen the starter kit here. Then I'm running build. And oh, we get another nice material design related app with uh, navigation and routing built in. Again, go and take a look at the service worker that's being run there. That will show you not just the, uh, the caching, but also how it handles some of those incoming resources as well. Vue.js, so in this case, we're going to go get the CLI tool, and we're also going to pull down a number of default templates. This gives us the app creation, the manifest, the service worker, the app shell. One of the things that Vue does is it actually does some nice lazy loading for the additional JavaScript, CSS, your fonts, and so on. So I would recommend looking at what they do there to understand how you can pull in that functionality as you need it, rather than necessarily bundling it all up front and pushing it down to the user. That looks like this. We're adding in our view CLI. We're initializing the project. This is another interactive one, so it will guide you through the process. And it actually gives you some helpful hints on how to name your application so it's not truncated and so on. We go in, we build the Yarn application, and then we jump straight into our Vue uh, application again. And as per usual, go take a look at the developer tools, and there's your service worker. And then, finally, we can take a look at Angular. So Angular CLI tool will also give us the app creation, service worker. What they do with the service worker is a little different. So rather than giving you the service worker directly, they actually have a JSON-based configuration file that is designed to handle the standard caching. There's a plugin you can pull in for handling push notifications uh, and other lifecycle events. So they've kind of tried to provide this abstraction on top of the lifecycle so that you can just focus on the processes that you're trying to implement rather than needing to necessarily understand the service worker itself. Inside of here, I'm adding Angular again. I'm running the ng tool to create this. And inside of Angular, what you actually need to do is set a few configuration options here to say that I want a service worker by default. And then I make the production build of my Angular app. And we jump in. And we've got a basic Hello World app with some links off to other applications that can help get us started. OK. That is my like whirlwind tour through some front-end frameworks. You're all experts now, so go off and build the next generation of PWAs. Uh, but I wanted to highlight a few other projects that you can look at. Um, PWA Rocks and PWA Builder are actually very good tools for taking you through some of the functionality choices that you want to make. So PWA Builder gives you this kind of radio selection, 
that you can go through, answer questions about the kind of functionality you want, and it will start to spit out some basic templates and starter kits for you. Best practices, then, to finish us off. Always remember to go and check the application tab, because I guarantee you will run into a couple issues the first time you are using Service Worker. Rob Dodson has actually written an excellent guide that you can get to here, bit.ly debugging dash service worker. This will give you a number of tips on doing things like adding a kill switch to your service worker so you have a sort of escape hatch to wipe it, uh, making sure that you know the correct way to reset this inside of DevTools so that you're not consistently clearing your entire cache and cookies, maybe uninstalling and reinstalling Chrome in the hope that you can actually get a fresh version of your application. And really, the piece of advice that I would like you to leave with here is try and follow the tools. So if you find yourself fighting with the way of the tool is trying to do something, then that's probably a sign that either you need to change the way you're thinking or you need to look at a different tool. So the tool should be getting you 80% of the way there, and it's that remaining 20% that you want to be focusing your effort on, not fighting with the way that the tool is doing the generation. And a couple other caveats. Amazing as DevTools is, please don't assume that it is a be-all and end-all. There are a couple things that will not work exactly as you expect inside of DevTools. For example, the offline checkbox that you use there doesn't affect every single type of network connection. So if you have WebSockets, say, via the Firebase real-time database, that data may still be going back and forth even when you're in offline mode. So when it gets through to the end, always make sure that you test on a real device, preferably the same device that the majority of your users have. I also want to just call back to the Pinterest stuff, because they also add in the end-to-end -end tests for Service Worker as well, which can be incredibly helpful for isolating that logic and testing it through. And then really, the last thing is to stay up to date and stay involved, because Service Worker is gaining a huge amount of adoption. So Safari is going to be implementing it and so on. Um, but it is in development, and the spec is always being updated. So that means you want to watch for those future developments. And if you have a direction that you would really like the project to go, then this is the time to make your voice heard. So please go out and give those tools a try. Give feedback on how you found them. And I would like to say thank you very much for your time. Any other questions, come find me or poke me on Twitter. And please enjoy the rest of the event.
Hello, everyone. My name is Florina Montanescu, and I'm a developer advocate at Google. Earlier this year, at Google I.O., we announced in alpha the architecture components, a set of libraries that allow you to design robust, testable, and maintainable apps. And now, the architecture components are finally in 1.0, and they are ready to be integrated in your own production applications. Today, I want to tell you a bit about the architecture components, and I want to give you a set of best practices, just to make sure that what you're doing is on the right track with the components. And also, I want to tell you a few things about one of the newest additions of the components, the paging library, which is still in alpha. So let's start with the architecture components. We'll go over each of them. So let's say that this is an activity that displays information about the user. One of the biggest problems is configuration change, because this is when the activity gets destroyed and then recreated. This is why in uh, uh, the architecture components, we created the concept of lifecycle and of lifecycle owner. So an activity or a fragment has a lifecycle. Therefore, they are a lifecycle owner. The lifecycle of a lifecycle owner can be observed by a lifecycle observer. And you can implement uh, your own lifecycle observer and define methods that will be called whenever a specific lifecycle event is triggered. So for example, if you want to start something like a location listener, you can just define a start method for it and annotate that method with at lifecycle event and the event that you're interested in, for example, on start. And then this will be triggered whenever on start will be called. Like this, we can create components that are lifecycle aware. Architecture components provides one of these lifecycle aware components. This is live data. Live data is actually a data holder. And other components can set the value of the data that's being called. And activities and fragments can observe that live data. And they can react on it and update the UI. But when the activity is on pause or on destroy, the, subs the subscriber is removed. The live data is considered inactive, so the events are not propagated. But when the activity is recreated, we subscribe again, and then the UI can again react on the changes of the live data. So the class designed to store and manage UI data so it survives configuration changes is the view model. And this is the life cycle of a view model compared to the life cycle of an activity. So what's important here to notice is that whenever the activity is finished, the view model is cleared, so only then. So this means that the view model will survive configuration changes, but it will not survive pressing back, killing the, activity, uh, the application from recent, or when the, fragment, uh, the framework kills your app. So this means that when long-running operations uh, finish, the view model is updated independent on whether the data is observed or not. So this means that you will no longer get null pointer exceptions when you're trying to update a, uh, a non-existing view. So you, need, you should avoid references in the view model, because these can lead to memory leaks or crashes. So instead of pushing data to the UI, the UI observes the view model. So make sure you don't hold any UI logic in the view, but rather you move this in the view model so it can easily be unit tested. So for example, it will be the view model's responsibility to get the user, prepare it for it to be displayed, and then, uh, if needed, hold it for the UI. And then the UI would notify the view model about the user's actions. The view model works with the repository to get and set the data. And repository modules are responsible for handling data operations. They provide a clean API to the rest of the application. They know where to get the data from, what API calls to make, and when the data is updated. So you can consider them as mediators between different data sources. It's a good idea to have a data layer in your application completely unaware of the presentation layer. The thing is that algorithms that synchronize and keep cache and database in sync with the network are not trivial. 
So adding a single point of entry that deals with this is recommended. So the repository would know what call to, uh, to call, what API call uh, to use to get the user. And because we want to make sure that we're not doing more network requests than needed, we will also save that in a database locally. To save the data locally, Architecture Components comes up with a new library, Room. Room is a wrapper over SQLite database, an object mapping library that provides data persistence with minimal boilerplate code. So our table, our user's table, will look something like this. We would have a user ID, name, and some other user information. And what we want is to save the users in such a table, and then every row is an instance of the user object. To do this, we define our user object, and we just annotate it with at entity. We define what are the columns of this uh, user by using at column info, and uh, which one are, is or are primary keys. To actually access the database and work with the data there, we use the data access objects. So we create an interface or an abstract class. We annotate it with DAO. And then there, we define the methods that work with our database. These can be query, insert, update, and delete. Queries can also return live data objects, making this query an observable query. So what's an observable query? Let's say that our users table looks like this. So we have two users with ID 3 and with ID 4. But what we're interested in is uh, getting the user with ID 4. So initially, our live data will omit uh, John, because we, we want the name for it. And then when we update the table, and then we update the user with ID 4, and instead of uh, John, we set the username as Mark, our live data will automatically emit Mark, the new user. <clears throat> Room also supports Flowable if you're working with RxJava. So usually, developers that uh, use RxJava in their application tend to use it throughout the entire uh, layers. So starting from the repository to the view model to the UI. So one thing that you could do is use the live data only on the UI layer. So live data was made for the UI. So leverage that connection to the activity lifecycle. To help with this transition between live data and RxJava, you can use the live data reactive stream class. This provides two methods from publisher that allows you to create the live data from an RxJava stream and to publisher that allows you to create an RxJava stream from a live data. So using the observable queries means that we can have a UI that reflects the latest changes in the database. And then the view model propagates the changes in the repository to the UI. Like this, we have a high degree of testability and a separation of concerns. What we're showing here is actually the guide to app architecture. It's uh, the way that we suggest that you could architect your application so you can have all of these properties. Let's talk about saving the data. Let's say that we want to save the data that we display on the UI. Where should this be saved? In unsaved instance state, in the view model, or in the database? So one thing that we should really remember is the view model survives configuration changes, but not pressing back, killing the app from recent, or when the framework kills your app. So when we're creating a, an activity, uh, this is what happens. On create gets called, then the view model uh, gets created, the view model works with the repository, the repository gets the user from the API and then saves the user in the database, and then uh, the view model creates this user UI model, uh, a POJO class that we would use to display data on the UI. So let's go over a few scenarios. The first one is configuration change. So let's see what happens. In configuration change, the onStop method is being called. And then onStart is being called. So here in onStart, we would just display the user, um, the user UI model from the view model. We don't need to do any calls to the repository or to the network. Scenario two, the app goes to background, and then the user navigates back to the application. So when the activity goes to background, then the onsaved instance state is called. And then 
when the activity comes to foreground again, we can just display the user um, UI model from the data from the view model. Again, we don't need to call the repository. We don't need to do any network uh, requests. But scenario three, the most interesting one, when the app goes to background and the process is killed. Well, in this case, when the activity goes to background, unsaved instance state is called. So this is the place where we can save the user ID of our user. And then uh, uh, the activity gets killed. And then when activity starts again, in the on create in the bundle, uh, we have this user ID that we've saved before. So based on this user ID, we can pass that to the view model. And then the view model gets the user from the repository based on that user ID. So this means that we don't need to do any network requests if we save the user ID in unsaved instance state. So in the end, what should you put in each of them? What should you put in unsaved instance state in the view model or in the database? Well, keep in mind that in the database, you should put the data that survives process death. So this is where you should put your user object, the big one that you have. Then in the view model, you should put the data needed for the UI. So for example, that user UI model that you use to display on the screen. And then in all saved instance state, you should put the minimal amount of data that allows you to restore the data. So for example, a list of IDs. But instead of one user, let's consider that we have a list of users. Many applications need to load a lot of information from the database. But database queries can take a long time to run and use a lot of memory. And we have a new uh, library, the paging one, that makes it easy to load the information gradually. So uh, for now, the architecture components is still in alpha. And what I'm going to tell you is not live yet. It's only going to re be released in the next version of, uh, of the alpha of the paging library. So um, the app starts. The view model for the screen is created. The view subscribes to the notifications of the data. The view model works with the repository, and it's subscribing to the data coming from it. And then the repository works with the data source. Nothing new so far. So we have the data coming from the data source to the repository, then to the, the view model that changes the data, preparing it to be displayed on the UI. And then the view model um, gives that data to the UI. So let's say that in the UI, we have a recycler view. And that recycler view would work with a recycler view adapter. So that data would go to the adapter, and only then the adapter will notify the UI and will display the list on the screen. So this means that um, the advantage of this architecture is that the data source is completely separated from the UI. And then the UI just observes the data. And we can have one data source and n recycler views. We can easily reuse the same uh, UI logic, the same uh, data source logic in different UIs. And then the paging library will actually be used throughout this entire uh, architecture. Uh, the objects that all of these classes have in common is a page list. And then instead of a recycler view adapter, you would use a page list adapter, which just extends from a recycler view adapter and uses a page list. So let's see more what's going on there. We said that we have these main components. So what's a page list? A page list is a lazy loading list that pages content from a data source in chunks. It supports both infinite scrolling lists, but also countable lists. Creating a paging list automatically triggers loading of the data from the data source. And this is why it should be done on a background thread. And this is the reason why the paging library is using uh, uh, live data, because live data ensures that uh, whatever operation is done to request the data from the data source is done on the background thread. And then once the data is constructed, then it can be passed to the UI um, on the UI thread. So let's say that as a data source, we have for now a database. The data source gets the data for the page list from network or database. Then the data is put in the page list. And then um, the page list adapter works with the page list and updates the UI. What happens when the user scrolls? 
Well, at this moment, the page list requests the next page from the data source. The data source gives the next page. And then the page list adapter uh, updates the UI. But let's say that the user swipes away an item. So this means that the corresponding item in the database gets to be removed. So the database is updated, the item is removed. But because the source was updated, the data source is invalidated. And this leads to the destruction of the source and the recreation of the data source with a page list. So what's important to remember is that several types of operations can lead to an invalidation of the data source. So if you're doing an insert, an update, or a delete in a data source, then that should trigger an invalidation of the data source, and then to the recreation of the page list. And then this new page list will be populated with the data from the data source. But then the contents of the two page lists are compared in a diffutil on a background thread. And then the diffutil will tell the adapter what changed. And then based on this, only now, the adapter collapses the missing row. So you can use this data source, a database, network, Firebase, file, whatever you want. But you'll need to define how that data is requested. So for this, we have two different types of data sources. <clears throat> the first one is the keyed data source. You would use this one if you need the element n minus 1 to get the element n. Because uh, of the key from the element, uh, because based on the key from element n minus 1, you would be able to get the next one. So, for example, when you're working with a data ordered based on a certain criteria, so when you will need to get the users by name ordered. <clears throat> So when you're implementing your key data source, you will need to define an initial load and then how to load after the current item or before, if the scrolling up is allowed. So uh, all of these would be based on a key. This key is something that you would define. In our case, for the user, this key would be the name of the user, because this is how we are ordering our list. Another type of uh, data source is the positional data source. So if you are using a fixed item count just based on the position information, you would use this uh, positional data source. When you're implementing a positional data source, you need to implement a load initial and then a load range. And this, is, this would be the point where you would be requesting some data from your backend. So when the data is received, you would inform the data source via the load callback. callback. So the next step is to implement the data source factory that can create a data source. And this is needed because when the data source is invalidated, the factory is actually the one that knows how to recreate a data source. If your data source is actually room, then just update your DAO to return a data source factory where the key, at least for now, is always integer. Under the hood, in the implementation of the DAO, Room will create the data source factory for you. But how do you know when to trigger these data requests? How do you know when the user scrolls then that then it's the time to get the data from the network? Well, for this, you would use the page list boundary callback. In the boundary callback implementation, um, th this callback signals when a page list has reached the end of an available data. And this is actually the point where you trigger more requests from the database. So whether you should request items from the front or from the end of the list. And then um, to actually get the live data of a page list that ends up being used by the UI, we need to create an instance of the live page list builder. So this gets us a parameter, let's say, the network data source uh, factory, and then a page size, so like how many items should be in a page. And then you can set the boundary callback. I was showing earlier this slide, and I was saying that the diffutil compares the content of the two page lists. But Paging Library wants to optimize this. And instead of comparing two lists, it knows how to compare elements. Well, it knows if you tell it how to compare elements. 
More precisely, you will need to implement a diff callback <coughs> between two elements. And you will implement two methods. Are content the same? And are items the same? And then, in your adapter, uh, you would extend the page list adapter of your uh, model and the uh, view holder. You would use as a parameter um, in the constructor the default callback that you've just created. <clears throat> and then you just bind your view holder to the item. In your activity, you need to make sure that it extends at compat activity, so it has a life cycle. And then in the onCreate method, you would create an instance of your adapter. And then you would observe the changes of the live, uh, live data of a page list from your view model. And then whenever that live data emits, you will set the new list to the adapter. So now we have a list. The architecture components have a high usability also because of you, because of all the feedback that we've received on it. So check out the paging library and give us, uh, give us feedback. Tell us what works, what not. Tell us where you would need more things to be done by the library instead of being you the ones that uh, have to implement it. So we had a lot of new concepts and components. We have lifecycle, live data, page list, view model. We have room. But the thing is that you can use them separately. You can pick and choose the ones that you need for your application. Or if you want, you can use all of them together. Uh, check it out and let me know how it went. Thank you.
Okay. All right. Hello. 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 So welcome everybody to Modern Tooling Testing and Automation. We're going to talk a little bit about Lighthouse, Puppeteer, and Headless Chrome. So we only have 30 minutes, a lot to cover in that amount of time, so let's go ahead and get started. So my name is Eric Beidelman. I am an engineer on the Chrome team. I work with web developers all over the world and help you guys build amazing web experiences. Um, fun fact about me is I'm actually from a state in the US called Michigan. And I can literally point to my hand, because it looks like a hand, and tell people where I'm from, which is really convenient. The other cool thing about Michigan is that it has the most number of lighthouses of any state in the United States. So it was only fitting that I worked on a project called Lighthouse eventually. Yeah, and hi everyone. My name is Vinamrata Singhal. I'm a product manager on the Chrome Web Platform team working on Lighthouse. And as a fun fact about myself, I actually really loved Bollywood dancing as a kid. And these are some embarrassing photos of me performing at family functions. And what I recently realized is Bollywood dancing is actually pretty similar to my day job as a product manager. Specifically, when I'm doing Bollywood dancing, I'm trying to tell a story through physical movements about what I'm feeling in the music. And with product management, I'm telling a story to my users about my products. And so today, I'd like to tell you, uh, take you on a little journey into the Lighthouse product itself. More on the PM style and less on the Bollywood dancing style, although I'm sure that would be pretty great too. Um, specifically, I wanted to focus on, with Lighthouse, talk a little bit about the problem that we're trying to solve, deep dive into the product itself, and then kind of take a step back and talk about Lighthouse in the broader context of web development. And then Eric will take over and talk about Headless Chrome and Puppeteer. So let's get started. So as a web developer, you might have heard about a lot of things that you're supposed to do. For example, you might have heard not to use methods like document.write, that you're supposed to optimize your images by compressing them to create performant web experiences, that you're supposed to be on HTTPS to deliver a secure experience to your end users, that accessibility is really important and you should have ARIA labels for all the elements on your page, and that you shouldn't use render blocking scripts, and so much more stuff. To add to this, you might have heard about a thing called progressive web apps throughout this conference that help you create really great mobile web experiences that feel like native app experiences. But in order to build a progressive web app, there's a lot of things you need to do, including serving your site over HTTPS, creating responsive pages on mobile and tablet, et cetera, et cetera. So you probably feel like this person, really confused, like, what am I supposed to be doing? And all you really want to be doing is spending time pushing code and creating features for your end users, being more like the person to the right, I guess. Um, and that is a problem that we completely understand on Lighthouse, because we want to enable all of you in the audience out there to create really awesome mobile web experiences. So that's why we built Lighthouse, which is basically a product that helps you understand your website against four different categories of performance, accessibility, progressive web apps, and developer best practices, and running checks against them to create a personalized report that helps you understand what are the things that you're doing well on your website, and what are the things that you could per perhaps do a little bit better. So this is a little bit hard to understand on the abstract level. So let's go into a live demo. So if we could switch to the demo, please. Awesome. So I'm going to run Lighthouse right now live in front of all of you. And I'm going to run it on possibly the best website you can imagine, which is airhorner.com. For those of you who have never seen this before, it's pretty simple. You just click this button, and it uh, gives you the sound of an air horner. So pretty awesome. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to now run Lighthouse through the Chrome developer tools. But I will also talk about other ways in which you can run Lighthouse later. So I'm just going to open up the Chrome developer tools here. And then I'm going to go into the Audits panel. And voila, I have Lighthouse right there. And so I'm going to click on Perform an Audit. And I can check whatever categories of audits I'm interested in. So I care about everything, so I'm just going to run it across everything. And so now what Lighthouse is actually doing is that it's emulating my website on a mobile device, specifically a Nexus 5X device. And it's actually throttling the network. So it's, em it's uh, simulating a 3G connection. And that's why it kind of takes a little bit of time. But now you can see right here, I have my Lighthouse report. And things look pretty good on my website. So that's pretty awesome. Can we switch back to the slides, please? Oh, cool. It's already done. 
So as I was mentioning earlier, there's quite a few ways that you can run Lighthouse. So the way that I just showed you was through the Chrome developer tools. But you can also run it through the Lighthouse Chrome extension. You can run it through the command line with the Lighthouse NPM module. And you can also run Lighthouse on web page test. So now let's do a little bit of deep dive into the Lighthouse report that I was showing you earlier. And for the purposes of this part of the talk, I will only be focusing on the performance and PWA section. So let's get started with the PWA section. So this was a slide earlier talking to you about what are all the different requirements that you need to implement in order to build a progressive web app. And we have a handy dandy checklist that you can look at in order to understand what are the things you need to do to build a PWA. And what Lighthouse does is that it takes this baseline checklist and it basically automates the entire process. So you don't have to think about, am I actually implementing a service worker correctly? Lighthouse can tell and do that for you. And it tells you a score at the top that helps you understand at a high level how far are you in the journey in building your own progressive web app. And for Lighthouse definition, we consider a score of a 100, meaning that you've built a progressive web app. So now talking about the performance section of the report, before we deep dive into the report itself, I want to explain to you how we think about the page load. And so on the Chrome team, you might have heard us talk about a thing called progressive web metrics. And the idea behind that is the way that you understand a page load is through how an end user perceives the page loading. And there's a couple of key moments here in that user journey. The first one being first contentful paint. So when are the first pixels of content appearing on the screen? So this could be something like a text, an image, or an SVG. The next thing is first meaningful paint. So first meaningful paint is when did the first meaningful content on my page start appearing? So this could be like a hero image, for example. And then finally, at the very end, you have time to interactive. So when does my page become first interactive to users as well as continuously interactive so that users can click on anything and they're able to see the page be responsive? And so what Lighthouse does is it basically takes all these metrics, shows them to you for your web page, helps you understand at a high level how good these metrics are, and then also tells you what are ways that you can improve these metrics with the performance section of a report. So this looks kind of daunting, so I'll just go through it step by step with you. So at the very top, you have a high level score. In this case, it's 63. That tells you this is overall how the performance of your website is. The next section is what we call metrics. So basically, at the top, you'll see a bunch of different images, what we call a film strip, which is basically how did your page look at different time intervals of, the web, uh, of your website loading. And then it also gives you values for the metrics that I was talking about, like first meaningful paint and time to interactive. The key thing to know here is that this section basically determines your Lighthouse score, meaning that metrics like first meaningful paint, first interactive, and consistently interactive are worth five times as much in terms of uh, determining your final Lighthouse score. And so when you're thinking about what metric should I be paying attention to and how do I think about improving my Lighthouse score, those are the top three scores, uh, top three metrics that you should be looking at. So the next section of the report is the opportunity section, with the idea being how are ways that you can improve your website. So in this case, you can see that optimizing your images is probably your best bet in terms of improving the performance of your website. And then finally, we have diagnostics. So if you're interested in deep diving into performance further, you can look into things like critical request chains. So I would like to give all of you a sneak peek into what's coming up next for Lighthouse. So I'm excited to uh, announce that in the next few releases of Lighthouse, we'll be adding a whole new section of the report itself focused on search engine optimizations, specifically about how you can make your website more friendly to search engine crawlers and indexers. But it's coming soon, so it's not out yet. So now I want to take a step back and talk about Lighthouse in the broader context of web development. Specifically, I want to start off by talking about our adoption metrics. So Lighthouse has pretty good adoption in the sense of we have over 100,000 users using the Lighthouse extension. We have over 250,000 users using the Lighthouse NPM module. And in terms of DevTools, while I can't share exact stats, what I can say is that it's about half as popular as a timeline panel. We've also seen people building services on top of Lighthouse, specifically services like Caliber and Trio. 
I also want to talk about our open source community because we are an open source project and we definitely wouldn't be here without open source contributions we receive from developers like you. Even something as simple as changing the readme file really helps our project go a long way. And we have over 100 plus contributors from all over the world. You can see them in blue on this map here from countries like India and Brazil and Poland and even the United States next door neighbor Canada. So if you're interested in being part of this contributor community and we'd love to have you join, check us out on GitHub. The repo is called Lighthouse. And then finally, I want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here on behalf of the team. We really appreciate, uh, I really appreciate you coming out and listening to me talk about Lighthouse. And uh, if you're interested in trying out Lighthouse, we actually have a booth at the Sandbox. So you can come talk to Eric and I about Lighthouse after the talk if you want to learn more. And so now that you have a website and you have a nice little way to audit it via Lighthouse, you might want to think about you know, what is the best way that I can detect, regress re detect reg regressions and automate some testing to make sure that the regressions don't actually end up going to my end users. And this is where Eric will tell you all about Puppeteer and Headless Chrome to see how you can make that happen. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, can we switch to uh, Keynote, please? Keynote, please. Onwards to Puppeteer. Do we have Keynote? Ah, sorry. OK. It's not on my screen, but it's on yours. So let's get started. Um, v talked a little bit about manual testing using Lighthouse, which is in the dev tools now. But maybe you want to do some testing and automation using Headless Chrome or Puppeteer. And we're going to talk about both these right now. So if I can see what I'm doing. I don't know. My clicker doesn't work either. All kinds of technical fail. All right. So what is headless browsing? How many people have heard of headless Chrome? Nice. So normally when you click the icon you know, on, your, on your desktop, right? you launch Chrome. There's this nice window. There's a page you can interact with. There's a URL bar. There's the dev tools that you can open and poke around in. Um, but with head, headless browsing, there's actually none of that. So there's no UI whatsoever, right? There's no URL bar. There's no address bar to interact with. Quite literally, there's no Chrome to Chrome. And so using headless Chrome, you actually decide the, the future of what's going on. You control it using the scripts that you write. To launch Chrome in headless mode, you simply provide one flag on the command line. It's dash dash headless. And this will launch Chrome in a headless mode. And you're not going to see a window. So what do you actually do with it? Well, the important thing is to add this other flag. It's called the remote debugging port flag. This is where the magic happens. So what this does is it'll launch headless Chrome, but it also enables uh, the remote debugging protocol, the same API and protocol used by the DevTools itself when you're inspecting Node or in VS Code when you're inspecting your applications. Same stuff we can tap into using this command line flag. And so by doing this, we can then write an application in Node.js or what have you to actually control and automate headless Chrome. So if you want to know more about Headless Chrome, I'm not going to really talk about it too much today. But there's a lot of cool stuff you can do from the command line. You can launch Headless Chrome. You can take screenshots. You can generate PDFs. Um, check out this article on developers.google.com. Um, there's some interesting things you can do. But the more interesting things are actually when you write programs that control Headless Chrome. So one way you can use Headless Chrome programmatically is to use this amazing little module. It's called Chrome Launcher. The Lighthouse team put this together because actually launching headless Chrome and, and dealing with Chrome on different platforms and different systems, finding Chrome, launching the right version is actually kind of complex. So we just basically abstracted that, created a little NPM module for you guys to use. Um, it's really easy to launch Chrome just with this module. You can pass it that remote debugging port flag. Um, in this case, I'm also saying launch in headless mode, and boom, in like one line of code, you can interact with Chrome uh, in your Node.js program. Now, this is kind of where Puppeteer comes in the mix. So Puppeteer is a library for working with headless Chrome. There's a lot of automation and, and testing framework libraries out there. You might have heard of Phantom and Selenium. We're not trying to invent the wheel and make a new one. We're just trying to make sort of a, an easy to use, out of the box experience for headless Chrome. We think it's really important for testing and automation. We want that to be easy, especially in the case of Chrome. 
So the Chrome team said, hey, let's build a library. Let's build a Node.js library. We'll make it a modern library. We'll take advantage of some of these newer ES6 features. Um, we're using promises all over the place. You'll see that in the code examples I showed today. The other reason for that is that it's just the way the architecture of Chrome works. So we're writing a Node program. We're sending asynchronous messages to this remote API, which in turn automates and does things with Chrome. And so all that message passing is asynchronous. So promises actually lend themselves very nicely to that. And of course, async and await, that cleans promises up quite a bit, makes our code a lot cleaner. But don't worry, you can use Node 6 if you want. You don't have to transpile. You can use Puppeteer and older versions of Node. No problem there. Now, the other thing we want to do is we wanted to bundle Chrome with the library. So one of the hard things to do is actually install Chrome on different platforms, make sure all the dependencies are installed. So when you get Puppeteer from NPM, we actually just download a local version of Chromium, which is the open source version of Chrome. And so you don't have to worry about configuration or anything like that. It just works. You focus on your code. You don't have to worry about actually launching Chrome. We want it to be a reference implementation for the DevTools protocol. Now, the protocol itself, there's so much you can do. It's a really complex, very um, awesome API surface. But we wanted to actually create the highest level API possible really wrap the API, the protocol API, in the most useful things we could. And so we have API calls for probably the most common use cases that you would use. So where does Puppeteer fit in our overall testing narrative? Well, I present to you the pyramid of Puppeteer. So at the bottom, right, we have the browser. We have headless Chrome. Headless Chrome. And so I just want to remind you, at the bottom of this layer, right, we have the browser. It's all your new ES6 features, your JavaScript features, your new web platform features. So the fact that we can you know, use an automated testing library to test things like Service Worker and push notifications and some of these newer uh, web platform features is actually really exciting. We haven't had that in the past with some of these other frameworks. On top of that, you have the Chrome Developer uh, Remote API. Again, very, very uh, complex, big API. But that's the thing that's going to interact with Chrome itself. Now, we're not going to interact with that directly. That's where Puppeteer comes in. So again, this small shim that sits on top of this lower level stuff. And at the very top is where your scripts come in. So these are the node scripts that you're going to write that interact with the Puppeteer API and then control Chrome. That's how everything fits together. So just to show you the difference between using the DevTools protocol by itself and using Puppeteer, um, two examples, the same thing. We'll basically navigate to a page and then print the HTML content of that page. And you don't really have to understand the details of the code on the left. Just know that it's, it's much more robust, right? There's more stuff that's going on. I need two libraries to do things like launch Chrome and control the protocol. I have to do a lot of setup, a lot of cleanup. I have to enable things and disable things. Uh, in the right example with Puppeteer, it's really clear what's going on, right? You launch a browser. You create a new page. You navigate to example.com. And then you print the content of that page. So Puppeteer makes a lot of these things very easy to do in just a few lines of code. So what can you do? Well, the first thing a lot of people do is take screenshots of their page. You can do that with uh, Puppeteer's APIs. So of course, the first thing you need to do, go grab Puppeteer off NPM. You can use Yarn or NPM. Uh, just install Puppeteer locally. Again, it's going to bring down a version of Chrome. And you can require it inside of your Node application. So first things first, if you want to write a script that uses Puppeteer, the first thing you probably want to do is launch Chrome. Puppeteer has a launch method. And by default, what that, what that is going to do is launch a headless version of Chrome. And again, everything is a promise. So this is going to resolve and give us a browser instance to then interact with and control. So calling launch will give us a browser instance. The next thing we do is want to create a page using async and await just to clean up the promises a little bit. So we'll use browser.newpage to create that. We'll use page.go to to navigate to example.com. And what this is going to do is actually wait for the load event to fire, so make sure our page is loaded up and ready to go. And then finally, we're going to take a screenshot of the page itself. So Puppeteer has an API for that, page.screenshot. And it's kind of nice. It's got this uh, path property that you can set. You don't have to read a stream or read a buffer or anything like that. You just give it the, uh, the file name that you want to create, and boom, you have your screenshot on disk. So last but not least, You'll probably want to close the browser. We're done with it. We don't need to do any more uh, scripting. So we'll close out Chrome. And all in all, that clocks in at like five lines of code to, to take a screenshot of your web app. Pretty cool. So what other, other cool things can you do with Puppeteer? Screenshots are one. A lot of people like to create PDFs of their sites. I don't know why. They like to literally print out their page, their entire site, and give that to, to someone to look at. Well, Headless Chrome has the ability to print to PDF, and you can do that using Puppeteer's APIs as well. So very similar to the Screenshot API, 
Uh, we can navigate to Google.com, for instance, emulate a media device, a screen media instead of print media, so we don't get the print style sheet, and then call page.pdf and save the PDF to disk. Pretty simple. Come on. Another thing we can do is emulate a device. Maybe you want to test the response in it of your device or of your application. Uh, this example here uses some of the built-in predefined device descriptors we have. So you don't have to worry about knowing the viewport settings of different devices or the display pixels ratios or anything like that. Uh, just require puppeteer device descriptors. In this example here, I'm just emulating an iPhone 6 device and then navigating to Google.com. And so this is the uh, end result here. Obviously, it's just the mobile version of Google.com. So it's super easy to emulate a device in Puppeteer. And again, DevTools can do all this, but Puppeteer is the programmatic way to do a lot of these things. One of the neater things you can actually do is inject code into the page, right? Maybe you want to test some functionality of your page or make sure some JavaScript is operating uh, like you expect it to. So what we're going to do here is we're going to navigate to just my Twitter feed. We're going to find the first tweet on the page. We're going to programmatically click that element, which will bring up this overlay. That's what Twitter does when you click the first element. And then we're going to take a screenshot of that DOM element. So you can take a screenshot of a page, a full page, or a DOM element. The choice is yours. So we're going to run some code in the page. The first thing, of course, we're going to do is call launch. We're going to launch a new version, uh, instance of headless Chrome. We're going to create a new page to work with. We're going to navigate to my Twitter stream, just twitter.com slash ebital. Next, what we'll do is we'll actually use page.eval. And what this does is kind of like jQuery. You give it a CSS selector, which will find that node on the page. And the cool thing that happens here is the, co the callback for this is not run inside of node. It's actually run inside of the page. So this gets injected inside the browser, very similar to typing this in the console. And so we'll click that using anchor click, which will open that overlay. And the next function call is waiting for, waiting for that select to be available. So Puppeteer has a method that says, hey, Make sure this element's visible before I move on. And so when this promise resolves, we're guaranteed to have this Twitter overlay pop up. And then finally, we'll take a screenshot of that, of that DOM element. Come on. So we'll just grab that uh, handle to that element and then take a screenshot. So all in all, it looks like something like this. We'll open the browser. We'll navigate to Twitter. I'll find the first tweet using Puppeteer. You can see it all very fast. It finds that element. And eventually, what you get is the final product, which is a screenshot. So this is my new puppy, Chewy. Everybody say hi to Chewy. He's super cute. He's a Wookiee, like Star Wars. <laughs> but so we can take screenshots of full pages. We can take screenshots of DOM elements. And we can take screenshots uh, of any portions of the page you want. So what you just saw is actually really, really powerful, right? In a couple lines of code, we just wrote some Puppeteer API code. And you can wrap that in your favorite testing framework. And all of a sudden, you have an instant smoke test, right? Insert your favorite testing harness, no matter what you want to use and you've got an instant integration smoke test. We're just testing the functionality of Twitter in this case. Very, very cool. And easy to do using Puppeteer. Now, another thing you can do that's very, very powerful is intercept requests before the browser ever issues those requests. And we can do that using the set request interception method. But in this case, what I'm doing is I'm waiting for the request event. Every time the browser tries to make a network request, we'll intercept that request and decide what to do with it. So this example here is going to navigate to YouTube.com. And if the resource type, if the request is for an image, we'll actually just abort that request. We'll cancel it. The browser will never issue that. And if it's not, we'll just let that pass through as normal. So the end result, if you actually run this piece of code you know, in Node, exactly what you'd expect. So the images start to 404. What this is really great for is you can test things like, does my, does my layout of my site work if images don't load? Is my, uh, is my accessibility OK? Is my layout OK? You can imagine doing this for other resources, like CSS. Maybe you want to intercept one style sheet and serve up another. You can totally do that using network request interception. So to kind of decide what to do based on the request type. A really common thing to do in automation is to do automation form submission. Hey, does my form actually work? So Puppeteer has high-level APIs for this, for typing in uh, form inputs and clicking things on the page. The classic example here is just go to Google.com, right? So we'll navigate to Google.com. We'll uh, input the text puppeteer into that search box just by selecting it using its CSS selector. And we'll call page.click and click the Google search button using page.click. Next, we'll use the same wait for selector method. Each of the Google.com search results is an anchor tag wrapped in an H3. So we'll just wait for those results to be ready using that same method. 
And then finally, we'll just use double dollar sign eval to iterate through all of those, those um, titles that come up and just print the titles to the console. So if you run this in Node, just in the console, you get exactly what you'd expect, just the list of search results for the word puppeteer. So we've showed two things. We've showed interaction with the keyboard, form submission, and actually just scraping content from a website using Puppeteer's APIs. So something new to the DevTools is it actually has this new panel called Performance Monitor, which has a slew of awesome performance information inside of it. A lot of that stuff is actually being uh, surfaced in Lighthouse now. And you can programmatically get access to that as well inside of Puppeteer. It's a simple API call, Puppeteer uh, uh, page.metrics will give you this information. Uh, it corresponds to the panel itself, so all the information like how long do your scripts take, how long does it take to recalc styles in this app. And more and more stuff is being added to this all the time by the DevTools team. So this is going to get much more rich as we go on. This is really great if you want to track performance over time of your application, maybe in a CI environment. Really useful stuff. And there's a ton of stuff you can do with Puppeteer. I can't cover everything today. I just want to point out a couple more things. If you use a service worker, a PWA, you want to test your site to work offline. You can test, uh, you can turn actually JavaScript off, or you can test with the network connection off to see if your site does indeed work offline. Using Puppeteer, we can intercept network and console requests that anytime the browser or the site logs something to the console, we can intercept that and print that or do something with that information. And if we don't have a device descriptor for you, you can actually emulate any type of device you want using page set viewport, set of device pixel, or any dimensions you want. So before I leave you, a couple more pro tips that I've actually run to. I've talked to a lot of developers getting started in Puppeteer. Just want to mention a few pro tips for debugging. I think they're really useful. So let's talk about this Puppeteer launch method again. Again, it just launches headless Chrome, and you get a browser instance to interact with. A couple of interesting things, right? If you're writing a script and you can't see what's going on, it's not so useful. Maybe you're debugging the script. You have no idea what it's doing. Just throw on headless false. You can actually just launch Chrome. You can see the window. You can see Puppeteer automate the script, the page, and navigate and click around. It's actually pretty cool to watch this. Um, but that's actually really useful just for debugging, too. So I highly recommend throwing the headful mode of Chrome on. You can also auto open the DevTools if you want using this flag, DevTools equals true. Uh, that will launch a head full version of Chrome, but also just open the DevTools at the same time. Kind of useful. You can see DevTools poke around as Puppeteer is kind of automating your page. One day my mic will work. All right, debugging options. Another couple of interesting things you can do is you can set slow mo. And slow-mo is a flag that allows you to slow down all operations that Puppeteer does by a certain number of milliseconds. So let's say somebody's typing in a website, right? They, they don't type as fast as a computer. So you can actually slow that operation down using this, this option, slow-mo, which will basically simulate a real user, which is useful to see what a real user would do on your site. It also slows things down like navigation, so you can see what's happening as Puppeteer is going through. Dump.io is useful if you want to see information from Chrome itself. So if your page is doing something weird, like the browser is actually crashing. Uh, turning this flag on is actually pretty useful to see that information. So last but not least, if you don't want to actually install anything today, you can totally just try out Puppeteer. I hacked together this little site over the weekend. Um, it's called trypuppeteer.appspot.com. You can go there. You can just play around with Puppeteer's API, run all of our demos, tweak code, see the results at the top. You can see the console information and also any PDFs or screenshots you generate. Really easy just to get started and kind of tinker around but no guarantees on uptime because it is just a hack project. Now, one thing you can kind of do that's cool with this is we can use Puppeteer locally on our machine to launch that site, and then which runs headless Chrome and Puppeteer in the cloud. So we're using Puppeteer to control Puppeteer, which is kind of like this crazy inception moment. So just to show that's possible, I actually built that little script. What we're going to do here is we're going to run Puppeteer on my machine. We're going to launch that site, try Puppeteer, inject some code. So you can see what I've done is injected code that opens that page itself and then takes a screenshot of the, the final product. So hopefully, we'll see a picture within a picture here. And note my mouse at the top is not going to move, so we're actually automating this using Node. We're not moving and clicking around the page. So Puppeteer will click that Run button. We'll get a final product. And eventually, what happens is you get a screenshot within a screenshot, which is kind of cool. So before I leave you, just a couple of things to mention. The first thing is make sure if you're using one of these testing frameworks out there, Phantom or Slimming, 
you know, make sure they're using the headless version of the browser. A lot of browsers now have a, head, a proper headless mode. And some of these uh, APIs and frameworks have been around for a while. They might not be using this mode. It'll save you memory. It'll save you time. It's a lot faster to test in headless mode. A lot of people use libraries like JSDOM, which is a great, awesome library for testing DOM and testing code that uses DOM. But the fact that we have a headless browser and we can actually test in a real DOM implementation using a real browser, maybe you don't need a library like JSDOM anymore. So consider that. And also, you know, test in other browsers, not just Chrome, obviously. Uh, Firefox has a headless mode that they launch in Firefox 56, and other browsers also are implementing headless mode. So test across all browsers, not just Chrome. It's very important. So with that, we throw a lot of stuff your way. Uh, here are all, all of the open source project and resources that we talked about today. Lighthouse, which V covered, Puppeteer, the DevTools protocol, if you want to really know what the DevTools can do and that API can do, really, really awesome stuff. Uh, the article on Headless Chrome and the Chrome Launcher module, if you just want to work with Headless Chrome, check that out. So I think with that, we're all done. And we really appreciate you guys sticking around. We know it's late in the day. Thank you, everyone, on the live stream for attending. My name's Eric Beidelman. I'm Vinam Rathasingal. And thank you for coming. Woo.
Hey there, everyone. Um, welcome to the last session of the day. You've almost made it. We are almost at the after party. Um, thank you for coming along to talk. My name is Nick Fortescue. I'm a software engineer on Google Play. And this is my colleague. Hi, I'm Johannes. I'm a UX designer working with Nick on Google Play. Um, so I've been working on Google Play since, well, since it was Android Market, so quite a while now. Um, and we're here to talk to you about why quality matters in the app. Now, app quality is a really important for us on Google Play. We want every Android user, when they open an app installed from Play, to open an amazing, beautiful, wonderful app. And, but of course, we don't write the apps. You guys do. And so we need you to help us. So my aim today, and Johannes' aim today, is to persuade you of how important quality is, not just for all those billions of Android users out there, but also for, the, for you as a business. So we're going to talk about in detail. I'm going to talk about why the quality matters. Um, Johannes is going to talk about what you can do to improve the technical excellence of the app and how we can help you. And then we'll just give you some more beyond technical excellence. So first, why is quality important? Well, we're Google. We're going to give you some hard numbers in this. So you've seen this slide before from Dan Galpin in the keynote. We, in Google Play in London, we took some apps and we measured their quality by a number of factors that Johannes will tell you about later. And we split them into categories. So we had some excellent apps and some average apps and then some bad apps. And we just looked at those categories. And when we went from an average app to a good app, those apps were earning six times as much income. Now, if you imagine what, how your company would be doing if it had six times as much income from your app, it would be a big improvement. And similarly, it got seven times as much retention. That means users coming, came back over and over again far more for higher quality apps than low quality apps. So hopefully I've grabbed you that this is important. But it's not just me. It's also our partners who are describing this. So here's one from Zalando, one of the top fashion houses in Europe. And they decided to focus on quality. They sat down and thought, right, we're not just going to add new features for a little bit. We're just going to focus on reliability, and we're going to focus on performance. They got their startup time 30% faster to start. And they also reduced crashes by 90%. And that gave them real money. But it's interesting. You say 6% monthly install increase. That doesn't sound too much. You've got to remember, this install increase isn't coming from the users who are already using the app. They got that install increase by improving the app itself, which means better ratings were happening, more people were recommending it to their friends. And that gave a also gave a 15% increase in revenue, in lifetime value of each user. And that is real money for the bottom line. So spending that time going, let's focus on performance and quality for a bit, rather than just adding new feature after new feature, gives real benefit. And this pays off. Across, we looked across the ecosystem, and apps with a high crash rate had 30% more uninstalls on the very first day than apps with a low crash rate. Unsurprising, you might think, but that's just the first day. That carries on down the tail of the apps as time goes on. And you might know, if you look, hopefully you look at your app reviews, you hopefully know that if you look at the one-star reviews, we ran some um, text analysis on it, and we found that 50% of those one-star reviews mentioned crashes, stability, bugs, all this sort of thing. Whereas the five-star reviews, they're mentioning over half the time, 60% of the time, they're mentioning speed. They're mentioning smooth design. They're mentioning usability. So you really want that quality increase happening. So Boozu, I don't know how many have used the language app. I've used it. It's a really great language app. And it was a great review score. They were getting 4.1 stars on the Play Store. I know lots of developers would kill for a 4.1 star rating. But they decided to focus on performance improvement. And they got it from 4.1 stars all the way up to 4.5 stars. Now, those of you who are app developers in Play will know how hard getting from 4.1 to 4.5 stars is. So maybe consider focusing on performance. The other thing is, we said it's our top priority to have these healthy, excellent apps in the ecosystems. And we're going to do that to help users find the best apps. So for example, our ranking algorithms in the Play Store, they look at these signals of, is an app smooth? Is it performant? Does it crash? to decide how to rank the app. We do collections promoting good apps 
we give awards, and these awards drive a lot of organic traffic. If you want your app featured, if you want all the publicity that comes from a Google Play award, you need to meet these performance metrics. And then we'll all have great apps in the Android ecosystem. So you might be wondering, well, how do you do that? Is it some big secret? Well, no, Johannes is going to tell you the measures we use to look at app quality. And you can see some apps which do really well in this already. If you search for Android Excellence Awards, you will find it. We released it in I.O. in April. And we've updated it twice. And it was last updated in October. We're planning on updating it quarterly. And you can see some apps in that that are already excellent. So maybe go and have a look at that on your phone. Try some of these apps, and you'll see what a really smooth, really excellent usability experience is. It's engaging, it's fast, it's got great design. So Johannes, tell the developers how they can make their app great. Great. Uh, thanks a lot. All right. Um, so we have heard a lot about app quality and why it actually matters. Um, Let's now take a look at how you can actually achieve technical excellence uh, with the tools that we provide in the Play Console. We first take a look at Android Vitals. And uh, this is um, a program by, um, supported by Google that really helps you understand um, and improve the app quality of your apps and games. And essentially, it gives you um, signals around the app health of your data. Uh, which is directly uh, connected to the performance of your app. So at Google I.O. earlier this year, we launched the Android Vitals in the Play Console. And this tool allows you to see aggregated performance data of your app. And also, this data is automatically collected by millions of devices, which means that it's a huge source for um, data. And the good thing is, it all comes for free. So there's no need to add another SDK. You can go into the Play Console, look at the, um, at the Vitals right now, and you will see data. Another cool thing is that this data isn't for engineers only anymore, but everybody in the company can now look at the data, understand the data, analyze the data, and set KPIs around it. For example, if you would like to reduce the crash rate, you set an, an KPI that you can track afterwards. So it's measurably. Um, so let's take a look how it works. There are three main pillars for it. First of all, you have the metrics. We then have the tools. And afterwards, the rewards. So let's go through it. First of all, the metrics um, is there where we provide bad behaviors. And bad behaviors are essentially patterns or events that uh, have a direct impact, a direct negative impact on the user experience, which is then, for example, if your app is very crashy or if it consumes lots of battery. Um, we provide you a set of tools to um, help you improve the quality of your app. Um, and we do this throughout the entire life cycle of your app. For example, um, before release, you use the pre-launch report in order to track um, crashes and vul security vulnerabilities even before you launch. Then at release, you can see um, the release dashboard and measure the effectiveness of your current release. And uh, after release, you see the um, Android Vitals to help you understand the technical performance from the field. And then last but not least, we have the rewards. Just as Nick mentioned, this is there to really help you and to really celebrate those good behaviors that we would like to see in the, as, um, as play. All right, so we currently report on three major performance areas in the Android Vitals, which is stability, battery, and rendering. And for each of those, we generate bad behavior. So you see those metrics. For stability, we look at um, the ANR rate and the crash rate. For battery, we, um, we report if, you experience, if your app experience stuck wake logs or excessive wake ups. And for rendering, we, we report on slow rendering of frozen frames. So we generate those bad behaviors around these metrics. And if something is wrong with your app, we directly notify you. So you are aware of it, and you can fix them. All right, so since IO, uh, we have a massive momentum. And uh, more than 65% of the top 1,000 apps in play have adopted this feature and made use of it. We work closely with 50 partners, and in average, they managed to release the crash rate from a 3.5 to a 1.7, which is huge. Um, so just to give you a sense for the scale, over the same time, 
these partner apps were installed more than 1.5 billion times, which results that um, millions of users worldwide have a measurably better um, experience and therefore also leave a, a better rating. All right, so for many partners, the Android Vitals is now an active part of the planning, just like the Weather Channel, for example. And by focusing on app quality, they absorb a direct impact on the uh, customer satisfaction. Again, all this relates, uh, results in a better and higher um, rating of your app. All right, so inspired by this momentum, we are continuing to scale this program further and further, and we are really investing in it to make it even more meaningful. We have uh, three main things to announce, uh, which is we have an expanded device coverage. We also report on five new bad behaviors, so more metrics for you guys. And we overall improve the user experience. And um, yeah, it, it will help you really root cause and analyze the, the issues that you experience, if you experience some. All right, so in order to expand the device coverage, we work with several OEMs to surface the performance metrics and more data for you guys. Um, so initially, we reported on Nexus devices and Pixel devices. And now, we, after talking to many, many more um, OEMs, we now um, have a spectrum across high-end flagships um, to mid-range bestsellers and low-end devices. So all this will give you a great overview about the entire ecosystem of play. By doing this, we increase the amount of user sessions tracked by the program by 25 times. More data for you. All right, so we, we added two more um, metrics for the stability, which is the multi ANR rate and the multi crash rate. And especially those repeating crash rates really cause big user frustration, um, which then eventually leads to a higher uninstall rate and a negative rating because the app seems hopelessly broken. So by looking at this data, you can now track those issues early and uh, yeah, fix them right away to prevent user churn. For battery, we now introduce three new metrics, which is um, the excessive Wi-Fi scans in the background, the excessive network usage in the background, and the stuck background wake logs. And especially those background, those excessive background activities really consume unnecessary, unnecessary battery from your users, and all this results in, uh, in frustration of the user. And then we significantly revamped the Play Console user experience for the Android Vitals to help you understand and improve the app quality. Uh, with this new overview page, um, we monitor all the different metrics that we provide you to judge your app quality. And also straight at the top of the page, um, we now highlight any bad behavior that was triggered in your app for any APK, any active APK. So if you upload it to Alpha, to Beta, or if it's in production, we give you those signals right away. And you can automatically or immediately focus on the most important actions. Also, something that we now introduce is that you can track the performance of each matrix over time after you drill down into the details. And you can see it in, um, in comparison to the bad behavior threshold. So you can see if you are crossing that line, you will then get the notification. Um, so essentially, you can measure the effectiveness of the actions taken over time. We also help you to root cause the origin of uh, these bad behaviors um, by allowing you to filter um, the data, slice the data to see um, yeah, different options, for example, if you slice the data by APK version, by device, by OS version, or over time, you can really start to see where the root cause of that issue is. And last but not least, we do provide you benchmarks now, so to help you establish a reference point, and also to give you some sense how the overall performance of, your entire, of the entire ecosystem is. And then, wherever possible, we we give you guidance on how to resolve an issue. So in this case, um, when debugging an ANR, you receive guidance on actually what caused the application to freeze. And we identify several different cases, for example, deadlocks, disk IOs, network IOs, and uh, many more. So go, go check it out. It's live. You can use it right away. Um, 
So thanks to all this, partners are using the Android Vitals in the Play Console more and more, and they are continuing to invest in the app quality, and so do we. So we really love to hear from you guys how you're using it, and also how, how we can improve this product. What was useful for you? What, what can we do better? We're over there in the sandbox on the other side. Come and visit us, share your thoughts, and help us make a better product. Great. Some um, last announcement for the pre-launch report. Um, so just to give you a quick summary, the pre-launch report is a play solution for automated test, uh, for the automated testing of your app. Um, and all that happens before production release. So it automatically crawls your APK on physical devices, and it looks for crashes, and it looks for security vulnerabilities. And it also generates a whole bunch of screenshots that are then across multiple form factors and also multiple languages. And yeah, we are continuing to improve that. So first of all, uh, there is no need to opt into uh, the service anymore. Every APK that you upload to Alpha or Beta gets automatically tested and is ready to review. Then we also rewrote the entire robo crawler. So it now reaches even deeper into the app and discovers more crashes, uh, which would otherwise happen for real users um, on production. And last but not least, we do have um, performance data in, um, in the pre launch report. And it now reports on CPU, on memory, on network, and on rendering. And the cool thing is that it's uh, you, you can see this data in direct relation to a video that was recorded throughout the crawl, so you can see directly where um, the issue occurred, and you can go and fix it. All right, so this was a brief overview about the technical experience. Now back to Nick for product excellence. Yeah, thanks a lot, Johannes. Um, so anyone can write an app that doesn't crash, right? You just have a plain black screen, and it does nothing, and you get no crashes. So you need this foundation of technical excellence. But you also need a great product. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about. But I'm not going to be able to say that much here. So I do encourage you. There's loads of amazing design sessions going on behind me. Or if you're watching online, do check out the videos afterwards of some of the mobile design sessions. But the big thing you want is to fulfill the user's needs in an excellent way. And I'm going to talk a few ways about doing that. Um, they want consistency. They want a memorable experience. But they also want a solution which matches their needs. So how are you going to write features that users love? Well, you want the latest Android features make it really easy for you to give this to users. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the tools that we give you to get great design into your app. So first is material design. Now, if you're following Google, you've seen this already. But it might be new to you. Um, we've launched this a couple of years ago. But it's been getting so much praise from not just the Android community, but just from independent designers around the world and developers around the world. And Google has so many materials, but also third party sites are offering loads of tutorials to help you understand not just the code, but all the concepts and the vision behind this. Because you've got to remember, just sticking in some material design components doesn't make your app a material app. What makes it a material app is having these smooth, tangible surface transitions with meaningful motion. Do read the docs. They're so good. And explain what it's all about. The other thing you can do is target the latest SDK. Now, I know a lot of developers might say, but my users are all on older phones. I want maximum compatibility. Why would I target the latest SDK? Well, this doesn't mean you eliminate all those old phones. But by changing your target SDK in your build, you can give those users who are on new phones the best, most modern, most up-to-date experience. And you've got to remember, those users who are on new phones, and remember, Christmas is coming up. There's an awful lot of phones going to be sold in the next few months with new versions of Android. And they will have the best experience. And they will tell all their friends about it and get them installing your app. And we don't just want you. Of course, there's other platforms in the world besides Android. And the more of them you support, the better it is for your app quality. So do features which help users on whatever platform they're on. Use things like sign in with Google. This lets users have one sign in, whatever device they're on. And it just makes their life simpler. Another thing you can do for a really excellent, memorable experience is do all the platforms. Now, Android isn't just phones. Have you ever paused? 
stop for a minute and think, what other platforms could my app support? Because we're going all the way from Android Wear, phones, tablets, through to VR, TV, even in cars nowadays, as you saw in the keynote. Could your app be there? Now, not every platform is right for every app, of course. But if your fitness app, maybe you could be on a, phone, on a watch so the user doesn't have to carry their phone with them. Maybe your education or entertainment, would that work well on a TV or maybe in VR? What if you're a travel app or a guidance app? Could that work really well in a user's car? Or how about a game? Would that work well on a TV? Think about your apps and think, would these work on the other platforms? Because the users with these platforms, it's going to give them a magical time, and they're going to tell other users about your apps. And this sort of quality is the thing we really want in play, and it will help you in the Play Store. Now, monetization is also really important, because with, to be honest, without money coming in, it's very hard for you to fund the development on your amazing app. Hopefully, you've looked at in-app products. But also, how many of you considered using subscriptions? So I'm sure all of you have heard of Pandora. Now, they had their own subscription model. When they switched to using subscriptions in Google Play, their revenue went up 397%. That's almost five times as much money coming into their company from switching to subscriptions in Google Play. New York Times, up 125%. Evernote reduced the churn. That's users, when their subscription expired, leaving. By using Google Play subscriptions, they reduced it 40%. This is all going to get you extra money for your company and fund these excellent apps. Now, I've been talking to a lot of you in the sandbox, and a lot of you have never tried the A-B experiments in the Play listing. Now, in the, Google, in the Play console, you can do things like try which icon works better for installs. This one, this one. Let's try on 1% of traffic and do a proper experiment to see what works better. And people have had amazing results. People have used alpha beta channels to get feedback from their really keen users. And don't forget the tools to respond to users' comments. Um, we've, I had a developer in the sandbox this morning come up to me and saying, users often leave comments that like, they just don't really make any sense. How do I respond to them? And by going into the Play Console and saying, Thanks for that. I can help you giving your email address. Users will see that, and they'll go, this developer cares about their users, and you will get more installs from it. So do your best to respond friendly, be friendly and helpful to every comment, and it will do wonders to not only your star rating, but also it will give you loads of ideas for improving app quality. So just one example, don't just believe me, um, Wallapop. They did some experiments. So they did a few things. They tried their short description and changed it. Then they did another experiment with different screenshots. And then they even did things like, what order should we put the screenshots on in their listing? And by doing a few experiments like this, one after the other, they got 17% improvement. And they are no way the highest in the Play Console. We've seen developers get 30% conversion installs. So this is people who came to the app, app listing in Play and get 30% more installs by doing these experiments. It doesn't take very long. You should definitely try it. But the real key to this is you need a clear hypothesis. I think this icon will work better. I think encouraging this type of user will work better. And you need some big design variations. Don't just make, I'll go from light blue to dark blue. Make some really bold designs. Because remember, you can limit the traffic change it goes to. So it only goes to 1% of users. And you can get some really amazing results. So let me recap. Your app quality affects your business success. This is going to make real difference to the money you have coming in, to the number of users you have installing, to the users coming back to your app again and again and recommending it to your friends. We measure quality using the same signals you get in Android Vitals. We're not leaving you in the dark. So if you care about your recommendations in play and you care about your users, you should be going to Android Vitals and fixing the bad behaviors, the crashes, the ANRs you see there. So every user in Android on every app has an amazing thing. And it's not just technical excellence. Going and adopting the latest phones and making your app have a beautiful design 
with things that really meets the user's needs can really help you drive more traffic to your app. So thank you so much for your time. Do come and find us. We'll be in the sandbox all day tomorrow, and we'll be at the launch party in a minute. We look forward to launching to you. We'll answer any questions you have about Google Play, Google Play Console, and uh, look forward to seeing you later. But enjoy the party. Thank you very much. Bye -bye.